Good morning, everybody. How is everyone today? Welcome to our commission meeting. It is uh, September 8th at 10 o'clock, and I do call this commission meeting to order. Those that are present are Commissioner Emmerich, myself, Mayor McDowell, Vice Mayor Luke, Commissioner Hanks, we have our city clerk, our recording secretary, Ms. Ida, city attorney, and also our acting city manager, Chief Garrison, is back there, and we have a lot of staff and quite a few of our citizens. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment of silence. It's my understanding that there was an accident this morning that involved four of our employees. So I'd like to take a moment of silence to recognize that accident and prayer for their well-being and everybody's well-being that was involved in that. Um, and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Acting City Manager. Um, Mr. Yarborough. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. I need to get an approval of the agenda, and if it's possible, could we please move the proclamation to right after the announcements? That way then she can get back to her job. <laughs> <laughs> if she really wants to. <laughs> so, I'd, so moved. Second. The motion on the floor to approve the agenda as presented, moving the proclamation right after announcements. That was made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything? No, ma'am. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and do our vote. And that passed four to zero with Commissioner Carasone absent. All righty. Um, city Clerk or Vice Mayor, do we have any public comment for this uh, general public comment session? General public comment. No? Thank you very much. We will go ahead and move on to announcements then. The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Beautification and Tree Scenic Highway Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Joint Management Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utility Advisory Board, and Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees, Firefighters Pension Board of Trustees, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utility Advisory Board. One Northport resident to serve on the Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Planning Organization Citizen Advisory Network. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you very much, City Clerk. Um, City Clerk, do you have, oh, it's down there. Um, usually we go down below to do proclamations, but with the CDC guidelines, do we want to do that or do we want to read it up here? What is the will of the board? Um, I'm amenable to either. I just, I'm fine. Me. I'm fine with going down and spacing out. Yeah, I'd like to be spaced out the other day. It would be fine. Okay. So let's go down and just space out. And that sounds horrible. <laughs> space out. Keep our space. All righty, today we're doing a proclamation, thank you, for the Literacy Awareness Month. So whereas an estimated 3.6 million adults in Florida, 24% of those 16 of age 
and older lack the most basic reading skills according to the estimates by the National Center of Education Statistics. And whereas adults with low literacy skills experience personal, social, and economic hardships that affect their ability to function and provide for themselves and their families. And the literacy level of parents and or guardians has a direct impact on the literacy of their children. And whereas the Literacy Volunteers of South Sarasota County celebrates the contributions of hundreds of trained volunteer tutors who work with adult learners to achieve their educational goals. Now, therefore, we, the City Commission of the City of Northport, Florida, do hereby proclaim September 2020 as Literacy Awareness Month. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie, and anybody else that was involved in making this happen so quickly. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> yes, it was. I was a little late in contacting you. So we uh, are, as this says, we are a nonprofit organization, and we work with immigrants who need to learn how to read, write, and speak English in order to either get a job, driver's license, citizenship. Uh, whatever their goals are, it's just to uh, be able to help their children with their homework. So uh, we appreciate your getting this together for us, and we appreciate your recognizing that this is Literacy Month. Um, are you still in reading? Yes, I would. Yes, you want to talk about that, or well, yet yeah, we yes, we need volunteers and. Um, um, if you know of any one, any adult person who would qualify to be a student, you, we'd like to know that too. So, yeah. This is Penny Carell, our local president here in the South Sarasota County. I'm a class tutor and also a member of the board. Thank you. Yes, yes, and we also have the Start Now office, which is for. Um, any people, students who are waiting to get a private tutor, because we also do one-on-one -on -one tutoring and some classes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you. 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 Come on. We got to get some pictures. Oh. And, and I don't know. One. Ladies, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. All righty. So now moving on, city manager, to the consent agenda items. Yes, ma'am. Well, yes. two items got pulled, the uh, asset uh, disposal and the planning and zoning board appointment. That Thank would you. be item um, 4A and 4M. Thank you very much. I need a motion to approve the other items on consent, removing item 4A and 4M. Move to approve the consent agenda, removing A and M, M as, in as in man. Motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda, removing A and M, like in Mary. That was made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich. No, ma'am. We'll go ahead and take vote. And 
That passed four to zero with Commissioner uh, Carason absent. All right, so item A is the disposition of assets. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to have Ken Ruppin, uh, city's fleet manager, come up and speak. Sure. Um, do you, you want questions? Do you want us to give an overview? We could just try and expedite this. It's um, I'm the one that requested that these items be pulled. This item be pulled. Um, I am specifically concerned with item the CID numbers seven one nine three four, seven one nine three five, seven one nine three nine, which are. 2014 Ford Tauruses. These Tauruses are in fair condition with no medical issue, medical, mechanical <laughs> issues, <laughs> minor dents and dings, and are replacement qualified. That they are, they still run. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, in light of everything, I cannot, in good conscience, replace these vehicles that are six years old have less than 10,000 miles on it driven a year, it's wasteful. And I have to ask, can, can any of these three vehicles be repurposed elsewhere in the city? Ken Get a couple more years out of them. Ken Rappoon, Fleet Manager. Um, these items, these three vehicles were already replaced, already approved to be replaced in last year's budget or this year's budget. And they actually, the, we're waiting the, the new vehicles to come in if they haven't already arrived. Um, to answer your question as far as being utilized in the city, could they be? Absolutely. However, one thing to keep in mind is the cost to put these vehicles in a standard city format. Right now, they are black and white vehicles. They are marked vehicles with lights, with decals, with cages. The amount of labor to get these vehicles back to a, as an example, staff vehicle would be extensive and cost, not cost efficient. Um, could these vehicles be utilized in a police department? I would say yes. However, that was already screened when the requirement to have these vehicles replaced would have been done by the police department. Um, typically, I do, if there's a vehicle on the disposal list or that is being replaced, I do send out an email to the departments and ask them, can anybody utilize these vehicles? As an example, the John Deere Gator that's on there. It's an older vehicle, it does run. However, nobody in the city needed that vehicle. So therefore, it was deemed not to keep another vehicle in the city's fleet staff or assignment list, so therefore it is being auctioned as an example. Um, as far as these Ford Interceptors, again, to put these in a city administrative use would be to, would not be cost efficient. All right. Um, since they have brand new batteries that are less than six months old, and um, the totaled vehicles have new equipment on it, they're relatively new. Are you guys going to be swapping out the batteries and tires to be used for other needs for other vehicles of like kind of quality? Well, with law enforcement vehicles, you have to be careful of the safety. So with these vehicles being an accident, that can damage a tire that you don't, you, it's unforeseen. So when they're in high speed chases or things of that nature, you don't want to put a potentially dangerous tire on, an, on another police vehicle. Could we use these items? Yes, we do on, a, on their occasions that there's a situation in which we can take a part off a part and swap it. If we were to do that with all our vehicles, we would have a part slot that would be astronomical that we don't have the time, the space, um, the image, you know, the, everything to come to do with a salvage yard, if you will. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate the um, conversation. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? To approve consent agenda item A. Lower to approve consent agenda item number A, made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything, Vice Mayor? No, I actually think it's pretty cool that it's going to go over to the college, the one vehicle to be used over there. So I, I like that. Commissioner Emmerich. And I too want to give. Huge props and kudos to having that one vehicle, uh, I think it's the Tahoe, going over to the technical college for, for their educational purposes. Um, that's the whole reason that back in when I first started, I asked, does the fire department or police department have use for these total vehicles for training purposes? And this is a great extension of that whole sentiment. And I hope it will be applied in other areas as well. So thank you for that. 
We'll go ahead and take the vote, seeing no other comments. And that passed three to one with myself dissenting. We got to get a handle on these replacement vehicles. And, and I, I'm a broken record, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next item, which is the application for uh, Ms. Nita Hester for the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board. Um, this is an item I ask to be pulled because of the actual application. It says that she is retired, but then <coughs> says that she works for the city of Northport. In her resume that she attached, it said that she has her date of hire and then says to current. So I need to double check city manager. Is Ms. Nita an employee with the city? She is no longer. I think she retired August 31st, if I'm not mistaken. 28th or something oh, like that. It was yeah, late, 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 late 28th. She, she's no longer with us. And that, she's with us, but she's not with us. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, that was so clerk, bad. <laughs> city clerk, because we're approving an application that does have some irregularities to it, can we pull this to have the application corrected? We can do it either way you want. I did just receive her updated application and resume. It is August 28th, um, is what her resume says now of her last date here with the city. Okay, but what does her application? That's what application we go says, by. It says employer city of Northport when I last checked. In the backup, I saw where her termination was um, August 28th. And so I assumed she had filled the application out prior to that, trying to get it onto this agenda or this um, meeting. So just verifying that, yes, she, she does did not have on her application her. that she is a city employee. She does not? No. When was that changed? We just received it. Literally, okay. I just got it in my email. Because <laughs> my application <laughs> yes. still shows it. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so it's, I just was bringing it up about the inconsistencies. Um, so I don't know what staff or what the board wants to do, if we want to approve it with these um, amendments, or do we want to hold off until next meeting when we can put the actual application online? So I'll entertain a motion either way, guys. What do you want to do? To approve consent agenda item M. Second. The motion on the floor to approve consent agenda item number M as presented, Vice Mayor? Yes. And that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we have verified that, she, yes, she did go ahead and retire on that day, so... Um, I mean, people put on application that they've lived here for 18 months, and by the time we get the application, it's 19 months, and we, we don't kick out their application because, you know, the time they filled it out, it was accurate. Uh, so we have verified that she is retired, and I'd like to see the, the nice lady on the board as soon as possible, so I don't want to delay it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich? I agree with you. Um, and the only thing I just want to reiterate is she is going to be as a alternate on the board. Correct? Yes. Thank you. All righty. So we'll go ahead and take the vote. And that passed four to zero. Thank you very much. Oh, and with uh, Commissioner Carason absent. So let's move on to presentations. And this is on the um, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, commonly known as the CAFR. So City Manager, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to have uh, Farrell, our finance director, come down and present. The good news is the city received an unqualified opinion, which is the best uh, result you can get out of an audit. But I'll let uh, Ms. Marie. Before she starts, can I make an alert? I've got an email come in that... Uh, the public comment for the meeting is not open and available. It's coming up when somebody goes in to make a comment showing that it's closed. 
telling them to wait for the next day. So just alerting IT. That is the way that right now it's only open from 8 a.m. the day before till 7 o'clock p.m. the day before the meeting. It's not open during the meeting. When do all of these rules change? I mean, we have discussed public comment over and over and over. And this is a public meeting, and it's supposed to be open until the end of the meeting. We're, we're barring our citizens from making comments? I have a huge problem, huge problem, because I was told that it was open 24 hours prior to the meeting, which would have been 10 o'clock yesterday and that it's open until the closing comment of, of the meeting. If I could add to that, the, the um, public comment page says from, I think, 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. Until 7 PM, um, the day before. Some places it says 24 hours before. I know when we had virtual meetings, we had it open 24 hours before and through the rest of the meeting. Right. I don't know when that changed because obviously Chambers is not open to 100% capacity and there's a lot of citizens that may want to weigh in on items. We need to have a discussion about this and... Um, yeah, I apologize, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that uh, I wasn't aware of the... City Clerk, can you help me out on this one? No. This was put out when we went back um, to meetings in chambers, it switched from being open throughout the whole meeting online because we were all virtual, so there was no opportunity for anybody to come into the chambers. Then once we switched to being in the chambers, we went um, live from 8 o'clock the day before to 7 o'clock p.m., which gives us time to consolidate all of the emails that we receive and be able to present them the next day. Which, And just for more conversation it's not stated on our agenda item that the public comment can be done online or by telephone um, so I we need to have a much larger conversation sooner rather than later city attorney you want to weigh in yes mayor we have um, two items that are going to be coming before you on your direction related to this one will be up on the September 22nd meeting for an ordinance to repeal some languages in the city code about public comment and then at the following meeting you'll have the second reading on that ordinance and then you'll have the resolution for a commission policy um, outlining what the parameters are for public comment in person which we already have in the code but we're going to move into this policy um, as well as remotely thank you so it's already going to be discussed and i appreciate that yes, vice mayor did you want to have any final comments before we move on to kaffir we have a hybrid meeting, and we were supposed to be having hybrid public comments. And I'll just leave it at that, and I'll make this citizen know that their voice can't be heard. Thank you. Thank you. City Manager. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Farrell. Ms. Good, Farrell. Good morning. Kim Farrell for the record, Finance Director. Um, we have the independent audit firm of Malden Jenkins here this morning to present our 2019 CAFR. But before I turn it over to them, I just want to take a real brief moment to thank the team that puts this together. A very large volume of hours and work goes into this report every year. They do an outstanding job. We have our lead here, Scott. Skipper, if you'll um, wave, uh, just to be recognized, they do an outstanding job. Jody also plays a big part of this. Um, she was not able to be here this morning. Um, every role in finance actually contributes to this, but those are our two um, big players. I just want to say a big thank you and recognize what a great job they do with it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the partner in charge, um, Wade, Wade Sansbury, to go ahead and give the presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Wade Sansbury. I'm a partner with Malden and Jenkins. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. This is actually my first public meeting since February, so I'm kind of glad to be back in a little bit of normalcy. Um, I'm, I'm going to just briefly go over a few highlights of, of this year's audit. Um, you know, as, as you all know, we were engaged to perform your audit. Um, we've done so. We completed that audit and dated it uh, back in June. 
Um, you did receive an unqualified, or I'm sorry, an unmodified opinion. This is a clean opinion. This is the type of opinion that you all wish to receive each and every year. Um, so again, the, the CAFR itself is prepared by city. It's a very large, complex document. Um, if you don't want to re read the entire 200 plus pages in, in the document, I always recommend that you do read the MDNA. This is management's discussion and analysis. Gives you a lot of good information as to the, uh, the operations as of 2019 and how they relate and compare to 2018. Um, for the year ended, you did end the year with about 620 million in um, total assets and deferred outflows, um, which is very, very strong. Um, you also had an increase in your total net position of about 26.3 million. So again, a very good, strong year. Um, the general fund ended the year with fund balance of about 14 million um, and just under 12 million um, in unassigned fund balance. So a very good, strong financial position there. Um, and hopefully that's some good, strong reserves that can carry you through these, these tough times that we're currently in. Um, as part of this year's audit, we were also required to perform a single audit. Um, this was on federal awards that the city received and expended during the year. Um, you all received about $2 million in total uh, awards this year. Um, the majority of those were spent in relating to uh, Hurricane Irma and I believe one other hurricane. About a, about a million of the $2 million were um, from hurricane-related expenditures. I'm happy to say that in regards to both the financial audit as well as the compliance audit, audit as well as the single audit. There were no findings um, of any kind. So again, very, very good reflection of the city's finance department. They do a great job uh, taking care of all the books and records and the day-to-day -day transactions. And they also do a very good job working with us and getting us all the information that we need to be able to complete the audit um, as we have done. Um, as part of the audit, we also prepare, we prepare and provide to you all what's called the ADNA, the Auditor's Discussion and Analysis. Um, that is a, a, a relatively short, concise uh, document that we put in a lot of our required communications. And we also give you a little bit of information on upcoming GASBIs. Um, that's the, the standard board, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board that actually um, all governments are, are adhered to. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out too, as, re as it relates to the GASB, is that uh, one of our very own partners, uh, Joel Black, he and I actually made partner together back in 2005, he was just selected as the GASB chairman um, to represent the GASB that, again, oversees all governments across the entire United States for the next seven years. So we have a, a very good insight into the GASB. Um, really, uh, we've had it in the past and we're certainly going to have it over the next several years. But just want to point out that in that ADNA, there are a couple of upcoming GASBs. Um, because of the pandemic, there were some uh, delays that were implemented. You've got about another, another year to 18 months on some of those implementation requirements. Um, but did just want to point out the GASB 84 and 87 are a couple that, that you all want to make sure that you are paying attention to and are getting prepared for um, coming down the road. And that's really all I wanted to, to, to let you all know today. Do you all have any questions for me? Does anybody have any questions? I have one. Uh, is the proper terminology unqualified or unmodified? It's unmodified. It used to be unqualified, and I, I tripped up there. Sounds a whole Sorry lot better that. to say unmodified. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Uh, the only question I have is... Um, couple of citizens have reached out to me wanting to know if this CAFR is a forensic audit. If you could explain the difference, please, for the citizens' benefit between what you did here and a forensic audit. Sure. Um, a regular audit that we performed here is in accordance with all AICPA standards, as well as governmental accounting standards, as well as the GASB. Um, a forensic audit is a more directive audit and it's, it's usually intent is to, there is some kind of a, an issue that you're, that you're almost doing an investigation on. You are diving into a, a very narrow focus in your testing. Um, the audit here is to ensure that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with all of those required um, requirements. Again, a forensic audit would be someone that has certain additional uh, certifications that if there's ever any kind of indication of impropriety, if there's any kind of indication of mismanagement of funds, that would require or you all could potentially ask for a forensic audit. But that would be something above and beyond this particular audit. Are forensic audits uh, conducted um, like 
every 10 years or are they only conducted when there's a issue? I heard you say investigative. Right. Typically, they're only done at, at a board's request if there is an issue. That is not something that is required by the state. It's not required by really any, any other body. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just for kicks and giggles, how much is a forensic audit? Well, that would de depend, on what, depend on what it is that you were wanting us to do. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Seeing no other questions? We'll go ahead and entertain a motion, please. I move to accept the uh, CAFR as presented. Thank you. Right. Motion on the floor. Oh, City Attorney, do we need to accept the CAFR? I, I don't see it as a voting thing, but I do remember in the past that we did accept them. Just looking for clarity. I would defer to the City Manager or the City Clerk regarding past practice. Uh, normally, agencies I work for, they just accept, made a motion to accept it, but uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily. Ms. Farrell, do you have any words of wisdom on this one? Preferred. Yes, we would prefer you would accept it if possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't know if we had to formally do that. I just wanted to double check. All right, so I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to accept the CAFR as presented, and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich, we'll go ahead and take the vote, please. And that passed four to zero. Thank you very much for your time and doing that. All right, city manager, we're gonna have a discussion now and possible action relating to the options for free entry days for the aquatic center. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna uh, ask the uh, Parks and Rec staff to come down and talk about it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For the morning. record, Sandy Fun Heller, Parks and Recreation Director. <laughs> So on uh, June 18th, 2020, uh, the City Commission gave consensus for staff to develop a Northport Resident Appreciation Day, uh, providing free access to the Northport Aquatic Center uh, for Northport residents during fiscal year 2021. Parks and Recreation staff has reviewed potential opportunities and associated operational impacts, and we've developed two options for you to consider today. Option one would be offering two free days during the summer season. It would include one weekday and one weekend day. It would be available to residents on a first come first serve basis. Patrons could enter at any time during our regular operating hours. Uh, there's an opportunity for access to the competition pool only or the full facility in accordance with the established schedule. Uh, there's a potential to accommodate about 2,040 patrons over the two days if we're at full capacity with our anticipated admission turnover. The estimated lost revenue associated with this option would be $14,610. Some pros and cons for this. Um, pros, the patrons can set their own schedule and the duration of their visit. Uh, they can plan around weather events to avoid impact to their day. Uh, there's flexible scheduling to offer both weekend and weekday selection. There's opportunity for access to the competition pool only or the full facility, depending on what the preference is. There's no additional staff expense by following the planned operating hours, and our regular programming would not be impacted on this day. Some cons to this, um, the patrons are not provided a set time for reserved access. It's possible that they could arrive when capacity has already been reached, and there's a lower impact in the overall ability to provide free entry to residents. Option two is to offer one free day during the summer season. It would be one weekend day. We would do four two and a half hour time blocks. It would be a free pre-registration required uh, program. There would be access to the full facility during all those time frames. We could potentially accommodate an estimated 2,720 patrons at full capacity. Lost revenue for this option is 19,476 as an estimate. 
The additional staff cost for this option is 2,280, and the total financial impact for this option would be 21,756. Pros to this option, uh, patrons are assured entry via a reservation. Uh, the pre-registration will help staff manage capacity limits. There's a higher impact in the overall ability to provide free entry to residents, and the pre-registration will provide a cross-check to ensure that the patron is a Northport resident. Um, some of the cons, the time <coughs> limits restrict the duration of the visit. Uh, unpredictable weather may interrupt a patron's ability if they have chose a time and uh, there's inclement weather. The additional staff expense to operate the full facility for the entire day. Um, it does require the pre-registration access and then regular programming would be rescheduled on this day. So those are two options that we came up with. Um, we are open to any questions or discussion. Does anybody have any questions on this? Vice Mayor? Um, why is more staff needed on option two versus option one when option one has got two days instead of just one? Because option one would be something we would do during our regular operating hours. So um, in the morning, it would just be the competition pool that would be open, and then in the afternoon, we would open the full facility as regularly planned. So the staff are already planned to be there then. In the other option, we we're saying that we are going to open the full facility all day and have four two and a half hour time slots that people could register for. So you're bringing on those additional staff needed for the full facility. Did you consider doing the full facility in option one? Oh, having the recreational the whole facility open? That, that's basically one? that's basically what option two is. It's just that we're saying it would be um, to one register for that master. time slot so that we can reach many more um, visitors. Correct. Correct. All right. Um, so you kind of answered my second question because option one is just that you would only be allowing people to come in up to that maximum, but you already have some people in the pool or doing their activities, so that count is brought down automatically as to how many would be able to come in because you're continuing to do your activities. That, that's part of it, uh, but the bigger part is that with the other option, we know that we can fill it up, we can reserve those spots and fill them up to capacity in, in four different Correct. time slots. Correct. Um, did you think about, when looking at option two, and personally I lean toward option two, uh, did you think about having an alternative day if there was rain? We, we have not put anything together on that. We certainly can. Or it, if this, since this will be in the next year, uh, it could fall under the rain check policy um, if needed. Um, we were just trying to provide something that provide the least financial impact in that option. That's what I was thinking was rain check type thing also. All right, thank you. That's all I have, Mayor. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, the one question I had was similar to Vice Mayor's was on option two, you had said it's going to cost more staff because you're opening up the whole thing, but we're, we're looking at two and a half hour time blocks. If you're going to register to come in and use the facility, wouldn't you think that maybe the first time block would just be competition pool, second, third, and fourth time blocks could be the whole facility if that's falling under your normal operating? We could we could do that. That would be option one, basically, just maintaining our well, regular operating hours. Um, with reservations, we'd have to look at what the, the break in between needs to be. Um, we just thought this, this option, too, and doing it reservations, full facility, that would give everybody the option to do whatever they want in the facility, whether it's competition pool or slides and splash pad. Um, and certainly with the re registration, it's guaranteeing them a, a spot to get in during that time frame. Right, and, and I understand that, but we're looking at cost factors. We're looking at this, that, and the other. And with option one, you could have certain people come in and be there all day long and not everybody get a chance to go ahead and enjoy the facility. Because you'd be at capacity, who knows that we're not at capacity all day long and nobody else can get in. 
That is that is true. Uh, we've we've generally been seeing that people are staying about two and a half, three hours tops. Okay, so that's the normal right now. Mm -hmm. I know rains have been coming in a little bit later on. Yep. All right, that's that's all the questions I had. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> This, uh, I mean, not so much a question. I guess it can be a question as a consideration um, that I brought up during our agenda briefing. And I'm not saying that we can't do something like this possibly, but I would be more inclined to look at something like uh, volunteer days. Like, um, you know, like when we have events or when we have cleanup sessions or things like, like that throughout the city and folks come and they volunteer, they get a free one day pass. Or you could utilize it for, um, I don't know, the census. A lot of census, you know, I know we're striving to be the number one, right? Um, things like that. Um, to me, I would be more inclined to something like that, uh, where, you know, you come, you volunteer, and, and uh, you get a free day pass. It's a reward? Yeah, about. yeah. Okay. Like, you, know, like, you know, like we always have the... Uh, you know, we have the cleanup day, you know, like a couple of days a year. You know, if you come and you participate, you get a free day pass. It may, you know, it may really help bring a community more together because it incentivizes that. That would be something I would look more into. And I think that would be great even for Warm Oak Springs, too. I'm not saying you don't do a day. I'm just saying that, 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 that utilizing uh, things like that might be a little more. Wouldn't be as costly either. Yeah, it wouldn't be as costly. And. And uh, they would they would utilize the facilities during normal times, normal hours, normal you know just like normal because they get a ticket, you know, and, and then they can utilize it for whatever day that they want to utilize it for, and maybe you know maybe it's you know it has a time frame of nine months or something I don't know, but something like that would be something I would be more inclined to really look at because I, again I think it will incentivize community togetherness, and uh, but that's just an insight that I have, and that's all I have now. Can I comment on that? Can I ask my questions? Okay. Um, I, I would like to see it for, based on what you're doing here prior to Commissioner Hanks' idea, which is a, a really cool idea. Um, I do think we need to do both because we don't have any volunteer opportunities Community-wide, we had the Serve Florida for when we cleared the um, for the disc golf, but two and a half hours seems a very short amount of time. By the time you get there, you get changed, you get the kids where they need to go. You by the time it, it's like, oh, we're done. You got to leave. I think it's just too short. I understand why you want to do the <coughs> reservations. Um, and I think one day is not enough, especially if you're only going to be able to do reservations. Um, it doesn't give the access. How many people would be able, an option one, you said how many people would be able to participate? How many people would be able to participate with option two? Uh, 2,720 patrons. 2,720. And the pool would be open from what, 10 till, the whole aquatic center, I should say, would be open from what, 10 till 8? We do 8 to 8. We would need time, 8 to 8. We would need time in between. What's that two and a half hours would give you? Yeah, I just don't, that, to me, that two and a half hours is just not enough time. If you're bringing your family there, you, it's not enough time. I, I would be more inclined to do like a four-hour thing. The other thing is, is then how do you handle it if there's a no-show? So if, let's say, for hour two, the second time, <coughs> half of the people don't show up because it's, it looks like it's going to rain. It looks cloudy, and it may be raining by their house, but sunny, you know, at the aquatic center mm -hmm. or vice versa. How do you handle no-shows? Well, it, if it's the reservation, um, we would not um, t let somebody take those 
basis because we don't know when they might choose to come in during that two and a half hour time frame and to tell them they have a, a reservation but now they can't come in because they decided to come later um, probably would not be the best action for that. I mean, on, on a first come first serve, um, it's, it's just, we can serve more people with this option too. That's, that's why we put it in there. Um, the other thing is the, what are the projected losses if you were to have option one be open for the full facility? Um, we'd have to add the staffing cost into that. Um, we certainly could do that. You're saying have the full facility open, but on a first come, first serve basis. Yeah. We just have to add that staffing cost in, um, which is the um, $2,280. Okay. Is there any staff time going to be required for this reservation thing that's an option to any factor in that, but minimal. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have, Vice Mayor. Go ahead, please. I was just thinking about the, um, the program that was approved that the police department does for children. Um, they're caught doing something good or whatever that program is. Do the right thing. Yeah, do the right thing program that could be utilized. I um, think this for it also. the limit with yeah. what you could imagine that we could bring the community together on. You know, it's just a, a matter of how far you can dream it. You know, and I think it will motivate. You know, it will motivate to bring folks together. And and though I like the idea of being a, the public being able to experience um, the aquatic center. Uh, it does run at a deficit. And when you're looking at a uh, $20,000 deficit being added to a deficit already, uh, this idea that Commissioner Hanks has is, uh, it, it wouldn't affect it. I mean, they would go in and on a regular day, so there wouldn't be but just that single ticket mm -hmm. being expended for an expense. Um, I actually like the idea that he has. So regarding the idea that Commissioner Hanks had, and, and I think it's absolutely a great idea, out of the box thinking, I think we also need to put how, how many tickets are we giving out a year? What department gets these tickets? And I, I mean tickets golden ticket you know um how 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 is it done you know I, um you probably it, it just you may also want to consider how many hours they need to volunteer yeah how many hours that they volunteer to get a free one um what constitutes volunteers and the only the only drawback i see is who manages it you know, oh, you've got three hours. Well, you got to have four. So you come back. Okay, here's my fourth hour. How, how does it get managed? I could see this becoming a deep, dark hole. <laughs> I, I think it would just be each department that has volunteer opportunities. They already manage the mm -hmm. hours that volunteers okay. work and they track them. So we would be um, depending on that department to provide us, you know, by a certain date with a list of volunteers that have qualified for the pass. But how would that work for the general public? Because, you know, a working mom, I, I don't volunteer for the police department or parks and rec or anything like that. I don't do, you know, the um, adopt a roads or adopt a parks. Um, it's not recognized volunteer that I may do. How, how do they get to participate and get a free golden ticket? How, how does that work? I don't think that can work. I think no. it needs to be tracked. It needs to be something that is actually a tracked hour by a department for some sort of volunteer service. So and then I go back to then this, the whole purpose of having these free days is to thank the taxpayers for having this, giving them an opportunity to enjoy it free. 
with no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to do a reservation and that's something the board will have to decide. But to have slated amount of volunteer hours, it, that could become a very difficult thing to manage, um, especially for people that don't volunteer on a regular basis and in a structured volunteer manner. Um, so I have a concern with that. I think it's a great idea. I would love to see something implemented for like um, the police officers catching the kids doing something good. Um, I, I think that that could be done. Um, those are my thoughts on it. Thank you. Anybody else? To, to open up um, the facility. Um, personally, myself, I would like to see the entire facility open, not just using the regular schedule where it's not open. I would like to see the full facility. If you're going to have a free day, allow them to experience the entire aquatic facility. Uh, so which way we go? Uh, I mean, the full facility is only an option two. But if you tweak option one, uh, you can do it in option one also. So it, it falls down to first come, first serve. And if you got 800 people at the gate at 8 o'clock <laughs> and how long they stay, they may stay four hours I mean, because there's no cycle uh, to do that. So to me, there has to be some type of restriction on the amount of time mm -hmm. and, you know, how they pass in and out. You have done these online um, time slots in the past, so it's not that you're inventing something new. You already have that and the ability to regulate that. So I guess after talking like that, I lean toward option two. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, I was just listening to the vice mayor, but you, you, you have brought up a couple times about you have to take a break in between, correct? So if we did it at first come, first serve, and then you took the break, and then you did it again at first come, first serve, that may offer up that opportunity to get more people in there because they have to get out. You're cleaning the area, then more people come back in. You know, they may be getting out, going to their car, waiting, what is it, about an hour that you're doing the cleaning, or? Well, the, the, the breaks I was referring to were not necessarily cleaning, although cleaning will be done. These were to clear out the facility so that then we can bring in the next group For so it's two. really it was just half an hour in between that we were going to you know you, your two and a half hours is done we're closed they leave and then the next group comes in right but you could do like four hours we, and then, we could certainly and then maybe do that. people are lining up outside for the second four hours whatever now, i'm just looking yeah. at different options to accommodate more whatever people. whatever commission wants to do um like i said we were just trying to accommodate the most people that we could I'm trying to do it as reasonably priced as possible as well, mm -hmm. too. So, I I'm leaning towards having it the two days option one on the Friday and on the Saturday, um, having the full facility open. I mean, if you're going to have if if you're going to have a free day, oh sorry, you can only go to the pool. Well, we wanted to use the aquatic center. You know, it's the aquatic center free day. And, and I, I really think that that whole facility needs to be opened. Reservations, yeah, I'm kind of on the fence on that. Good idea. I can see the, the positives. I can also see some, some constraints. Um, the, three, the two and a half hours is, in my opinion, is nowhere near long enough. Um, but the first come, first serve, if people want to go in and experience it, they're going to be there at you know, 730 getting in line. Or they're going to just hey, we're going to go at 11 and we're going to take our chances. Most people, like you said, they're there three hours and they pretty much leave three and a half hours tops. You're going to have this, this constant. I don't see somebody being there 12 hours. So that's the way I'm leaning. And I, I just, how do, you, how do you determine if they are Northport residents if you have it open the whole time and you're not taking the reservation? They, they would still show um, driver's license or something like that. I mean, that, that's what we do now. Okay. 
Kind of like what you do up at Warm Mineral Springs Day? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. If you don't have those time slots, and if you stretched it to three mm -hmm. hours instead of two and a half, uh, you still have to empty it out. Otherwise, all 800 that are there can go stand back in line again and keep the new people from being first come, first serve. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you, you empty everybody out, so all they do is go stand in line again to go through the next three hours. Uh, and the people who didn't have a reservation or anything try to come. I mean, we hear complaints about that already. Uh, so I think you have to have established time frames for it to you be able to come any point during that three hours or whatever, and when your time slot is up, the next time slot comes in. It's the only way to assure the variety of patrons. All right, so I think we've conversationed this out. Does anybody want to make a motion or city manager? Is this, you're looking for some type of direction. Yes, ma'am. my understanding. I would okay. love to get a motion. In the <clears throat> Thank you. Direction. Discuss whether we want this to be one day or two day, Let's because I think we motions. can, we can, well, your one and two is in option one and two. So, um, Personally, I would rather it be one day, but I do see um, a value to having it Friday and Saturday, so I can go either way. If you have it the two days and it's full facility, to me, that's more money. I mean, because it's that extra 2000 twice. So you got about another $5,000 being added to that fourteen. so you're right back about the same amount. Um, so I would. Can I make a, can I piggyback off that? If we did it one day this year, meaning fiscal year uh, 21, we'll get feedback, we'll get ideas and suggestions. There's nothing preventing us from doing another one later on in the year, is there? If that's um, commission's desire, we can do that. Because if you, I, I don't know, when were you looking to do something like this? Obviously, in the when, summer season when school is out. When school is out. So if we did it like at the beginning of the summer and it was a huge hit and we worked out the tweaks, there's nothing preventing us from saying, hey, let's do another one towards the end of the summer. Correct? Okay. All right, then I move to approve option two as presented. I got a motion on the floor to approve option two as presented um, by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carison. Um, City Clerk, before we just, did you catch the time Commissioner Carison came yes. in? Thank you very much. Um, anything to that, Vice Mayor? Uh, it is the one day option. They have thought it through. Uh, the only change that we might want to look at is making it three hour intervals instead of two and a half. But as presented is the way I read the motion. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carrison? Nothing. I think it's fair compromise. Fantastic. The only thing I, I would like to see is it done in the beginning. That way then we can have enough time to organize and get another one at the end if, if it is that successful. Um, so I don't know if you need an amendment to city manager or... No, ma'am. We, we have... You, Vice Mayor, do you want to make an amendment to increase the time from the two and a half hours? Because by the motion, that is what they're going to do is two and a half hours. Uh, by the and I want to go with their option, what they have worked out. This is the first time you talked about, let's do it one time. So we will get a feedback of was the two and a half hours appropriate or not. So I want to go with what they have worked through and see what happens. Thank you for the, the job. Thank you. Any other conversation? Hearing none, let's go ahead and take the vote. Oh, already did. Commissioner Emmerich, thank you. And that passed five to zero.
Now, before we end this conversation, Commissioner Hanks had a really great idea. Um, Commissioner Hanks, do you want to put a motion or get consensus to bring back additional information? Utilizing uh, uh, community work days, uh, you know, I mentioned we could utilize the, uh, the, uh, you know, the census. Anything we can think of, sky's the limit to bring the community together. Um, that you know, when we have volunteers or things like like that that happen, uh, you know, we award them with a uh, ticket for a day. You know, uh, you know, some something like like that. So, I, I just think a consensus would probably work for them to bring back some information about how they might use that and some ideas they might have uh, to what we can utilize it for. Great idea. As as concise as that was, um, is it understood, City Clerk, for the Consensus. Thank you. Uh, well, to have staff come back uh, with some ideas and um, I guess the structure of what it would look like to offer free pass days as a reward for volunteer work or whatever we think of that the community can come together uh, uh, and partner with the city. Much better. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hanks. All right, let's get that consensus, Commissioner Hanks, Vice Mayor. I'm a, I'm a yes, and I can see this being utilized. We talked about having a time for our um, advisory boards to thank them. Uh, they should be receiving a pass. I mean, we talked about the police department, you know, caught doing the right thing. Uh, you've got the... Um, Program, yeah, explore, explore you know, those types of things. So I think um, I think it's a great idea. It exposes the aquatic center to people who don't normally go there. So uh, I'm a yes. I'm absolutely a yes. I think it's a fantastic, phenomenal idea. And I look forward to seeing what staff brings back and how it can get implemented sooner rather than later. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hanks. Uh, Commissioner Carrison. Yes. Commissioner Emmerich? Yes. All right. And that passed five to zero. Look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now we are going to talk about the Veterans Park. But before I turn it over to City Manager, um, I wanted to just let everybody know that it was myself that gave everybody the pictures and the little flyer um, about some Veterans Parks that I have attended. Um, for the sake of argument, I'm going to walk down and give it to um, to our veterans groups that are here and have yeah. them just <laughs> review it, and that way then they'll see what we're talking about if it comes up in conversation. Um, so, City Manager, I'll turn it over to you now. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to uh, defer again to uh, Parks and Rec uh, <laughs> Department and uh, our directors here to address this issue. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, again, for the record, Sandy Funheller, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, this uh, Veterans Park proposed locations. Uh, this was something that um, a joint meeting with City Commission and the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board back on September 2019 uh, to come back with proposed areas to relocate Veterans Park um, and present those to the advisory boards and then come back to commission. I'm going to ask our Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation, Tr Tricia Wisner, to come up. Good morning, Commissioners. Tricia Wisner. Um, based upon the direction that we received from that joint meeting, we did schedule time with the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Um, while waiting for those meetings, I was invited to a commander's meeting, so I got to meet with um, representatives from American Legion, AMVETS, VFW, to really talk about what they're looking for as far as an ideal location for a veterans park. And I'd like to thank the gentlemen that are here today um, that helped with this discussion. Um, unfortunately, the meetings for the advisory boards were postponed due to COVID, so that's there was a bit of a delay in this. But the first meeting, um, the commander's <coughs> meeting, we did go through a list of, first, what are they looking for in a park? I need, we really want to understand the pros and cons for the current location. Um, parking, enough parking so that they could have a nice Memorial Day, Veterans Day event. Um, paved parking would be ideal, especially to make sure that we had ADA parking for some of the needs. 
They were looking for restroom facilities that were close by. Um, a park that would really embody the, the great sacrifice that so many people have made, uh, you know, a park that was um, really representative of all the armed forces. They were also looking for, um, hopeful to have electricity so that they could easily have amplified sound when they needed it. Um, also maybe some shade and some lighting and, you know, some of those nice aesthetics that go into a typical park. Um, nobody was asking for anything really off base. It was really what you would expect for a good, solid park. Um, after that, we went through all the lands that were in our park system, undeveloped, developed. Um, were there locations that maybe we could cohabit a new uh, veterans park, or do we need to look someplace completely new? And we had a really great conversation with this group. After, this, um, after looking at many parcels, the primary location that was, um, the primary three locations that were discussed is in your backup material. I did go ahead and put it up on the screen so that we could have these discussions. One is this location at City Hall. It's kind of off to the side at City Hall. Some positives with this is there's parking. Um, people all know where it is. Uh, if the event was uh, scheduled at an appropriate time, we would probably have restroom access available. Um, there is, um, I did have the arborist go out. There are no concerns with heritage trees or anything of that nature that's not a stormwater area. There were previous plans for some kind of amphitheater or some kind of development in this area a while ago that have not come to fruition. So um, there, there's some thought that this would eventually be some kind of public space. There were some downsides to this. Um, is it tucked off to the side and not really its own park and its own field? Does it, does it do enough justice? However, with talking with the gentleman, um, this location was the primary location that this group felt would be the best relocation for a veterans park. And as I say that, I want to make a point that veterans park, where it is now, is very important to these, these groups and so many members within our community um, that it was recommended that we don't actually relocate. Veterans Park. Let's keep Veterans Park where it is. It's, it's a very important park as is. Um, let's build something new. We also did reach out to um, the people that made monuments or in, in similar monuments. They do not feel that the monuments that are currently in existing existence at Veterans Park would necessarily be able to be moved without crumbling, breaking. Um, and the cost to build a new one would be about the same cost as moving one. So it'd be better to leave what we have there, um, continue to honor that location and look for a new location. Other locations that we looked at, especially with this group, um, the location at Pan American. So this is a vacant lot directly across from the Garden of Five Senses. There are some positives to this. It's a bigger location. Um, people are familiar with the Garden of Five Senses. It's a great, great garden, very serene. Um, we do have some neighbors in this area. There is, as you can tell, that there are some wetland concerns where you can see right where the drainage is. It is not currently developed. There would be the need to develop parking. Um, while we say, oh, there's some synergy with the Garden of Five Senses to tell somebody that they would need to park across the street and or use a restroom across the street really wouldn't be such a viable option. There aren't currently any trees here, so it would require a lot of landscaping, and we do have neighbors right in this area. Um, another location that we looked at was um, at Highland Ridge Park. Uh, there were some current concerns with Highland Ridge Park. Um, it doesn't really have dedicated parking. It wasn't really um, a, a, a and I don't know where it went. So it was here this morning. So, go, but go. it is in the backup. Yeah. Um, there's an open space right next to Highland, off to the side of the pickleball courts, and it is in your backup. Um, this one was by far the lowest received from the group. This information then also went to the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, um, the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board felt that the location at Pan American was the best. Um, they had a 2-1 vote for Pan American. Um, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board felt that the location at City Hall was the best. 
Um, so they had a 4-1 vote for that. Um, based upon this, we are looking for direction as to where we think the new park should go. Um, and then also as food for thought, depending upon what we're looking for. So in the backup material, there's pictures of um, ideas of veterans parks. Um, we can do something as that uh, just goes along with the five armed forces. Um, when I spoke with the gentleman, the picture in the top left was something similar to what they were thinking. Maybe, maybe a flagpole for each, maybe not, maybe some water feature, um, but something with a lot of shade and, and just an area that they can have those, uh, those ceremonies. This is another park, I believe, that came from the commissioner's um, pictures. And then here is a park that's new in Punta Gorda. There was information as to the cost for this scale of park in the backup material. So obviously thinking of what it is we're looking for will help determine what size land we need um, and what size budget eventually we'll be looking at as well. And then here's just some um, different monuments within the area and throughout the nation that, uh, that people are using to commemorate veterans parks. So looking for feedback on location and overall scope. Um, Commission, before we do um, the questions, I just wanted to share with you, um, when we first brought this up in workshop, I promised to uh, share the pictures that you have. Um, I wanted to give just a little bit of background on the two that I went to. Uh, the one is in Chillicothe, Illinois. It's a very small park, probably, if I was to guess, about three acres in size. The land was all donated. The veterans groups and citizens paid for it in entirety. It is not part of their parks and rec. It is actually maintained by the veterans groups. Um, the, they did that um, facility um, with $250,000 all donated. They sold bricks. They sold um, the benches, the marble benches that has each insignia of the a military branch. Um, people donated the flagpoles. Uh, the, the park land itself was donated. Um, the city contributed very minimally. I think they contributed for like the parking lot. Um, Tampa's park is much larger, much grander, and it is absolutely beautiful too on a totally different scale. Uh, the, the park in Tampa used to be a mobile home facility, so it has a lot of acreage. It has a lot of mature trees already there. Um, and each area, and I mean area, is designated to each war. Um, and they have like little picnic tables and stuff in that. And then they also have a huge pavilion. Um, they have also a building where they do the veteran services. So I shared the two ends of the spectrum and to show that the sky is the limit um, as to what it is that we want to do will be our decision. Um, I, I would much rather see it be done here at City Hall because it is a little bit more manageable and able to have that veteran citizen participation to really make it their part. Um, so with that said, if anybody has any questions on the pictures or the two veteran parks that I promised to share, I'm all for it too. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions and um, uh, Vice Mayor. Yeah, uh, I believe I was the one who actually brought up the, the old ball field over by Garden of Five Senses, but with where we're at, and knowing the needs and the desires of the gentleman, um, I believe City Hall fits it best too. It is going to provide the paved parking without having to build paved parking. Uh, you don't have to do the landscaping as far as adding trees because the trees are there. Uh, I mean, it's not slated to be built this year. It's not in the budget. So this conversation kind of is, is a stepping stone to when we do place it within the budget. But um, 
I lean toward City Hall also because I believe it would be the most cost-effective place. Personally, myself, I would like to see an arch kind of drive going into it so that um, people can just drive by to view it without having to get out and walk also. Just a short little arch into it. Some of the other veteran parks I've been to, you can drive in and view them without getting out. And I like that for some of the seniors, they get that type of idea. So those are my comments. And you do have a public comment also. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Carson. So Skip and I started this conversation probably three years ago. And I think the intent was to have a lot of these things donated or at least contributions from the different organizations, similarly to what the mayor has presented in, in most of these. And in turn, I think that the most important thing we need to find out is what the veterans want and maybe even creating a subcommittee with the veterans organizations, the multitude of them, to determine what kind of plan they'd like to see out there. I agree wholeheartedly it, need, it should be here on City Hall. I would love to see ultimately something that, like Tampa, that is incredible. Um, and you never know, maybe down the road we can do something like that. But for right now, as a kind of a quick stop, I do believe that the City Hall property is, is one of the things that we had discussed. And, um, as minimal impact to the city budget as possible because we're in no shape to it. Not that we're not in any good shape. It's just that this is, this is a little bit different where we have a lot of veteran communities and, and associations here that everybody needs to have a buy-in. And so I think that the city can do a little bit and then, and, and more so in organizing those different organizations to make sure that everybody has the buy-in, the uh, ability to put their participation in what they want to see, and how, what can they do to create something that they know uh, will be successful. And the other thing is they'll be looking at it at a different viewpoint, because myself, I often look at parks and I forget about the accessibility for some of our veterans who that's who are disabled, you know, and, and it's I don't mean to, but honestly, you know, OK, that that semicircular drive through is fantastic idea, because really, like if you're in a wheelchair or if you're immobilized from the neck down, you really want to make sure that you have a good uh, foundation to to drive up there and see whatever it is that they determine to put there. So. I love the idea of being here in City Hall, but I think as Mayor McDowell said, I don't, I want us to still kind of look bigger, you know, in the future. Um, because I think something like Tampa, what they have is just incredible. And um, our vets are worth it. And as time goes on, I'm telling you, we, we really need to have some education to that as well. You know, not only, to have statues, but to have something that actually explains the differences and, you know, because people do not understand what a veteran even is or what the wars are or what conflicts are and, and, and how many people have lost their lives for our freedom. And I think that it's imperative that we have young people understand those things. So uh, making sure there's an education portion to it as well is important to me. Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, I was in, in agreement with the uh, vice mayor on the area across from the Gardens of the Five Senses because it was the bigger of the areas. And, and with me and veterans, I know Skip, and uh, we've had quite a few conversations on this. To have an area for our veterans, I just think big because our veterans have given the ultimate sacrifice and we've lost that meaning in culture today. And I'm always been a go big or go home. But when you look at it and you look at the logistics of everything, City Hall does make sense. City Hall is 
almost pre-prepared to go ahead and go out and do something. I agree that I would like the veterans to come up with a design plan, how they would like to see it incorporated between all the different, you know, the Legion, the AMVETs, the VFWs, all of them, auxiliary women, everybody get together and it makes a community build this together. I was at Lashley Park, they have the miniature wall down there. That was actually done by fundraisers and everything through different organizations. They made it happen. It took a while. They were, we're almost there. We're almost, oh, we're finally there. Talk about a sense of accomplishment to go down there and view that. And I get chills every time I walk through it. So I'm, I'm all on board. I think today is about picking a site. I, I would like to, you know, recommend City Hall as well. But I would also make it a point to where we get together and have you guys figure out just how we want to place it, bring it to us, let us talk about it, or hell, I'll even come to your meetings when they're at the, at the Legion, and I'll give my input. But let's work together and make this happen and get the community involved, and it would be a lot less expensive on the city. You know, we've got everything in the starting gates for you. Let's go from there and see where we can end up. So that's all I had, Mayor. Thank you. Um, my thoughts on this is we absolutely need to do something. I definitely do not want to touch the Veterans Park that is existing over there at Biscayne and 41. That is a mainstay of our city, and it, and it deserves to stay where it's at. Um, but we also need to expand on that space. You know, our population is growing. Um, our citizens are growing. Our veterans, uh, the amount of veterans in our city is growing. Um, to have it be a true community um, asset with their buy-in is imperative. Um, while I agree we need the, the veterans groups to come up with ideas and suggestions, we have a lot of veterans that don't belong to veterans groups who have ideas and suggestions. We, need, we have the community who has ideas and suggestions. We can't think of it all. Um, and I would really like to also have a community conversation or a, a citizen survey kind of thing based on what they propose. Maybe they have two or three or four different suggestions on what this looks like and then bring it to the citizens of Northport and say, hey, what do you think about these three or four ideas and, and get the buy-in from them? Because then you're also planting the seed. Hey, we're going to sell bricks. Hey, we're selling benches. Hey, we're selling fill in the blank. Um, maybe you get with people for trees, for donating for some additional trees, because you are going to have to probably pull some trees out, sadly, um, minimally as possible, but also add to it. Um, let's make this a real, true community endeavor, because I think they'll be able to get it done a lot quicker than we can, and they have their buy-in. And you're planting those seeds to start having the veterans think about buying those bricks or benches. And I, I think we need to get that in community buy-in, not just the veterans' ideas and suggestions. But City Hall is, to me, the, the really only option available to us because of the cost of adding a parking lot. <laughs> we all know how expensive that is. So, um, uh, Commissioner Car uh, Luke, did you want to speak again? Yeah, I love the idea of it being built by the community. It's a community built. Uh, definitely uh, leaving Veterans Park where it's at for historical, honorable, you know, honoring them and stuff. I don't know if the waterfall needs to stay, though. Um, to my knowledge, the waterfall was put in after the monument was, and you can't even see the monument when you're driving down 41 because there's that I'm not going to describe the waterfall. I'll refrain from doing that. But that waterfall there in front of that monument, I, I would like to see that thing removed so that as you're going down 41, you actually see the memorial. You see the dedication uh, to them. So that is what I wanted to add in regards to that. Thank you. Commissioner Carson, and then we'll have public comment. I'm just ready for a motion. So. We'll get a hold off. Yeah. Um, public comment? Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, Danny Schumann. Right. Thank you. Hello, I'm Danny Schumann. I'm from the VFW representative. <clears throat> uh, we also believe that the city hall is the best location. Uh, we looked at the other ones. We're right by the Garden of Five Senses, but we still believe the facility here would be a much better for, especially like I said, with the parking, the facilities you have, and also being a partnership with the city. We'll be right here when we do have uh, events at the memorial. It would be a lot easier for uh, commissioners and mayor and everyone to attend the, uh, the events when they're right here next to City Hall. So I think that would be a, our opinion from the veterans of foreign wars here in the, in the city would be here at City Hall. That's our uh, recommendation also from us. And we definitely love to be part of a, uh, uh, a board or uh, advisory to help uh, figure all that out. Uh, what to go into it. So we're looking forward to working with you and, and building that. And we uh, re really appreciate your dedication to the veterans here in Northport. So that's all I have. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And thank you for your service. And yours too, Skip. <laughs> all right. Um, if we're going, oh, city manager, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the ad hoc committee idea is brilliant. That's really good. Um, that being said, once the vision and the kind of overall high level stuff is decided or, or brought back to y'all and y'all approve it, you're still going to need a professional design done for the. I just kind of want to remind you about that. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Can I ask a question on that? Hang on one second. Um, City Clerk, did we have any online public comment? No. I, I have to. <laughs> continuously remember that and I, I I'm trying and still failing um, go ahead uh, Commissioner Carson uh, professional design what I guess it all depends on what it is that they come up with a water, plan. you're gonna have a lot of issues ground uh, you know if you do sidewalks the, right the, right right concrete is probably one of the right. biggest ones okay and then what if the veterans have a company that donate it. Would that be? Well, as long as it's somebody willing okay. to put their certification. You know what I mean? I'm trying to think of ways yeah. that the city yeah. doesn't have to pay for anything. Yeah. Maybe if we make it a real large. Well, somebody's willing to put their seal. Exactly. And it's donated. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we might know a few. Yeah. Might know a few people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm ready for a motion then. Okay, go ahead, please, Commissioner Carrison. Okay, I'll move to uh, ask staff to create an ad hoc committee in collaboration with the veterans organizations, veterans of, in general and public, uh, to plan and develop the new veterans park at the area designated here at City Hall. Second. <laughs> I was waiting to see if she was done. All I'm right. sorry. So I have a motion on the floor as stated by Commissioner Carasone, City Clerk, <coughs> and captured. And so clear. And our <laughs> veteran, Commissioner Emmerich, seconded that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything to that, uh, Commissioner Carasone? Um, just that I really didn't touch on the current city, uh, the Veterans Park, and what uh, Vice Mayor had talked about. Because I would actually like to know where that um, came from, you know, the the whole background of it, where you know how it got there. John I can't Morgan remember. Can tell you that, and it's not pretty. I'll no, no, the water portion was not there. That's something that was just put there within the last like fifteen years or so. And so it was the my art knowledge, piece, right? Of no, it's been there for a very long time. Yeah, it's been the there. water thing. Yes, it's been the there water for water, yeah. ever. Yeah. Strong mayor put it there in objection. I thought that was okay. The okay, monument. one at a time, guys. Okay. But anyways, <laughs> regardless, I need to get a better handle on like right. what came where that, and when and all that. That can I, come through the ad hoc yeah. process. Right. Exactly. Oh, that's true too. Yeah, yeah. ad hoc committee could deal with that too. But and that world globe that's over there was an art piece that was put there yes. afterwards. Maybe as that's well. what I'm thinking of. That was put the there 10, 15 years ago. So it, it was fairly recent that that globe was put there. I'm not saying it's a nuisance or an eyesore. I'm just giving you a timeline. 
but it doesn't block the memorial. Let's stick to the motion, guys. Guys, hold up. Got a motion on the floor. But, uh, Commissioner Karras spoke to it. Commissioner Rich, do you need to speak to the motion? No, I'm just glad that we're moving forward with it and look forward to participating any way I can and uh, moving this along and getting it done. Can I ask one question? If Parks is okay with what how the motion was stated, is there anything that I'm missing out or leaving out? Okay. I think we're, we're good. good. Thank you. Um, only comment I want to make is I look forward to seeing what this ad hoc committee and our citizens come up with for this Veterans Park. and. Um, you know me, and uh, I, I would like to also just maybe see if we can get an amendment to the motion to um, see what we can come up with in like nine months or less, because this is really important, and we need to um, be cognizant of the space that we have over at 41 in Biscayne and try and get this one moving. Um, and I think if we were to say, you know, within nine months, come back, yeah. I, I don't I, 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 staff um, we won't be able to control the the outside organizations Correct. but staff is willing to meet uh, as needed at, in order to accommodate that but we can't control the pace that the other organizations are willing to, to travel at I hear you so, I, I don't want to be on the hook for somebody else I can be on the hook for our our exactly. stuff I can't be on the hook for somebody else's stuff well, I don't want it to become a well we can't meet with staff and we can't meet with ad hoc committees I don't want it to become this gotcha. finger pointing and this is why nothing's moving gotcha. so maybe regular update city manager might be in order okay go ahead what if we say uh, staff to have uh, the ad hoc committee created or a report within the next six months do you think that's a viable do you think within six months we can either have a report that says i can't get as many people together or yes i can i think that sounds fine just report months, back yeah. where yeah. we're at at that right. point i think it's fine well, then we got julie yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 we can we can do that the six months we've got Okay. You want to make an amendment then? So I'll uh, sure I'll uh, amend the motion to include a timeline of six months for staff to have the ad hoc committee created, or at minimum, a report on the progress. Second. Motion on the floor for a six-month ad hoc committee and staff uh, report back to commission in six months. And that was made by Commissioner Carrison and seconded by uh, Vice Mayor. Anything to the amendment, Commissioner Carrison? Vice Mayor. No. Let's go ahead and take the vote on the amendment. <coughs> and that passed five to zero. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, questions? No. Main motion. We'll go ahead and vote on the main motion as amended. And that also passed five to zero. We're one step closer. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you staff too for that input. And I cannot wait to see how this is gonna look. Just for your little tidbit, Mayor, um, that fountain has a totally different well. Oh, I know. Oh dear. <laughs> oh yes. Oh dear. And it's, uh, yeah. Hey, speaking of that fountain, let's get a consensus to have staff come back with information about that fountain because. Is that what we can get from the ad hoc? Yeah, no. I think it could come back in that six month report. Yeah, but. You want it sooner than the six months? How, I, I'm, I'm concerned with the activities that I see in and around that fountain that is happening currently. And I wonder if it may be a public health hazard. Mm -hmm. I and I'm trying to be very I know what you're gentle <laughs> with my comments. Very broad. <laughs> are, are you wanting a game plan on how to decommission the fountain? Or I'm what, I don't, wanting what do you want to get? I'm, I'm looking for information about the about healthiness water. of having that fountain in its current location. 
He wants to evaluate the health uh, Here, here's issues the problem. with that uh, Listen, I'll be the one to tell you. They turn the water uh, off. Yeah, turn the water Yeah, yeah water I mean, off. I'm not afraid. Okay. Uh, turn the water off because the, the homeless people that are in the area are taking uh, showers I, I it. in it I, and so on I and so forth. Point. And it's okay. Yeah. So basically... We can uh, we can do that, but I would. Well, how about also, this? I'll come back with a, uh, or just a memo explaining how we're going to decommission the. That is what I would like to do, mm -hmm. and you can do it in the first step of shutting the water off, and then yeah. come back. And empty in it. Don't leave the water in there. Okay. I'm but, not going to bring it back as a Jedi. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Memo to decommission, decommission and remove it. Okay. I think on top of that, I think that you're also going to have to ask that um, city staff or our city. Police departments, homeless outreach, get involved as well because okay. I think that you're taking away a re you're taking away a resource we'll that while the general public may feel that it's not right. necessity, you know it is something that they're all they use gotcha. and so we you know there's got to be we'll be sensitive. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. All part. You need a consensus on that. I, I think you got it. I think I'm. <laughs> I think you right. got it. The deputy chief are listening. All right. Um, it is 11.30 already. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> wow, that went. Uh, we are almost done, though, but maybe not. All we have left, oh, we do have two items left. So let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at quarter to 12, and then we'll finish up. All right. Thank you. Amber's long winded. I need a break before that. Oh my God, it's 11 30. I wasn't going to say anything. I was 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 going to say anything. Until what? Just out. How'd you fall? We're walking into the car. What's going on? You silly girl. Yeah. I did my So I'm going to move my name. We have an ordinance and the workflow right now.
All righty, guys, we are back to Commission Chambers and uh, City Attorney. I think I'm going to turn this one over to you. We're going to talk about this mediation. Yes, ma'am. This item relates to a petition for relief that a developer, um, Whedon Northport LLC, filed under the Florida Land Use and Environmental Dispute Resolution Act, which requires that the city and the developer engage in a mediation with a special magistrate, and then if that's not successful, to continue to a hearing with the magistrate. The item before you has been brought for your consideration to help make that process as expedient as possible under the current calendaring restrictions and statutory timeframes. Assistant City Attorney Margaret Roberts is here to answer any questions or provide any additional explanation you may need on the item. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Did you have a little presentation about it to give a brief overview or? No, I do not have a presentation for you. I think the city attorney has outlined what our purpose is for scheduling the meeting. If you do have questions, I'll be happy to answer. We do have a hearing scheduled on the 16th and the 22nd. They're kind of bookends, and that's the reason for the short window uh, for your consideration of uh, the uh, mediation recommendation, if there is any. You said you have mediation scheduled on October 16th and October 22nd? There are hearings scheduled for both of those days currently, yes. So if, if mediation is scheduled for the 16th and 22nd, how can we choose the 19th, 20th, or 21st for a commission meeting? Well, the mediation, think of it being on the 16th, has the possibility of resulting in a recommendation uh, in response to the petition uh, and an effort to solve the dispute. Uh, if that occurs, then the commission would review and consider that recommendation in that window of 19 20, 21. If the commission does not uh, accept the recommendation, then a hearing is then continued on the 22nd. Thank you. Thank you. Additionally, Mayor, it is possible that on the 16th, no mediation recommendation results that the parties are, you know, so far apart that there is no recommendation. That's why we have the if any and the um, item language and the motion language, so that if there is no mediation recommendation that results from that meeting, then you wouldn't have to come up for a special meeting just to say there's nothing to consider. Thank you. I. I heard something that wasn't mentioned in the backup on the 22nd, so I wanted to get that clarity. So thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, to my understanding, the reasoning, one of the major reasonings for doing this is so that it is this complete commission that would be looking at it and not delaying it for a different commission it is the most expedited we've been able to uh, schedule for you. All right. Before there was any kind of change, the same commission that saw it before would be seeing it again. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Um, I do have some questions. Um, thank you for that memo, City Clerk, regarding the aggrieved parties. Um, is the mediation open to the public or is it closed session? It is open to the public. Mediation, of course, splits the parties into separate rooms. Those individual rooms will not be open to the public, but the chambers will be. Now, we're hopeful that, um, you know, capacity will allow. We have scheduled uh, for the possibility of over overflow. Is mediation happening here? Yes, ma'am. And who participates in mediation? Obviously the applicant, I get that. But who in the city is going to participate? The parties, of course, the city and the developer. The uh, aggrieved parties have an opportunity should they wish to participate. And you also have notices to contiguous property owners and they have an opportunity to give any concerns, any substantive concerns. 
and it's particularly focused on the um, possibility of resolving, reaching a middle ground. So for purposes of mediation, you're always looking to see if there is a middle ground that could um, result in a recommendation to resolve a dispute. And specifically on behalf of the city, um, you would have the city's special counsel has been retained. Ms. Roberts will be attending as well um, as the acting city manager or whoever's the city manager in place. Um, and whatever, whatever staff the administration might need who has particular expertise on the issue. Um, is this, Margaret, is this a, this is not a publicly noticed public hearing, is No, it, it is not a, a public meeting per se, but the public, uh, the meeting is open at the beginning of the mediation, uh, and the mediator, special magistrate who serves as the mediator, will be able to address any um, comments. I believe he indicated in the notice that uh, at the beginning of each day, whether it be the 16th or the 22nd, the public would have an opportunity to participate. And are we talking about the public at large or talking about the members of the public who are contiguous owners who have been noticed for the process? Anyone who, <clears throat> excuse me, anyone who requests to participate in the notice also, it identifies the um, name of the special magistrate for contacting uh, with regard to an interest in participating. It's primarily designed for the, the persons who um, uh, were the parties and the agreed parties at the uh, commission meeting of June 15th. How are they notified? They were notified by United States Mail. Uh, I believe that letter went out on September the 3rd. The notice was prepared by the special magistrate, and that went out on September the 2nd. They received a copy of the notice of hearing, uh, as well as a letter explaining a little bit about the process, and a copy of the petition for relief that was filed by Whedon. Thank you. When will the property owners within that quarter mile be notified? The quarter mile will come uh, to the 15-day the normal um, advertisement and notice. Uh, when it comes back to the commission uh, for your consideration so that they will have the opportunity to, again, participate um, in your decision. So are there two separate notices, one notifying the quarter mile radius of the mediation meeting and then another quarter mile notification of the commission meeting? No. Or is it one and the same? The quarter mile radius for the uh, mediation has not been sent because it, it is the parties who were most knowledgeable in June about your um, uh, decision that was made and their participation. So it's, it's more focused on those persons in the mediation. Uh, so there is not a, a broad quarter mile. Um, the statute requires the contiguous property owners, uh, and there are 10, two of which were the aggrieved parties. So they have received the United States mail notice as required by statute. So there is no notification for the quarter mile radius, just the contiguous property owners. That's correct. Thank you for that clarification. Sir. Appreciate that. And also just to clarify, the only persons who have a right to participate in the mediation process are those who receive notice under the statute. Is that right? Well, no, uh, it's a little broader than that. So, so someone who uh, demonstrates a substantive interest in uh, participating in the resolution or why not to resolve um, is able to contact the special magistrate and request to participate. Again, focused on those contiguous property owners and of course the parties. Okay. So the contiguous property owners are notified. Yes. 
Are they the contiguous property owners that are specifically adjacent to and connecting to that property? Yes, sharing the same boundary line. And again, that's by statute. Thank you. You're welcome. May I ask? So we go through this process, and there is a hearing scheduled for the 22nd, correct? Correct. That hearing is us, correct? No, that hearing is the special magistrate, again, okay. to, to give you the full um, look at the, the uh, process for the Dispute Resolution Act. Um, if a, a recommendation is not forthcoming on the 16th, or if the commission receives a recommendation and decides not to accept it, again, in that window for this special meeting, then uh, the magistrate holds a, uh, a hearing on the 22nd and allows, um, again, the public to participate as well as the parties who have um, participated in the uh, mediation on the 16th. Uh, then the magistrate issues a recommendation that comes to the commission. And that recommendation is then for your consideration uh, of the magistrate's uh, uh, review of all the information that's been provided in mediation and in the, um, the hearing on the 22nd. And then that's for the commission's consideration. And we think that could be done before there's a change in commission? I don't or know whether it that's going to be possible. would depend upon the magistrate possible. at that point. It will depend on how quickly the magistrate is able to issue uh, the order. By right, he has 14 days. Uh, I, I don't know that it will okay, require so it may that may many. Not. Okay. Uh, at that point, if it gets to that point, is that quarter mile notified of that meeting yes. then? Okay, thank you. I just have one final question. So the commission voted to not approve special exception. Right. It's our land use code that we follow. Mm -hmm. Why is their mediation even possible? Because it's, I, I, I guess I don't understand if, if we were the ultimate authority, why is there a mediation allowed? The whole purpose of this act is to see if there is something short of a formal appeal. And so it was um, put into the Florida statutes to provide. Um, an avenue to resolve a difference between, in this case, the commission's decision and the developer's um, interest in going forward with the project. Um, the developer, of course, may have um, those things that, that he is willing to do or not do, and that will come forth in um, um, offers for dispute resolution. But uh, those are all to be considered by statute. It's a, it's a dispute resolution process. So if the commission, and, and I understand this is all subjective and it's an if, if commission rejects whatever was recommended at mediation, then I'm hearing that the magistrate issues an order to do what? A recommendation. It's a recommendation to the commission for, in his opinion, what he thinks could resolve the dispute amicably between the city commission and the developer. Okay, but the what difference between the two recommendations, <coughs> Mayor, is the first recommendation is something that the parties think may be workable. Now, obviously, the commission has to agree to that. The second recommendation is the magistrate, as an attorney who has a lot of experience in this area, is saying, here's what I recommend. Ultimately, the commission has the ultimate decision on both, and if the dispute resolution process is unsuccessful, the developer still has appellate rights through the court system. That's where I was. When does it end? I mean, is it after that mediation, but then it can go to appellate? Mediation, hearing recommendation, 
then this dispute resolution process is over if that's unsuccessful and it goes back to the regular appeal if the developer files a one. Okie dokie. Thank you for all those uh, questions on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody have any recommendations on the 19th, 20th, or 21st? Um, looking at your calendars, uh, Commissioner Hanks, uh, are any of those days out for you? Yeah, the only, uh, it really kind of depends upon the time. Mm -hmm. The only day I really have something that I have to uh, get to board meeting that I have in Sarasota is on Tuesday. Uh, pretty much the 19th and the 21st, I'm okay. Fantastic. And you bring up a great point. Do we know what time of day this may be for the hearing? For your for meeting, meeting? Um, I, I would suggest 10 o'clock in the morning is good. Do you have an idea? It's, it just depends on the commission's will. This is, this is not the hearing itself. This is for the, you as a body to consider to something that's consider brought to you. So if you want to meet at 9 or 10 in the morning, if you want to meet at 3 or 4 p.m., it's all, it's all up to the commission. Yeah. That's where I was just yeah. going to go next. You know this commission. You know the subject matter. How long do you think something like this would take? And then I will double it. <laughs> I don't think that's us. It is also a public, you know, a meeting, so you have to allow the potential public comment. All right. Um, Vice Mayor, what is your schedule looking like? Uh, Right now, the schedule I'm looking at is open, but the Mondays <coughs> usually work the best for us, and I would say nine in the morning. And Commissioner Carrison, like a special Monday, meeting Tuesday. And morning. Commissioner Emmerich, I'm, I'm open on Monday or Tuesday. It's Tuesday, I would ask that the, uh, if you want me here, I would ask the commission to uh, uh, schedule it for about 2 o'clock. Because I have a right in the middle of the day board meeting. And I thought you Get said it. Tuesday was a good day for you. Uh, Monday, uh, well, it, it's What's the Monday and Wednesday? Frame. If it's only a couple hours, we could do, you know, 9 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. I just have to have time to get there. Why do I have the 16th here? So... With me, I have the only event that I have that I cannot change is on Tuesday. So I would not be able to start any sooner than 10 a.m. Okay. Monday, and if necessary, because this takes priority over um, the John Rawlings show where I'm their guest speaker for that day, that's at quarter to three. So I can do Monday, um, but at like nine o'clock, just in case it does go late, because I also don't want to be disrespectful to John if he's expecting me to be there, or else I can cancel it and just tell him to find somebody else and switch. So, um, and then Wednesday, city manager, you and I have the one-on-one. -on -one. We can always reschedule. That's easy peasy. So, um, can I make a suggestion? And city clerk has access to all of our calendars. Hmm. Um, can we? Is hopefully all of the time frames that are on that we just spoke about is already slated on your calendars. Can we just have city clerk find a six hour time frame? Hopefully it won't. Not, mine does not have anything personal on there, so that's not gonna work. Um were you okay for Monday though? That's what I'm trying to find the dates again, because apparently I can't find anything on this thing. Uh, what was it? Didn't someone say the 16th? 19th, 20th, 19th 20th, 20th, or 21st. 16th is when they're having their hearing, their initial meeting. hearing. Oh, okay. All right. This is for our commission meeting. Okay, so 19th at 10 a.m.? 9 a.m. I can do 10 a.m. Don't push it. Then I'll have to. 10. Commissioner Armrich? Yeah, that works. All right, out of the abundance of caution, I'll let uh, Mr. Rawlings note that I'll have to switch days with him. Well, you but you not. don't know, Mom. But you might still have five hours. Yeah. City Attorney? Call him and tell him that you might give him about a two hour notice. I have a plan B. <laughs> a two hour notice? Okay. Tell him to Listen, bring his computer and sit in and watch. John Rawlings. Oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. It'll be all right. 
Well, this was a, a commission um, thing that we all agreed to do. So I, all right, so we're going to do it on Monday the 19th at 9.30. Can we compromise? 10 a.m. Monday. As a reminder, Mayor, this is not a hearing. Exactly. This is just you all deciding whether or not you right. want to accept a recommendation and then taking public comment. Shouldn't be any okay. more than an hour. No. Yeah. So, so double that. <laughs> yes, I think it's going to be two hours, two to three hours. Yeah. Especially just trying for certain people to learn the process. What that means, but Because this is a new process. We didn't do it this way before. It went right to civil civil court. I mean, you know, I mean, this is all new. 2010, I think they changed it, or 2009, when there was a a problem. It came, it went right to the court. Like there was a problem with the decision on zoning. I'm not sure the date of the act. I don't have that. Yeah. I know it. Um, it may be in the agenda. I, I, I don't believe it's used that frequently. It's the first time I've, I've seen it. It's the first time Ms. Roberts has seen it. Um, it, is, it has been available for at least quite, I, I did look at the age of the act. It's been quite a few years. It's not just right. brand new, but. But we've never used it. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. So let's get a motion for Monday the 19th at 10. I move to approve a special commission meeting on October 19th, 2020 at 10 a.m. to address mediation recommendation, if any, in response to petition for relief. Motion on the floor is stated by Vice Mayor. Do I hear a second? Second. And that motion was seconded by Commissioner Carrison. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? We worked it out. Commissioner Carrison? Nope. All righty. Let's go ahead and take the vote. I see it. And that passed five to zero. So we'll set that up for October 19th at 10. Thank, Thank you, you. Commissioner. Thank you. All righty. Now we have one more city attorney's evaluation. And uh, I guess city attorney or city manager, whoever wants to introduce. <laughs> I think it would be the city attorney. <laughs> That's it. Um, the items on the agenda pursuant to my employment contract for an annual review um, by the anniversary date, which was yesterday. So that's it. The, um, the evaluations and a summary are attached along with the self-eval and my employment contract. And I appreciate all of your input on your evaluations. It's been uh, another busy and positive year for our office. Vice Mayor, you have a question? Yeah, question kind of comment. Um, going over all of the evaluations, when you get down there to that last part where you figure the average, and then it tells you that there's a five, four, three, two, one and you mark whichever one it is. It doesn't tell you to approximate or round up or round down. It doesn't tell you that. So even though my score was a 4.71, it didn't say five. So I didn't know whether it's a five or a four. So, I mean, we may want to clarify that type of process for the future of where rounding or if rounding up and down does come into play. So for those final markings. But um, I am curious as to what the contract says for amount of increase for salary. Is it up to 5%? It does not, um, it, it does not reference an amount of increase, and it does not require an increase annually either. That's, that's subjective. City manager or maybe city um, attorney knows, what is your current rate of salary? Because I know your contract has an X amount, but it's increased over time. So could I get a, a confirmation of current salary, please? 
I don't know the annual <laughs> number. I know how much, I know how much it's got up on the. I am going to ask HR time. to uh, research that real quick. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I guess it's gone up for every year. Yeah. So I I don't know what the exact amount is as of right now. Because I also My question. ran out of time researching what e increase it's been for the past couple of years. So yeah, I'm looking at the pay stub and it doesn't have that no. you know actual annual number on it. Commissioner Carousel, while while HR looks at yeah, that. what did we budget for this year for the salary? Do we know that? Was there an increase built into that budget mm -hmm. for this year or not? And if so, what was that increase? Four percent or six percent? I'm going to ask finance to look that up. Well, we had the average of three percent plus um, one and a half, Which or three and a half plus the one, one and a half percent for COLA so, and three and a half percent for merit, unless there was specific direction. Uh, um, like, for example, I think there was a up to a ten percent the the Mr. Laird directive case guys credential manager status. Yeah, that was separate yeah, and set totally in. Separate. No, 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 I, no, I'm just, right, yeah. Because yeah. this would be a separate. I, just, I didn't know if that happened. Contractual thing, so you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and and over the the last... We don't get, charter officers don't get COLA. I Correct. That might have been calculated in, I don't know, but. That was where I was going to, I was going to ask that one. Uh, typically, over the last couple of years, we have given a 4% increase, Correct. They're looking. Six. Does anybody else have any questions? So how about we do uh, comments while, or public comment? Is there any public comment on city attorney's eval? <laughs> Vice Mayor? Okay. Um, so while we're, while we're graciously saving time here, um, I will speak and say that I think you continuously do a professional bang up job. Um, I am so impressed with how you react to situations, how you get things done in a timely manner, even with all the other constraints, especially with COVID these past six months. Um, I, I am just in awe with your professionalism, your staff, they are top notch. I, I don't think your staff ever has a bad day because you never hear it in their voice when they're answering the phone or talking. Um, I, I just have to give you huge props on your whole city attorney um, abilities. And thank you. Thank you for everything that you do for us and for the city. I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in. Thank you, Mayor. I want to say that I, I agree that I have an outstanding staff. Yeah. Um, that supports all of the work that's presented to you. Yeah, they do a great job. Anybody else want to weigh in? Love, love to. You see what happened last time I, I, I <laughs> the city clerk. Okay, except I'm, for you. Yeah, I'm not very good on that. Uh, so all right. Well, maybe you <laughs> learned your lesson and you can do it much better this time. No, I wrote everything in the, uh, <laughs> it's all in the right document, right. so that way I could delete and put back. And, gotcha. So Actually, I'm going to goofy for it. I'm going to recommend a compromise because we had been doing. Uh, four percent, and we had calculated in a five percent for the three and a half plus the one and a half. So I'll move to. Hold on, I, I we got to get the answer. I'd like kind of like yeah. to know what her salary is. The current salary, her current salary is one hundred fifty-six thousand seventy-eight dollars. I'm sorry. One five six zero seven eight. All right, and that's current. Current. And did you get an answer as to what was actually budgeted for Commissioner Carrison? I'm still working on that. Okay. So let's move on. If it, oh, City Manager, I see you've got your light on. Is that That, that was it. I'll okay. just tell you Thank what you. the current. Does anybody else want to speak to City Attorney and their about her evaluation while we're still waiting for that last round of numbers before doing a motion? Well, I'll tell her that I, I thank her very much all the time for everything that she does. Um, she is outstanding. The department is outstanding. And I think she does a fabulous job. But most importantly, when the vice mayor brought up on the rounding off, you're asking the attorney. She's going to always say round up, not round <laughs> down. I mean, that's, that's all I thought about. So, But that's it. Thank you so very much. 
It is a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Commissioner. Lopez. You know, I think an attorney is more going to be like, put the actual number in there. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as rounding. So yeah. <laughs> decimal points. Yeah, you need all decimal <laughs> points to reflect the correct uh, numbers. But uh, city attorney knows how I feel about her, uh, her staff, um, and leadership, and and um, the excellence of that department start from its foundation, and that's you, Amber. And so uh, you are truly the epitome of professionalism, as well as a true leader and a good person all together. And I know mm -hmm. that um, only great things are going to happen with you and your department from here on out. Thank you, Commissioner. That means a lot. The manager, we're, we're, we're. I don't have a rabbit to pull out of the hat. Okay. Um, Commissioner Carasone, do, do you, um, okay. I'm just are you gonna, okay with not having your answer to the yeah, question? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, They're going to have to figure it out. wanted to go ahead and make a motion. I think we're going to handle whatever you choose to do. Okay. Well, it's a compromise that I was thinking of a 4.5% uh, increase uh, because the way the employees were viewed and then what we have typically done with charter officers so I move to approve a 4.5% increase based on the performance evaluation for the city attorney. I think we've got an answer before I get a second. <laughs> She's trying to run. All right, good afternoon, Ferrell. Uh, the, the, the budget amount is 162758 What's the percentage of that? Is that given a... Uh, 162 what? 162,758 is what's budgeted. So you're right on the spot there. Yeah, I'm seconding. Motion on the floor, four and a half. Learn how to talk that. Um, motion is on the floor by Vice Mayor to have the city attorney salary increase by 4.5%. And that was seconded by Commissioner Carasone. <coughs> to that, Vice Mayor. I think she's worth every penny. Thank you. Commissioner Carasone. I think she's worth more, but we're in tight, tight budget right now. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that they would like to comment on? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and call the question. And that passed five to zero. City Attorney, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it continues to be my great honor to serve the city in this capacity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All righty, I, we are going to go ahead and do, um, we have a time certain at 4 p.m. Let's get the um, commission communications, anybody? Uh, Commissioner Hanks. A vice mayor. Commissioner Carousel. No. Commissioner Emmerich. And I do not have any either. I think this is a first. All four or five of us do not have commission communications. Uh, legal and administrative report, city manager, acting city manager. No, ma'am, I don't have anything. City attorney? No, ma'am. City clerk? No. Any public comment? No. None? Woo -hoo. City, um, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, do we have any public comment? We do not. All righty, everybody, we are in recess until 4 p.m. sharp. Thank you. We'll have to come down to you. Did you? Place we maintain all of the traffic signals. We have 19 traffic signals that we maintain in the city, as well as mowing all the right of ways, the vertical mowing to push back the. Uh,
pigeon vegetation out of the right-of-ways. In that division, we also have the waterway crew that handles all of our aquatic spraying. We have two crews that go out in airboats that spray those waterways to keep the vegetation down. We also have crews that operate all our water control structures. We have 23 gated water control structures that facilitate the movement of the stormwater through the city during storm events uh, and even just our typical rainy season. Then we have our drainage section. It maintains all of our roadside swales, our retention ditches, and all of our pipe installs, our catch basin installs, uh, anything that, that has to do with getting the water from the properties or the roadways into the secondary drainage, which is our retention ditches, and into our canals. Our mission is to ensure the safety and health of our citizens through the proper and efficient collection and disposal of all solid waste. We collect uh, over 30,000 residents here in the city. Garbage, garbage bulk, yard waste, uh, yard waste bulk, uh, recycling, also metal. This year we're probably going to do about 600 tons more of recyclable material over the last year. So that's pretty awesome. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, myself, I've been here 18 years. And when I first started here at the Solid Waste Division, there was only about 15 people. And right now, we have grown, as the city grows, so have we, uh, we're up to 39 people and employees. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We also collect from our commercial accounts. We collect dumpsters and roll-offs and from businesses and organizations, and it's starting to really pick up also. Uh, we have about three, over 350 accounts right now, and some of those accounts go maybe three, four, five times a week. Uh, we get 3,300 service requests a month for bulk of garbage and collection. We have some good, good people that work here, so really care about the community. Remember, if you have any questions at, at any time, you can always just give us a call at 941-240-8050. Give us a call, customer service. We'll gladly help you with any questions. Many times, Crisis can't be avoided. A family's car will accidentally break down while their electric bill is due. A health emergency will arise just as it's time to pay the rent. It's a reality that so many people face. What makes the City of Northport unique is that it offers a way to help. The City of Northport Social Services Division connects the public with valuable resources to improve their overall quality of life, especially in unexpected times of hardship. As part of the city manager's office, the Social Services Division's mission is to ensure the availability, awareness, and accessibility of programs and resources in the community, and to assist families and individuals while improving their overall quality of life. With five staff members, including a manager, two full-time caseworkers, a staff assistant one, and a staff assistant two, the Social Services Division assists Northport households experiencing a short-term, unavoidable crisis with financial assistance. Staff can assist with rent or mortgage, utilities, and more. In addition, staff will connect families and individuals with available community resources. The Social Services Division also oversees the City of Northport's Family Service Center and the Community Education Center located on Pan American Boulevard. Both the Family Service Center and the Community Education Center house a variety of nonprofit and government agencies that provide aid to residents. Located on a campus that includes the Sarasota County Health Department and Children's First, this one-stop location offers a variety of resources that residents would otherwise have to travel outside the city to access. The offices of the Social Services Division are busy. Every Monday morning, Northport residents visit the Social Services Division for what is known as pre-screen Mondays. Clients can meet with a caseworker who gathers basic information about their current situation. From there, referrals and appointments are made to further assist the Northport household. In addition to assisting with rent, mortgage, or utilities, the Social Services Division also is an intake location for families and individuals experiencing homelessness. The division is a one-by-one -one coordinated intake access point. This is a system that has been created to identify eligible resources and connect clients with the appropriate assistance regarding their situation. 
Outside of their daily operations, the Social Services Division hosts events in the community designed to further connect the public with area resources. Every April, the division works with the Healthy Start of Sarasota County to host a community baby shower and preschool expo. This event features businesses and community agencies that offer information and services for parents of both toddlers and newborns. The division also hosts a back-to-school resource fair every August to provide school-aged children supplemental school supplies and backpacks. The fair features exhibitors that provide services for parents with school-aged children. During the holidays, Social Services hosts an annual Home for the Holidays program. This program has two parts, a senior giving tree and adopt and shop. In both cases, seniors and parents register with social services and are adopted by individuals, businesses, and organizations who help provide a holiday experience. Many city departments will adopt families or seniors through this program. Ask your supervisor how you can get involved. There are many other ways that you can help through the social services division. City employees are invited to volunteer time or donate resources. Donations can come in the form of gift cards to gas stations or grocery stores. Monetary donations are also accepted. The Social Services Division and Northport Utilities work together to offer an H2O program in which monetary donations are used to assist Northport households to pay their Northport Utilities bills. Social Services also works with Parks and Recreation to facilitate a youth scholarship program so that our local youth can participate in programs offered by the Parks and Recreation Department. The Social Services Division makes a difference in the lives of Northport residents every day through the services that they provide. If you or someone you know are in a short-term crisis and need assistance, contact the Social Services Division. They are here to help. The Utilities Department is in charge of all water and wastewater services for the City of Northport. We currently serve 17,000 sewer customers and 22,000 water customers throughout the city. The utilities is comprised of five different divisions. We have our Administration Division, Engineering, Field Operations, our Water Treatment Plant, and our Wastewater Plant. Our administration division has two locations. One is the admin office and field office over on West Price Boulevard next to the high school. Or the other office is our cashiering and customer care office and that is located on the first floor of City Hall. Our engineering division, they oversee all of the utilities projects, uh, new development going in, infrastructure inspections, everything that the city has in the ground has to be located for new construction. Also in the field office on Price Boulevard is our field operations division. They are in charge of maintaining everything out in the distribution and the collection system. They're the ones that do all the new service installations. Anytime there is a break or a repair, they're the ones that respond to that. And we have field operations staff um, available and on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our meter readers are part of our field operations division and those meter readers read every single one of our 22,000 water meters every single month. Our wastewater treatment plant is located on Pan American Boulevard and that plant basically treats all wastewater sewer water throughout the city. And what we do there is we take all that incoming sewage and we treat it to uh, produce reclaimed water. The reclaimed water is pumped out to several parks, city facilities, commercial customers, uh, golf courses and used for irrigation so that way potable water is not used for those purposes. Our Mayakachi Creek water treatment plant is located on Northport Boulevard next to the skate park and that facility is a conventional B class surface water plant that also has a reverse osmosis treatment plant on the same site. Utilities is largely on the front lines when, when anything's happening within the city if it's an emergency situation, it's generally utilities that are right in the thick of things, right behind fire. We provide a lot of support to fire. 
And in instances like Hurricane Irma, as soon as the roads were clear, utilities was right in the thick of things, making sure that we had sanitary sewer and water to be provided to our citizens in their time of need. My name is Dominic Caravella. I'm actually the chief mechanic for the city of Northport for uh, fleet. Well, we do every vehicle that the city owns. We do the entire city. So that includes your PD, fire, um, sanitation, public works, your building department, landscaping, because we do, you know, lawnmowers as small as that all the way on up. Anything the city owns that has a motor on it, we do it here. I oversee the work out here in the shop. I just make sure it's flowing. If somebody has a, a problem, or if they're running into something they're not familiar with, uh, then the two of us would get together and try and figure it out and do the best we can and, and get it up and going. I started out when I was young, went to a trade school, graduated from there, and started off um, doing oil changes and things. Well, I was always interested in transmissions and I became a transmission mechanic for many years. I came down here, I used to vacation down here. My mother-in-law lived here, my in-laws. And uh, when we used to come down and vacation for two weeks, I sort of liked the area. I've got three kids. My daughter is a high school teacher at the high school here in Northport. My son's a, an officer for, for Northport. My wife works for Northport, and I work for Northport. <laughs> and my youngest daughter is uh, in nursing program. She's doing nursing. I got two pieces of fire equipment in here. Now, if we don't repair them or this or that, the fire department's without that equipment, so they can't service the general public. We have to get that thing running, get it fixed best we can, get it back to them, and then they put it in service for the public. It's incredibly important. I mean, all right, we'll take, for instance, that rescue, all right? We're gonna fix that rescue, we're gonna do what we can, right? You call, that rescue comes to your house, boom, somebody's having a heart attack. They throw them in that rescue, they take it. It better make it from point A to point B. So I have to make sure that everything is running as best as it possibly can. That's, that's the matter of life and death. Same thing with a, you know, an officer of the law. If that guy is running, he has to be able to hop in that car. He relies on that thing to start, drive, and perform like he wants it to. My job to keep it working that way so he can do his job. I can't spek for everybody in here. For me, it's a reward of knowing that that vehicle is repaired, it's back out there in the field, it's doing its job, that man's doing his job, so I feel like I did my job. It's just a gratification of doing the repair. I love my job. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, we have a hydraulic leak, so I gotta change a hydraulic line from the um, tank all the way up to the main control. So we gotta take it off, I gotta get a hand. Steve, can you grab one of them pans from over there, please? One of them drain pans? Thank you. We'll be making a hydraulic hose uh, on our hydraulic machine. Let me get the operator to get his lunch bucket out of there. I need you to get your lunch bucket. I gotta lift the cab. I gotta get in the back, if you can. We got his, one of his main feed hydraulic hoses. What happened to it? Uh, it blew out. It actually had a hole in it and it was leaking. We're gonna make one right now. I'll show you how we do that. It, where it goes through the clamps, a lot of times it'll rub and it rubbed through. So we get, we get a uh, leak from it. So we're just gonna replace the whole thing and we make them here. Uh, we have all the dyes. So I just got to get the fittings from the parts department and we're just going to make it. So we generate work orders and then they issue all the parts for the vehicle to be repaired and it basically goes on this work order. Um, I'm going to need some hydraulic fittings. Some, um, I'm making a hydraulic hose. Okay, what do you need? 
Uh, two. Um, I'm get those first, and then we'll, you want me to look first? Yeah, let's see if that is the size. I, I believe it's 16 by 16, but I could be wrong. A part of this job is um, taking care of, you know, roadside assistance, whether it be a hydraulic line, flat tire, dead battery, uh, anything along those lines. Or sometimes the vehicles, the guys will get in them at the end to come in, and they don't want to start. So the heavy equipment operator now is calling, hey, my vehicle don't start. So we have to send a guy out, either throw a battery in or check out why it's not, you know, why it won't run. It's not only a physical thing, it's a thinking thing. You know, you got to be able to think these things through. Especially if you're on a call out and you're out in the field. Now there's, you know, I mean, yeah, they can touch base. You can call in and, and get assistance. But a lot of times you got to be able to, you know, you got to think on your feet, as they would say. That's the first step. Here comes my parts guy with my fittings. Thank you, Mike. You put the fitting on the end. 3.1. It could take some time. It depends on, um, you know, like right here we're dealing with one inch line, but if you were to deal with bigger size line, uh, it could take some time. Usually it takes about 20 minutes, a half hour you know, give or take. That's that's removing the part, making the line, and possibly putting it back on. And that's what it looks like. That's finished product. That's finished product. A lot of times I like to add sleeve. What this is, if that line should ever blow out and get a hy uh, hydraulic leak, this restricts it. So instead of spraying, it's just going to ooze out of this, this outer liner. So it's, it's a protective casing for the operator and whoever is nearby when it actually springs a leak. I said if you're not a good climber, it's hard to get in some of these spots. We're testing the hose that I made, the hydraulic hose, making sure it isn't leaking and uh, all the functions on the truck work properly. When you get a chance and you build up air pressure, could you move it ahead some? When you run the can, because over there we got a... Okay, you're clear. Have a good day. That's how you do a hydraulic line. Our mission statement is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, and professional manner. All of our line personnel are highly trained, state of Florida certified firefighter, EMTs, and paramedics. We cover approximately 105 square miles of the city of Northport and 20 miles of interstate. Camaraderie is important because you start working as a group, you do it in training, and it all seems to come together when you get out on the fire ground and you really need your partners. Everybody knows never to leave your partner and they don't, it's been, they've been trained in it. We have five fire stations located throughout the city in various locations and uh, we are planning number six in West Village's area. We also have all of our fire stations are considered safe places and safe havens. Safe places are for youth who are at risk and are in need of help and they can come walk into any fire station and get the help that they're looking for. Safe havens for newborns is a different program, different age group where infants can be brought to a fire station without question. All of our fire stations now are hardened facilities so that we can stay in them during storms and everyone stays safe. So police departments is in there, utilities, public works, whoever we need to go out immediately after the storm then they're there with us to go. A lot of questions that people ask are why we send an ambulance and a fire truck to an EMS call and a lot of that is for manpower. There's a lot of things to do when somebody is having a cardiac incident 
So we send the fire truck with them for the extra manpower and lifting assistance and extra help. The whole goal for fire rescue is everybody goes home safe. Frank Lamas, our waste manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with Let's Recycle Right Northport. Got a few items for you today. Last week, we did notice in the tan lid container, shredded paper put in a plastic bag. Please, shredded paper does not belong in a plastic bag, okay? It belongs right here in a paper bag, please. And it belongs in a tan lid container. This right here, being in plastic, will be considered contamination and garbage. Let's talk about a candle, a glass candle. Yes, it is made of glass, but it is not recyclable right here in Northport. That's right, only glass jars and glass bottles are recyclable in the blue lid container. Let's also talk about the milk jug, water jug, number two, definitely recyclable, right? Here's the cap. If the cap is not attached, it will be garbage. So if you crush it down, put the cap on real nice and tight. This will make it through the process. This will be a number two. Okay, so let's talk about the plastic ring. That's right, the plastic ring. This is a 12 holder. They have six, six holders out there. Please, this is not a recyclable material and needs to be placed inside your trash. So listen, put your comments below. We'll see you in a future video. makes me feel important that I'm doing something for the community. I like helping people and I love the work. We got 2.8 inches of rain last night. How I approach it is I got to release some of that water out that we got and get prepared for the next day because you know it's going to rain again. It's like I've been draining these for the last two weeks between 16 and 20 inches every day below the wall. And that one little rain, look what it did. For being here so long, you get experience, you get the feel of the water, how the water flows and all that. So if you've done it long enough, you get the feel. I could do this in my sleep because I'm so used to doing it. Yeah, I've been working for the city for 20 years. I'm from North Hills, Pennsylvania. I came down here to help my dad out when I graduated from high school. I started looking for like a future place I can work, retirement, and something's gonna be for, helpful for me in the long run and help people out. So I put an application for the city and they hired me, which was good, best thing that could ever happen. City's got 30 water control structures, five gated structures. I'm opening uh, at least minimum 15 today. I got three kids, three, two boys and a daughter. And my oldest son gave me my first grandkid. He's, he'll be three. So I spent a lot of time with them because family's first. Oh, I'm a real sports fanatic, big hockey fan. Yeah, I was hoping my Penguins would win it this year, but I can't complain. They won the last two years. <laughs> you can't win it all the time. Yesterday was 16 inches below. It's 10 inches above today. See, what I'm doing here now is when I open this one up, see how high it is? 
I'm draining it down. By the end of the day, this should be like 16 inches below the wall. And there's a hard ditch, ditch here, and there's like outfalls that come in. But once you get to a certain level, you'll see the water coming into the canals. Again, when I get done, I gotta log it on the computer. What I do is I write the time I was here, when I inspected it, what I did, the water level, and the height. This was like 20.4 this morning, and it's almost up to 21. Plus, the water that I'm bringing down raised it a little bit, but you see how it's pushing the water over fast? Each one controls a gate. If you put it on auto, it works on the computer. And then manual, this is for gate two. If I wanted to close it, I hit the blue button, I hold it in until the gates can completely close. If I want to open it, I do vice versa, the other opposite. And there's one for each one. Oh, I love my job. I get to work with good people. And we can in, enjoy what we're doing when we're at work. That's how I was brought up by my dad. He was real caring about his work and so was I. So like I take I take it do I do take it home. I look at the weather and everything, so I look at the bridge reading and all that. And that should be it. I'll just come back and clean them off. Building Division is responsible for making sure that all the codes that the state has adopted in construction is adhered to. And basically what we do is we look at, we go and do our plan reviews when the customer brings a set of plans in that they want to construct a commercial project or a residential project. We'll review the plans to make sure that they comply with all amenable codes that the state has adopted. After we issue the permit, then we'll go out and do all the inspections and make sure that they are constructed according to the plans. We're responsible for the uh, safe construction of all these buildings and we look at all aspects of the construction from footings, foundations, uh, block walls, to roof construction, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and both commercial and residential. So when we have a commercial project that comes in, we're looking at all aspects of that to make sure that it is a safe environment to, and it has to be designed to withstand the 160 mile an hour wind criteria that the state has mandated that we look at. Our job is life safety, is to making sure that the building is constructed in a safe manner that it will stand the hurricane's design wind loads that we have down here. And uh, that's what our job is, is to make sure people are safe in their building, that they can walk into their building knowing that Northport has done the best possible job we can to make sure that their, con their building is constructed in a manner that they feel safe in, they can go home in. The Planning and Zoning Division is responsible for all development management of the City of Northport, large-scale commercial developments, residential developments. The City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division is divided into two separate uh, sections. One is the Strategic Planning Group and the other is the Tactical Planning Group. The Strategic Planning Group is responsible for development management through the preparing and updating of our comprehensive plan, its amendments, all the annexations, and reviewing development of regional impacts and zoning applications. The Strategic Planning Group is also responsible for updating our demographics, population projections, and land use data through GIS, and also maintain our land use and zoning maps. The tactical side of the office is responsible for maintaining the Unified Land Development Code, ensuring all development proposals that are submitted to the city are consistent and in compliance with ULDC, all of our master plans, our pattern books, zoning requirements, and the city's comprehensive plan. Tactical Operations also helps coordinate all development proposals through the city departments, the division, and external agencies through our staff development review process managing development's appearance, their architecture, traffic impacts, fiscal impacts, compliance to signage, landscape, and other development management requirements. 
We work closely with utilities, building, and public works. We also manage the environmental compliance issues on site development. The Property Standards Division is what's otherwise known as code enforcement in other municipalities. We are located on the first floor of City Hall. Our job is to assure the health, safety, and welfare of our residents and assist in maintaining the community standards. We enforce the Unified Land Development Code, the Northport City Code, and the Florida Building Code. The Northport City Code would be like grass and weeds. That's one of our major violations, especially in the summer. Uh, Unified Land Development Code would be like the number of vehicles on a property. Uh, Florida Building Code would be someone building something like a shed or something like that on the property without a permit. The purpose of code enforcement is to make sure that everything's safe in the communities, to make sure that everything's being built properly with the proper permits, to make sure that basically everything looks nice. If someone has an issue with a neighbor or a house that they drive by, they do have the option to contact property standards through phone, fax, or our North Report. What's it like? Undescribable. Um, the only word I was using is Armageddon, um, sheer loss, destruction, um, not just wood frame homes. These are concrete structures that are destroyed. Just the compassion that I am thankful that as a crew in, in Northport, we could give them. I mean, if we weren't putting out fires or if we weren't um, finding people to save, it was simply giving them a hug. Um, helping them get some of the furniture out of their house, assisting them with a ladder to the second story because maybe the stairs were wiped out, uh, climbing up in there and, and getting that little piece of home that they wanted back so badly and able to give it to them, and then just listen to their story and, and, their, and, and hear their, about their loss. Personal safety for my family, I will not ride out a storm again. I will not take that chance. Um, if I see it coming up the Gulf towards our city, uh, my family's going to get out. Getting home is unbelievable. So thankful to be home, that my family is safe, to be back here, where this, this simple creature comforts are back at home to have those things back and normal meals. Unbelievable what we saw there, the loss that we saw there and the destruction there. Frank Lamas, always manager for the city of Northport. Uh, we're here today to talk about three recycling tips. The first one is plastic bags. Now, plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So let's talk about some of the plastic bags. Grocery bags, okay, they're very important. We see them inside the blue lid container quite often. They need to be returned back to the grocery stores. And that would be your Publix, your Walmarts, your Targets. Please return them back there. Do not place recyclable uh, items inside these bags, tie them, and place them in the blue lid tote. If it goes down to the processor, it is called contaminant. It's contaminated and they will not accept it. So please, keep the grocery bags outside. Now remember, it's not just grocery bags, okay? We're talking about bread bags, lunch bags, 
uh, big plastic garbage bags that fill the recyclables. And we have one right here to show you. And I'll go ahead and show you. This is what we find out there. This right here is contaminated. All this clean recyclable is contaminated because it's inside a plastic bag. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So thank you very much for watching this video. Please, if you have any questions about recycling materials or how to recycle, place it in the comment below and we will try to get to you in a future video. Frank Lamas, always manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with you for Let's Recycle Right Northport. So, a couple of things. We have an aluminum can and a straw. Now the aluminum can right here, 500 million are consumed each day. This is the most valuable recycling item you can see out there in the world today. Let's talk about the plastic straw, okay? The plastic straw, 500 million are used each day. This is not a recyclable item right here in Northport. That's right, even though it's plastic, don't let it fool you. Just because it's plastic, it is not a recyclable material right here inside our program. Now the aluminum can, yes, that is a recyclable item right here in Northport. And Lana, thank you very much for your comment and question. And the question was about plastic bags, uh, water bags, salt bags. These are not a recyclable item right here in Northport. These belong in your trash, please. They belong in the trash, they do not belong in the blue lid container. Bleach bottles, that's right, bleach bottles are a recyclable material right here in Northport, a number two. They belong in the blue lid container. The only thing you'll have to do is make sure they're empty, clean, and dry. If you have any more of the questions or comments, please place them below and we'll get to you in the next video. Thank you very much. What makes this place so special is, is the people. Um, the, the community who you serve and the people who you work with. Our mission statement is to provide the community with the elite law enforcement services out there with the highest priority being the protection of life and property. We work 24 seven, holidays, you know, there's no time off. Uh, our agency is rapidly growing. We have a, um, a detective bureau, we have a traffic unit, uh, we have a full crime scene unit. Northport PD is an accredited agency. Actually, we're double Excelsior accredited, which is we are one of 14, I believe, other agencies in the state of Florida that have reached that double Excelsior credit. It's a very prestigious uh, accomplishment to have. Most of the people only see uh, the police officers in uniforms out there doing the day-to-day -day tasks, but they can't do that alone. In the background, what people don't see a lot is the support staff here at Northport Police Department. We go from very high density areas to very rural areas uh, throughout the city. The challenge that Northport Police Department is facing right now is the rapid growth in the city of Northport um, and trying to keep up with those levels of service. Law enforcement officers wear many different hats, um, but at the end of the day, it's their, their problem solvers. Um, they're there for you 24-7, uh, and the, their, their importance of all of our officers that we stress to is to go home safe at night.
The Administration Division of Public Works does a variety of different tasks. Uh, the main one is our Customer Service Division. They answer several hundred phone calls a day, ranging from solid waste questions to uh, water drainage questions on a day like today. Also, we have a uh, Budget Finance Administration Division that handles accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable, and budget. The Northport Public Works Department also has a technical section that handles GIS, mapping, and um, also our work order system. The engineering division, we analyze any drainage issues that the city might have, water control structures. We're also in charge of all the roadways. The roadways include design for multi-use trails, sidewalks, the city has been experiencing tremendous growth. The biggest project that we have right now is called the Price Boulevard Whitening. That road is a two-lane road. Capacity for that two-lane road is about 17,000 vehicles per day. Uh, our latest numbers for that show that currently there are 21,700 vehicles traveling every day, meaning it's way over capacity. Engineering also is in charge of uh, revising new development. When uh, a new gas station comes, uh, a new hotel or building, they submit plans to us. So it's our responsibility to check that they comply with water treatment. The drainage that they got to design the pond and the piping and everything is per code and standards. I have one professional engineer that takes care of all the uh, roadway design. Then I have a stormwater manager and then we have a group of inspectors they inspect uh, when there's a new house being built they got to inspect the, the driveway the culvert pipe and making sure that it's set up at the right elevation to provide positive flow they also inspect the roadways on the, through the road bond they inspect uh, to see that the correct thickness of pavement is being applied also the water control structure when it gets into construction we have our own inspector that go and make sure that the project is being built per the plans and specifications Fleet Division, we have uh, over 600 vehicles and equipment that we maintain. I've got seven mechanics, shop supervisor, two staff assistants, and a fleet asset technician that um, we do everything from cradle to grave for all of our vehicles and uh, equipment. So we order the equipment, maintain the equipment, and ultimately dispose of the equipment. We do everything from weed eaters to all the way to airboats to solid waste vehicles, grapple trucks, uh, solid waste trucks, fire, fire engines, ambulances, police cars. The entire fleet of the city. Well, we're able to maintain all of our own vehicles. That's the biggest thing. So all of our mechanics have a relationship, if you will, with these vehicles. They know the, in, the nuances of all the vehicles. Uh, it makes it easy for our departments to come and see us. We, we, you know, we're an on-site facility for them, so they don't they don't necessarily have to schedule safety-related issues. They can come directly to us. Um, the city fleet maintenance also carries 44,000 gallons of fuel that we maintain our vehicles with as well. Got over 200 years of mechanics experience among them so we've got gentlemen have been here for over 30 years and we've got guys who have been here for just over a year. Public Works Operations Department currently has 71 employees. Of that 71 employees were divided into two sections which is roadway and drainage. Our roadway section takes care of the over 800 miles of roadway. Of striping, pothole repairs, all of that is handled by the road section. In the roadway section, we, we maintain all of the street signs, uh, install, replace. We maintain all of the traffic signals. We have 19 traffic signals that we maintain in the city, as well as mowing all the right-of-ways, the vertical mowing to push back the uh, impinging vegetation out of the right-of-ways. In that division, we also have the waterway crew that handles all of our aquatic spraying. We have two crews that go out in airboats that spray those waterways to keep the vegetation down. We also have crews that operate all our water control structures. We have 23 gated water control structures that facilitate the movement of the stormwater through the city during storm events uh, and even just our typical rainy season. Then we have our drainage section. It maintains all of our roadside swales our retention ditches, and all of our pipe installs, our catch basin installs, 
Uh, anything that, that has to do with getting the water from the properties or the roadways into the secondary drainage, which is our retention ditches, and into our canals. Our mission is to ensure the safety and health of our citizens through the proper and efficient collection and disposal of all solid waste. We collect uh, over 30,000 residents here in the city. Garbage, garbage bulk, yard waste, uh, yard waste bulk, uh, recycling, also metal. This year we're probably going to do about 600 tons more of recyclable material over the last year. So that's pretty awesome. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, myself, I've been here 18 years. And when I first started here at the Solid Waste Division, there was only about 15 people. And right now, we have grown, as the city grows, so have we, uh, we're up to 39 people and employees. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We also collect from our commercial accounts, we collect dumpsters and roll-offs, and from businesses and organizations, and it's starting to really pick up also. Uh, we have about three, over 350 accounts right now, and some of those accounts go maybe three, four, five times a week. Uh, we get 3,300 service requests a month for bulk of garbage and collection. We have some good, good people that work here, so really care about the community. Remember, if you have any questions at, at any time, you can always just give us a call at 941-240-8050. Give us a call, customer service. They'll gladly help you with any questions. Many times, Crisis can't be avoided. A family's car will accidentally break down while their electric bill is due. A health emergency will arise just as it's time to pay the rent. It's a reality that so many people face. What makes the City of Northport unique is that it offers a way to help. The City of Northport Social Services Division connects the public with valuable resources to improve their overall quality of life, especially in unexpected times of hardship. As part of the city manager's office, the Social Services Division's mission is to ensure the availability, awareness, and accessibility of programs and resources in the community, and to assist families and individuals while improving their overall quality of life. With five staff members, including a manager, two full-time caseworkers, a staff assistant one, and a staff assistant two, the Social Services Division assists Northport households experiencing a short-term, unavoidable crisis with financial assistance. Staff can assist with rent or mortgage, utilities, and more. In addition, staff will connect families and individuals with available community resources. The Social Services Division also oversees the City of Northport's Family Service Center and the Community Education Center located on Pan American Boulevard. Both the Family Service Center and the Community Education Center house a variety of nonprofit and government agencies that provide aid to residents. Located on a campus that includes the Sarasota County Health Department and Children's First, this one-stop location offers a variety of resources that residents would otherwise have to travel outside the city to access. The offices of the Social Services Division are busy. Every Monday morning, Northport residents visit the Social Services Division for what is known as pre-screen Mondays. Clients can meet with a caseworker who gathers basic information about their current situation. From there, referrals and appointments are made to further assist the Northport household. In addition to assisting with rent, mortgage, or utilities, the Social Services Division also is an intake location for families and individuals experiencing homelessness. The division is a one-by-one -one coordinated intake access point. This is a system that has been created to identify eligible resources and connect clients with the appropriate assistance regarding their situation. Outside of their daily operations, the Social Services Division hosts events in the community designed to further connect the public with area resources. Every April, the division works with the Healthy Start of Sarasota County to host a community baby shower and preschool expo. This event features businesses and community agencies that offer information and services for parents of both toddlers and newborns. The division also hosts a back to school resource fair every August to provide school aged children supplemental school supplies and backpacks. The fair features exhibitors that provide services for parents with school-aged children. 
During the holidays, Social Services hosts an annual Home for the Holidays program. This program has two parts, a senior giving tree and adopt and shop. In both cases, seniors and parents register with Social Services and are adopted by individuals, businesses, and organizations who help provide a holiday experience. Many city departments will adopt families or seniors through this program. Ask your supervisor how you can get involved. There are many other ways that you can help through the Social Services Division. City employees are invited to volunteer time or donate resources. Donations can come in the form of gift cards to gas stations or grocery stores. Monetary donations are also accepted. The Social Services Division and Northport Utilities work together to offer an H2O program in which monetary donations are used to assist Northport households to pay their Northport Utilities bills. Social Services also works with Parks and Recreation to facilitate a youth scholarship program so that our local youth can participate in programs offered by the Parks and Recreation Department. The Social Services Division makes a difference in the lives of Northport residents every day through the services that they provide. If you or someone you know are in a short-term crisis and need assistance, contact the Social Services Division. They are here to help. The Utilities Department is in charge of all water and wastewater services for the City of Northport. We currently serve 17,000 sewer customers and 22,000 water customers throughout the city. Utilities is comprised of five different divisions. We have our administration division, engineering, field operations, our water treatment plant, and our wastewater plant. Our administration division has two locations. One is the admin office and field office over on West Price Boulevard next to the high school. Or the other office is our cashiering and customer care office, and that is located on the first floor of City Hall. Our engineering division, they oversee all of the utilities projects, uh, new development going in, infrastructure inspections, everything that the city has in the ground has to be located for new construction. Also in the field office on Price Boulevard is our field operations division. They are in charge of maintaining everything out in the distribution and the collection system. They're the ones that do all the new service installations. Anytime there is a break or a repair, they're the ones that respond to that. And we have field operations staff um, available and on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our meter readers are part of our field operations division and those meter readers read every single one of our 22,000 water meters every single month. Our wastewater treatment plant is located on Pan American Boulevard and that plant basically treats all wastewater sewer water throughout the city. And what we do there is we take all that incoming sewage and we treat it to uh, produce reclaimed water. The reclaimed water is pumped out to several parks, city facilities, commercial customers, uh, golf courses, and used for irrigation. So that way potable water is not used for those purposes. Our Mayakachi Creek Water Treatment Plant is located on Northport Boulevard next to the skate park. And that facility is a conventional B-class surface water plant that also has a reverse osmosis treatment plant on the same site. Utilities is largely on the front lines when, when anything's happening within the city. If it's an emergency situation, it's generally utilities that are right in the thick of things, right behind fire. We provide a lot of support to fire. And in instances like Hurricane Irma, as soon as the roads were clear, utilities was right in the thick of things, making sure that we had sanitary sewer and water to be provided to our citizens in their time of need. My name is Dominic Caravella. I'm actually the chief mechanic for the city of Northport for uh, fleet. Well, we do every vehicle that the city owns. We do the entire city. So that includes your PD, fire, um, sanitation, public works, your building department, landscaping, because we do, you know, lawnmowers as small as that all the way on up. Anything the city owns that has a motor on it, we do it here. 
I oversee the work out here in the shop. I just make sure it's flowing. If somebody has a, a problem or if they're running into something they're not familiar with, uh, then the two of us would get together and try and figure it out and do the best we can and, and get it up and going. I started out when I was young, went to a trade school, graduated from there and started off um, doing oil changes and things. Well, I was always interested in transmissions and I became a transmission mechanic for many years. I came down here, I used to vacation down here. My mother-in-law lived here, my in-laws. And uh, when we used to come down and vacation for two weeks, I sort of liked the area. I've got three kids. My daughter is a high school teacher at the high school here in Northport. My son's a, an officer for, for Northport. My wife works for Northport and I work for Northport. <laughs> And my youngest daughter is uh, in nursing program. She's doing nursing. I got two pieces of fire equipment in here. Now, if we don't repair them or this or that, the fire department's without that equipment, so they can't service the general public. We have to get that thing running, get it fixed best we can, get it back to them, and then they put it in service for the public. It's incredibly important. I mean, all right, we'll take, for instance, that rescue, all right? We're going to fix that rescue. We're going to do what we can, right? You call, that rescue comes to your house, boom, somebody's having a heart attack. They throw them in that rescue, they take it. It better make it from point A to point B. So I have to make sure that everything is running as best as it possibly can. That's, that's the matter of life and death. Same thing with a, you know, an officer of the law. If that guy is running, he has to be able to hop in that car. He relies on that thing to start, drive, and perform like he wants it to my job to keep it working that way so he can do his job. I can't speak for everybody in here. Yeah. For me it's the reward of knowing that that vehicle is repaired, it's back out there in the field, it's doing its job, that man's doing his job, so I feel like I did my job. It's just the gratification of doing the repair. I love my job. I mean I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, we have a hydraulic leak, so I gotta change a hydraulic line from the um, tank all the way up to the main control so we got to take it off I got to get a fan Steve can you grab one of them pans from over there please one of them drain pans thank you we'll be making a hydraulic hose uh, on our hydraulic machine let me get the operator to get his launch bucket out of there I need you to get your lunch bucket. I gotta lift the cab. I gotta get in the back, if you can. We got his, one of his main feed hydraulic hoses. What happened to it? Uh, it blew out. It actually had a hole in it and it was leaking. We're gonna make one right now. I'll show you how we do that. It, where it goes through the clamps, a lot of times it'll rub, and it rubbed through, so we get we get uh, leak from it. So we're just going to replace the whole thing, and we make them here. Uh, we have all the dies, so I just got to get the fittings from the parts department, and we're just going to make it. So we generate work orders, and then they issue all the parts for the vehicle to be repaired and it basically goes on this work order. Um, I'm going to need some hydraulic fittings. Some, um, I'm making a hydraulic hose. Okay, how many do you need? Uh, two. You um, want to get those first and then we'll, or you want me to look first? Yeah, let's see if that is the size. I, I believe it's 16 by 16, but I could be wrong. A part of this job is um, taking care of you know roadside assistance whether it be a hydraulic line flat tire dead battery uh, anything along those lines or sometimes the vehicles the guys will get in them at the end to come in and they don't want to start so the heavy equipment operator now is calling hey my vehicle don't start so we have to send a guy out either throw a battery in or check out why it's not you know why it won't run it's not only a physical thing it's a thinking thing you know you got to be able to think these things through Especially if you're on a call out and you're out in the field, now there's, you know, I mean, yeah, they can touch base, you can call in and, and get assistance, 
but a lot of times you got to be able to, you know, you got to think on your feet, as they would say. That's the first step. Here comes my parts guy with my fittings. Thank you, Mike. You put the fitting on the end, 3.1. It could take some time. It depends on, um, you know, like right here we're dealing with one inch line, but if you were to deal with bigger size line, uh, it could take some time. Usually it takes about 20 minutes, a half hour, you know, give or take. That's, that's removing the part, making the line, and possibly putting it back on. And that's what it looks like. That's finished product. A lot of times I like to add sleeve. What this is, if that line should ever blow out and get a hy uh, hydraulic leak, this restricts it. So instead of spraying, it's just going to ooze out of this, this outer liner. Okay. So it's, it's a protective casing for the operator and whoever is nearby when it actually springs a leak. I said, if you're not a good climber, it's hard to get in some of these spots. We're testing the hose that I made, the hydraulic hose, making sure it isn't leaking, and uh, all the functions on the truck work properly. When you get a chance and you build up air pressure, could you move it ahead some? When you run the can, because over there we got a... Okay, you're clear. Have a good day. That's how you do a hydraulic line. Our mission statement is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, and professional manner. All of our line personnel are highly trained, State of Florida certified firefighter, EMTs, and paramedics. We cover approximately 105 square miles of the city of Northport and 20 miles of interstate. Camaraderie is important because you start working as a group, you do it in training, and it all seems to come together when you get out on the fire ground and you really need your partners. Everybody knows never to leave your partner and they don't, it's been, they've been trained in it. We have five fire stations located throughout the city in various locations and uh, we are planning number six in West Village's area. We also have all of our fire stations are considered safe places and safe havens. Safe places are for youth who are at risk and are in need of help and they can come walk into any fire station and get the help that they're looking for. Safe havens for newborns is a different program, different age group where infants can be brought to a fire station without question. All of our fire stations now are hardened facilities so that we can stay in them during storms and everyone stays safe. So police departments is in there, utilities, public works, whoever we need to go out immediately after the storm then they're there with us to go. A lot of questions that people ask are why we send an ambulance and a fire truck to an EMS call and a lot of that is for manpower. There's a lot of things to do when somebody is having a cardiac incident. So we send the fire truck with them for the extra manpower and lifting assistance and extra help. The whole goal for fire rescue is everybody goes home safe. Frank Lamas, Solid Waste Manager for the City of Northport, back here again today with Let's Recycle Right Northport. Got a few items for you today. Last week, we did notice in the tan lid container, shredded paper put in a plastic bag. Please, shredded paper does not belong in a plastic bag, okay? It belongs right here in a paper bag, please, and it belongs in a tan lid container. This right here, being in plastic, will be considered contamination and garbage. Let's talk about a candle, a glass candle. Yes, it is made of glass, 
but it is not recyclable right here in Northport. That's right, only glass jars and glass bottles are recyclable in the blue lid container. Let's also talk about the milk jug. Water jug, number two, definitely recyclable, right? Here's the cap. If the cap is not attached, it will be garbage. So if you crush it down, put the cap on real nice and tight, this will make it through the process. This will be a number two. Okay, so let's talk about the plastic ring. That's right, the plastic ring. This is a 12 holder. They have six, six holders out there. Please, this is not a recyclable material and needs to be placed inside your trash. So listen, put your comments below. We'll see you in a future video. makes me feel important that I'm doing something for the community. I like helping people and I love the work. We got 2.8 inches of rain last night. How I approach it is I got to release some of that water out that we got and get prepared for the next day because you know it's going to rain again. It's like I've been draining these for the last two weeks between 16 and 20 inches every day below the wall. And that one little rain, look what it did. For being here so long, you get experience, you get the feel of the water, how the water flows and all that. So if you've done it long enough, you get the feel. I could do this in my sleep because I'm so used to doing it. Yeah, I've been working for the city for 20 years. I'm from North Hills, Pennsylvania. I came down here to help my dad out when I graduated from high school. I started looking for like a future place I can work, retirement, and something's gonna be for, helpful for me in the long run and help people out. So I put an application for the city and they hired me, which was good, best thing that could ever happen. City's got 30 water control structures, five gated structures. I'm opening uh, at least minimum 15 today. I got three kids, three, two boys and a daughter. And my oldest son gave me my first grandkid. He's, he'll be three. So I spent a lot of time with them. Because family's first. Oh, I'm a real sports fanatic, big hockey fan. Yeah, I was hoping my Penguins would win it this year, but I can't complain. They won the last two years. <laughs> you can't win it all the time. Yesterday was 16 inches below. It's 10 inches above today. So what I'm doing here now is when I open this one up, so how high it is, I'm draining it down. By the end of the day, this should be like 16 inches below the wall. And there's a hard ditch, a hard, hard ditch here, and there's like outfalls that come in. But once you get to a certain level, you'll see the water coming into the canals. And then when I get done, I gotta log it on the computer. What I do is I write the time I was here, when I inspected it, what I did, the water level, and the height. This was like 20.4 this morning, and it's almost up to 21. Plus, the water that I'm bringing down raised it a little bit, but you see how it's pushing the water over fast? Each one controls a gate. If you put it on auto, it works on the computer. 
and then manual, this is for gate two. If I wanted to close it, I hit the blue button, I hold it in until the gates get completely closed. Okay. If I want to open it, I do the vice versa, the other opposite. And there's one for each one. Oh, I love my job. I get to work with good people and we can in, enjoy what we're doing when we're at work. That's how I was brought up by my dad. He was real caring about his work and so was I. So like I take I take it do I do take it home. I look at the weather and everything, so I look at the bridge reading and all that. And that should be it. I'll just come back and clean them off. Building Division is responsible for making sure that all the codes that the state has adopted in construction is adhered to. And basically what we do is we look at, we go and do our plan reviews when the customer brings a set of plans in that they want to construct a commercial project or a residential project. We'll review the plans to make sure that they comply with all amenable codes that the state has adopted. After we issue the permit, then we'll go out and do all the inspections and make sure that they are constructed according to the plans. We're responsible for the uh, safe construction of all these buildings and we look at all aspects of the construction from footings, foundations, uh, block walls, to roof construction, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and both commercial and residential. So when we have a commercial project that comes in, we're looking at all aspects of that to make sure that it is a safe environment too. And it has to be designed to withstand the 160 mile an hour wind criteria that the state has mandated that we look at. Our job is life safety, is to making sure that the building is constructed in a safe manner that it will stand the hurricane's design wind loads that we have down here. And uh, that's what our job is, is to make sure people are safe in their building, that they can walk into their building knowing that Northport has done the best possible job we can to make sure that their, their building is constructed in a manner that they feel safe in, they can go home in. The Planning and Zoning Division is responsible for all development management of the City of Northport, large-scale commercial developments, residential developments. The City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division is divided into two separate uh, sections. One is the Strategic Planning Group and the other is the Tactical Planning Group. The strategic planning group is responsible for development management through the preparing and updating of our comprehensive plan, its amendments, all the annexations, and reviewing development of regional impacts and zoning applications. The strategic planning group is also responsible for updating our demographics, population projections, and land use data through GIS, and also maintain our land use and zoning maps. The tactical side of the office is responsible for maintaining the Unified Land Development Code, ensuring all development proposals that are submitted to the city are consistent and in compliance with ULDC, all of our master plans, our pattern books, zoning requirements, and the city's comprehensive plan. Tactical operations also helps coordinate all development proposals through the city departments, the division, and external agencies through our staff development review process managing development's appearance, their architecture, traffic impacts, fiscal impacts, compliance to signage, landscape, and other development management requirements. We work closely with utilities, building, and public works. We also manage the environmental compliance issues on site development. The Property Standards Division is what's otherwise known as code enforcement in other municipalities. We are located on the first floor of City Hall, our job is to assure the health, safety, and welfare of our residents and assist in maintaining the community standards. We enforce the Unified Land Development Code, the Northport City Code, and the Florida Building Code. The Northport City Code would be like grass and weeds. That's one of our major violations, especially in the summer. Uh, Unified Land Development Code would be like the number of vehicles on a property. Uh, Florida Building Code would be someone building something like a shed or something like that on the property without a permit. The purpose of code enforcement is to make sure that everything's safe in the communities, to make sure that 
everything's being built properly with the proper permits to make sure that basically everything looks nice. If someone has an issue with a neighbor or a house that they drive by, they do have the option to contact property standards through phone, fax, or a North Report. What's it like? Undescribable. Um, the only word I was using is Armageddon. Um, sheer loss, destruction, um, not just wood frame homes. These are concrete structures that are destroyed. Just the compassion that I am thankful that as a crew in, in Northport, we could give them. I mean, if we weren't putting out fires or if we weren't um, finding people to save, it was simply giving them a hug. Um, helping them get some of the furniture out of their house, assisting them with a ladder to the second story because maybe the stairs were wiped out, uh, climbing up in there and, and getting that little piece of home that they wanted back so badly and able to give it to them, and then just listen to their story and, and, their, and, and hear their, about their loss. Personal safety for my family, I will not ride out a storm again. I will not take that chance. Um, if I see it coming up the Gulf towards our city, uh, my family's going to get out. Getting home is unbelievable. So thankful to be home, that my family is safe, to be back here, where this, this simple creature comforts are back at home to have those things back and normal meals. Unbelievable what we saw there, the loss that we saw there and the destruction there. Frank Lamas, Always Manager for the City of Northport. Uh, we're here today to talk about three recycling tips. The first one is plastic bags. Now, plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So let's talk about some of the plastic bags. Grocery bags, okay, they're very important. We see them inside the blue lid container quite often. They need to be returned back to the grocery stores. And that would be your Publix, your Walmarts, your Targets. Please return them back there. Do not place recyclable uh, items inside these bags, tie them, and place them in the blue lid tote. If it goes down to the processor, it is called contaminant. It's contaminated and they will not accept it. So please, keep the grocery bags outside. Now remember, it's not just grocery bags, okay? We're talking about bread bags, lunch bags, uh, big plastic garbage bags that fill the recyclables. And we have one right here to show you. And I'll go ahead and show you. This is what we find out there. This right here is contaminated. All this clean recyclable is contaminated because it's inside a plastic bag. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So thank you very much for watching this video. Please, if you have any questions about recycling materials or how to recycle, place it in the comment below and we will try to get to you in a future video. Frank Lamas, always manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with you for Let's Recycle Right Northport. So, a couple of things. We have an aluminum can and a straw. Now the aluminum can right here, 500 million are consumed each day. This is the most valuable recycling item you can see out there in the world today. Let's talk about the plastic straw, okay? The plastic straw, 
500 million are used each day. This is not a recyclable item right here in Northport. That's right, even though it's plastic, don't let it fool you. Just because it's plastic, it is not a recyclable material right here inside our program. Now the aluminum can, yes, that is a recyclable item right here in Northport. And Lana, thank you very much for your comment and question. And the question was about plastic bags, uh, water bags, salt bags. These are not a recyclable item right here in Northport. These belong in your trash, please. They belong in the trash, they do not belong in the blue lid container. Bleach bottles, that's right, bleach bottles are a recyclable material right here in Northport, a number two. They belong in the blue lid container. The only thing you'll have to do is make sure they're empty, clean, and dry. If you have any more of the questions or comments, please place them below and we'll get to you in the next video. Thank you very much. What makes this place so special is, is the people. Um, the, the community who you serve and the people who you work with. Our mission statement is to provide the community with the elite law enforcement services out there with the highest priority being the protection of life and property. We work 24 seven, holidays, you know, there's no time off. Uh, our agency is rapidly growing. We have a, um, a detective bureau, we have a traffic unit, uh, we have a full crime scene unit. Northport PD is an accredited agency. Actually, we're double Excelsior accredited, which is we are one of 14, I believe, other agencies in the state of Florida that have reached that double Excelsior credit. It's a very prestigious uh, accomplishment to have. Most of the people only see uh, the police officers in uniforms out there doing the day-to-day -day tasks, but they can't do that alone. In the background, what people don't see a lot is the support staff here at Northport Police Department. We go from very high density areas to very rural areas uh, throughout the city. The challenge that Northport Police Department is facing right now is the rapid growth in the city of Northport um, and trying to keep up with those levels of service. Law enforcement officers wear many different hats, um, but at the end of the day, it's their, their problem solvers. Um, they're there for you. 24-7, uh, and the, their, their importance of all of our officers that we stress to is to go home safe at night. The Administration Division of Public Works does a variety of different tasks. Uh, the main one is our Customer Service Division. They answer several hundred phone calls a day, ranging from solid waste questions to uh, water drainage questions on a day like today. Also, we have a uh, Budget Finance Administration Division that handles accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable, and budget. The Northport Public Works Department also has a technical section that handles GIS, mapping, and um, also our work order system. Engineering Division, we analyze any drainage issues that the city might have, water control structures. We're also in charge of all the roadways. The roadways include design for multi-use trails, sidewalks. 
The city has been experiencing tremendous growth. The biggest project that we have right now is called the Price Boulevard Whitening. That road is a two-lane road. Capacity for that two-lane road is about 17,000 vehicles per day. Uh, our latest numbers for that show that currently there are 21,700 vehicles traveling every day, meaning it's way over capacity. Engineering also is in charge of uh, revising new development. When uh, a new gas station comes, uh, a new hotel or building, they submit plans to us. So it's our responsibility to check that they comply with water treatment. The drainage that they got to design the pond and the piping and everything is per code and standards. I have one professional engineer that takes care of all the uh, roadway design. Then I have a stormwater manager and then we have a group of inspectors. They inspect uh, when there's a new house being built, they got to inspect the, the driveway, the culvert pipe and making sure that it's set up at the right elevation to provide positive flow. They also inspect the roadways on the, through the road bond. They inspect uh, to see that the correct thickness of pavement is being applied. Also the water control structure, when it gets into construction, we have our own inspector that go and make sure that the project is being built per the plans and specifications. Fleet Division, we have uh, over 600 vehicles and equipment that we maintain. I've got seven mechanics, shop supervisor, two staff assistants, and a fleet asset technician that um, we do everything from cradle to grave for all of our vehicles and uh, equipment. So we order the equipment, maintain the equipment, and ultimately dispose of the equipment. We do everything from weed eaters to all the way to airboats to solid waste vehicles, grapple trucks, uh, solid waste trucks, fire, fire engines, ambulances, police cars. The entire fleet of the city. Well, we're able to maintain all of our own vehicles. That's the biggest thing. So all of our mechanics have a relationship, if you will, with these vehicles. They know the, in, the nuances of all the vehicles. Uh, it makes it easy for our departments to come and see us. We, we, you know, we're an on-site facility for them, so they don't they don't necessarily have to schedule safety-related issues. They can come directly to us. Um, the city fleet maintenance also carries 44,000 gallons of fuel that we maintain our vehicles with as well. We've got over 200 years of mechanics experience among them so we've got gentlemen who have been here for over 30 years and we've got guys who have been here for just over a year. Public Works Operations Department currently has 71 employees. Of that 71 employees were divided into two sections which is roadway and drainage. Our roadway section takes care of the over 800 miles of roadway. Of striping, pothole repairs, all of that is handled by the road section. In the roadway section, we, we maintain all of the street signs, uh, install, replace. We maintain all of the traffic signals. We have 19 traffic signals that we maintain in the city, as well as mowing all the right-of-ways, the vertical mowing to push back the uh, impinging vegetation out of the right-of-ways. In that division, we also have the waterway crew that handles all of our aquatic spraying. We have two crews that go out in airboats that spray those waterways to keep the vegetation down. We also have crews that operate all our water control structures. We have 23 gated water control structures that facilitate the movement of the stormwater through the city during storm events uh, and even just our typical rainy season. Then we have our drainage section. It maintains all of our roadside swales our retention ditches, and all of our pipe installs, our catch basin installs, uh, anything that, that has to do with getting the water from the properties or the roadways into the secondary drainage, which is our retention ditches, and into our canals. Our mission is to ensure the safety and health of our citizens through the proper and efficient collection and disposal of all solid waste. We collect uh, over 30,000 residents here in the city. Garbage, garbage bulk, yard waste, uh, yard waste bulk, uh, recycling, also metal. This year, we're probably gonna do about 600 tons more of recyclable material over the last year. So that's pretty awesome. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, myself, I've been here 18 years 
And when I first started here at the Solid Waste Division, there was only about 15 people. And right now, we have grown, as the city grows, so have we, uh, we're up to 39 people and employees. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We also collect from our commercial accounts, we collect dumpsters and roll-offs, and from businesses and organizations, and it's starting to really pick up also. Uh, we have about three, over 350 accounts right now, and some of those accounts go maybe three, four, five times in a week. Uh, we get 3,300 service requests a month for bulk of garbage and collection. We have some good, good people that work here, so really care about the community. Remember, if you have any questions at, at any time, you can always just give us a call at 941-240-8050. Give us a call, customer service. We'll gladly help you with any questions. Many times, crisis can't be avoided. A family's car will accidentally break down while their electric bill is due. A health emergency will arise just as it's time to pay the rent. It's a reality that so many people face. What makes the City of Northport unique is that it offers a way to help. The City of Northport Social Services Division connects the public with valuable resources to improve their overall quality of life, especially in unexpected times of hardship. As part of the City Manager's Office, the Social Services Division's mission is to ensure the availability, awareness, and accessibility of programs and resources in the community, and to assist families and individuals while improving their overall quality of life. With five staff members, including a manager, two full-time caseworkers, a staff assistant one, and a staff assistant two, the Social Services Division assists Northport households experiencing a short-term, unavoidable crisis with financial assistance. Staff can assist with rent or mortgage, utilities, and more. In addition, staff will connect families and individuals with available community resources. The Social Services Division also oversees the City of Northport's Family Service Center and the Community Education Center located on Pan American Boulevard. Both the Family Service Center and the Community Education Center house a variety of nonprofit and government agencies that provide aid to residents. Located on a campus that includes the Sarasota County Health Department and Children's First, this one-stop location offers a variety of resources that residents would otherwise have to travel outside the city to access. The offices of the Social Services Division are busy. Every Monday morning, Northport residents visit the Social Services Division for what is known as pre-screen Mondays. Clients can meet with a caseworker who gathers basic information about their current situation. From there, referrals and appointments are made to further assist the Northport household. In addition to assisting with rent, mortgage, or utilities, the Social Services Division also is an intake location for families and individuals experiencing homelessness. The division is a one-by-one -one coordinated intake access point. This is a system that has been created to identify eligible resources and connect clients with the appropriate assistance regarding their situation. Outside of their daily operations, the Social Services Division hosts events in the community designed to further connect the public with area resources. Every April, the division works with the Healthy Start of Sarasota County to host a community baby shower and preschool expo. This event features businesses and community agencies that offer information and services for parents of both toddlers and newborns. The division also hosts a back to school resource fair every August to provide school aged children supplemental school supplies and backpacks. The fair features exhibitors that provide services for parents with school-aged children. During the holidays, Social Services hosts an annual Home for the Holidays program. This program has two parts, a senior giving tree and adopt and shop. In both cases, seniors and parents register with Social Services and are adopted by individuals, businesses, and organizations who help provide a holiday experience. Many city departments will adopt families or seniors through this program. Ask your supervisor how you can get involved. There are many other ways that you can help through the Social Services Division. City employees are invited to volunteer time or donate resources. Donations can come in the form of gift cards to gas stations or grocery stores. Monetary donations are also accepted. 
The Social Services Division and Northport Utilities work together to offer an H2O program in which monetary donations are used to assist Northport households to pay their Northport Utilities bills. Social Services also works with Parks and Recreation to facilitate a youth scholarship program so that our local youth can participate in programs offered by the Parks and Recreation Department. The Social Services Division makes a difference in the lives of Northport residents every day through the services that they provide. If you or someone you know are in a short-term crisis and need assistance, contact the Social Services Division. They are here to help. The Utilities Department is in charge of all water and wastewater services for the City of Northport. We currently serve 17,000 sewer customers and 22,000 water customers throughout the city. Utilities is comprised of five different divisions. We have our Administration Division, Engineering, Field Operations, our Water Treatment Plant, and our Wastewater Plant. Our administration division has two locations. One is the admin office and field office over on West Price Boulevard next to the high school. Or the other office is our cashiering and customer care office and that is located on the first floor of City Hall. Our engineering division, they oversee all of the utilities projects, uh, new development going in, infrastructure inspections, everything that the city has in the ground has to be located for new construction. Also in the field office on Price Boulevard is our field operations division. They are in charge of maintaining everything out in the distribution and the collection system. They're the ones that do all the new service installations. Anytime there is a break or a repair, they're the ones that respond to that. And we have field operations staff um, available and on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our meter readers are part of our field operations division and those meter readers read every single one of our 22,000 water meters every single month. Our wastewater treatment plant is located on Pan American Boulevard and that plant basically treats all wastewater sewer water throughout the city. And what we do there is we take all that incoming sewage and we treat it to uh, produce reclaimed water. The reclaimed water is pumped out to several parks, city facilities, commercial customers, golf courses and used for irrigation so that way potable water is not used for those purposes. Our Mayakachi Creek water treatment plant is located on Northport Boulevard next to the skate park and that facility is a conventional B class surface water plant that also has a reverse osmosis treatment plant on the same site. Utilities is largely on the front lines when, when anything's happening within the city if it's an emergency situation, it's generally utilities that are right in the thick of things, right behind fire. We provide a lot of support to fire. And in instances like Hurricane Irma, as soon as the roads were clear, utilities was right in the thick of things, making sure that we had sanitary sewer and water to be provided to our citizens in their time of need. My name is Dominic Caravella. I'm actually the chief mechanic for the city of Northport for uh, fleet. Well, we do every vehicle that the city owns. We do the entire city. So that includes your PD, fire, um, sanitation, public works, your building department, landscaping, because we do, you know, lawnmowers as small as that all the way on up. Anything the city owns that has a motor on it, we do it here. I oversee the work out here in the shop. I just make sure it's flowing. If somebody has a, a problem or if they're running into something they're not familiar with, uh, then the two of us would get together and try and figure it out and do the best we can and, and get it up and going. I started out when I was young, went to a trade school, graduated from there, and started off um, doing oil changes and things. Well, I was always interested in transmissions and I became a transmission mechanic for many years. I came down here, I used to vacation down here. My mother-in-law lived here, my in-laws. And uh, when we used to come down and vacation for two weeks, I sort of liked the area. I've got three kids. My daughter is a high school teacher at the high school here in Northport. My son's a, an officer. 
for, for Northport. My wife works for Northport, and I work for Northport. <laughs> and my youngest daughter is uh, in nursing program. She's doing nursing. I got two pieces of fire equipment in here. Now, if we don't repair them or this or that, the fire department's without that equipment, so they can't service the general public. We have to get that thing running, get it fixed best we can, get it back to them, and then they put it in service for the public. It's incredibly important. I mean, all right, we'll take, for instance, that rescue, all right? We're gonna fix that rescue, we're gonna do what we can, right? You call, that rescue comes to your house, boom, somebody's having a heart attack. They throw them in that rescue, they take it. It better make it from point A to point B. So I have to make sure that everything is running as best as it possibly can. That's, that's the matter of life and death. Same thing with a, you know, an officer of the law. If that guy is running, he has to be able to hop in that car. He relies on that thing to start, drive, and perform like he wants it to. My job to keep it working that way so he can do his job. I can't speak for everybody in here. For me, it's the reward of knowing that that vehicle is repaired. It's back out there in the field. It's doing its job. That man's doing his job. So I feel like I did my job. It's just the gratification of doing the repair. I love my job. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, we have a hydraulic leak, so I got to change a hydraulic line from the um, tank all the way up to the main control. So we got to take it off. I got to get a pan. Steve, can you grab one of them pans from over there, please? One of them drain pans? Thank you. We'll be making a hydraulic hose uh, on our hydraulic machine. Let me get the operator to get his launch bucket out of there. I need you to get your lunch bucket. I gotta lift the cab. I gotta get in the back, if you can. We got his, one of his main feed hydraulic hoses. What happened to it? Uh, it blew out. It actually had a hole in it and it was leaking. We're gonna make one right now. I'll show you how we do that. It, where it goes through the clamps, a lot of times it'll rub and it rubbed through. So we get, we get a uh, leak from it. So we're just gonna replace the whole thing and we make them here. Uh, we have all the dyes. So I just got to get the fittings from the parts department and we're just going to make it. So we generate work orders and then they issue all the parts for the vehicle to be repaired and it basically goes on this work order. Um, I'm going to need some hydraulic fittings. Some, um, I'm making a hydraulic hose. Okay, what do you need? Uh, two. Um, you want to get those first, and then we'll, or you want me to look first? Yeah, let's see if that is the size. I, I believe it's 16 by 16, but I could be wrong. A part of this job is um, taking care of, you know, roadside assistance, whether it be a hydraulic line, flat tire, dead battery, uh, anything along those lines. Or sometimes the vehicles, the guys will get in them at the end to come in, yeah. and they don't want to start. So the heavy equipment operator now is calling, hey, my vehicle don't start. So we have to send a guy out, either throw a battery in or check out why it's not, you know, why it won't run. It's not only a physical thing, it's a thinking thing. You know, you got to be able to think these things through. Especially if you're on a call out and you're out in the field. Now there's, you know, I mean, yeah, they can touch base. You can call in and, and get assistance. But a lot of times you got to be able to, you know, you got to think on your feet, as they would say. That's the first step. Here comes my parts guy with my fittings. Thank you, Mike. You put the fitting on the end. 3.1. It could take some time. It depends on, um, you know, like right here we're dealing with one inch line, but if you were to deal with bigger size line, uh, it could take some time. Usually it takes about 20 minutes, a half hour you know, give or take. That's, that's removing the part, 
making the line and possibly putting it back on. And that's what it looks like. That's finished product. That's finished product. A lot of times I like to add sleeve. What this is, if that line should ever blow out and get a hy uh, hydraulic leak, this restricts it. So instead of spraying, it's just going to ooze out of this, this outer liner. Okay. So it's, it's a protective casing for the operator and whoever is nearby when it actually springs a leak. I said if you're not a good climber, it's hard to get in some of these spots. We're testing the hose that I made, the hydraulic hose, making sure it isn't leaking and uh, all the functions on the truck work properly. When you get a chance and you build up air pressure, could you move it ahead some? When you run the can, because over there we got a... Okay, you're clear. Have a good day. That's how you do a hydraulic line. Our mission statement is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, and professional manner. All of our line personnel are highly trained, State of Florida certified firefighter, EMTs, and paramedics. We cover approximately 105 square miles of the city of Northport and 20 miles of interstate. Camaraderie is important because you start working as a group, you do it in training, and it all seems to come together when you get out on the fire ground and you really need your partners. Everybody knows never to leave your partner and they don't, it's been, they've been trained in it. We have five fire stations located throughout the city in various locations and uh, we are planning number six in West Village's area. We also have all of our fire stations are considered safe places and safe havens. Safe places are for youth who are at risk and are in need of help and they can come walk into any fire station and get the help that they're looking for. Safe havens for newborns is a different program, different age group where infants can be brought to a fire station without question. All of our fire stations now are hardened facilities so that we can stay in them during storms and everyone stays safe. So police departments is in there, utilities, public works, whoever we need to go out immediately after the storm then they're there with us to go. A lot of questions that people ask are why we send an ambulance and a fire truck to an EMS call and a lot of that is for manpower. There's a lot of things to do when somebody is having a cardiac incident. So we send the fire truck with them for the extra manpower and lifting assistance and extra help. The whole goal for fire rescue is everybody goes home safe. Frank Lama, solid waste manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with Let's Recycle Right Northport. Got a few items for you today. Last week, we did notice in the tan lid container, shredded paper put in a plastic bag. Please, shredded paper does not belong in a plastic bag, okay? It belongs right here in a paper bag, please. And it belongs in a tan lid container. This right here, being in plastic, will be considered contamination and garbage. Let's talk about a candle, a glass candle. Yes, it is made of glass, but it is not recyclable right here in Northport. That's right, only glass jars and glass bottles are recyclable in the blue lid container. Let's also talk about the milk jug, water jug, number two. Definitely recyclable, right? Here's the cap. If the cap is not attached, it will be garbage. So, if you crush it down, Put the cap on real nice and tight. This will make it through the process. This will be a number two. Okay, so let's talk about the plastic ring. That's right, the plastic ring. This is a 12 holder. They have six, six holders out there. Please, this is not a recyclable material and needs to be placed inside your trash. So listen, put your comments below. We'll see you in a future video.
makes me feel important that I'm doing something for the community. I like helping people and I love the work. We got 2.8 inches of rain last night. How I approach it is I gotta release some of that water out that we got to get prepared for the next day because you know it's gonna rain again. It's like I've been draining these for the last two weeks between 16 and 20 inches every day below the wall. And that one little rain, look what it did. For being here so long, you get experience, you get the feel of the water, how the water flows and all that. So if you've done it long enough, you get the feel. I could do this in my sleep, but I'm so used to doing it. Yeah, I've been working for the city for 20 years. I'm from North Hills, Pennsylvania. I came down here to help my dad out when I graduated from high school. I started looking for like a future place I can work, retirement, and something's gonna be for, helpful for me in the long run and help people out. So I put an application for the city and they hired me, which was good, best thing that could ever happen. City's got 30 water control structures, five gated structures. I'm opening uh, at least minimum 15 today. I got three kids, three, two boys and a daughter. And my oldest son gave me my first grandkid. He's, he'll be three. So I spent a lot of time with them. Because family's first. Oh, I'm a real sports fanatic, big hockey fan. Yeah, I was hoping my Penguins would win it this year, but I can't complain. They won the last two years. <laughs> you can't win it all the time. Yesterday was 16 inches below. It's 10 inches above today. So what I'm doing here now is when I open this one up, so how high it is, I'm draining it down. By the end of the day, this should be like 16 inches below the wall. And there's a R ditch. Our uh, hard ditch here, and there's like outfalls that come in. But once you get to a certain level, yeah. you'll see the water coming into the canals. And then when I get done, I gotta log it on the computer. What I do is I write the time I was here, when I inspected it, what I did, the water level, and the height. This was like 20.4 this morning, and it's almost up to 21. Plus, the water that I'm bringing down raised it a little bit, but you see how it's pushing the water over fast? Each one controls a gate. If you put it on auto, it works on the computer. And then manual, this is for gate two. If I wanted to close it, I hit the blue button, I hold it in until the gates can completely close. If I want to open, I do vice versa, the other opposite. And there's one for each one. Oh, I love my job. I get to work with good people. And we can in enjoy what we're doing when we're at work. That's how I was brought up by my dad. He was real caring about his work and so was I. So like I take I take it do I do take it home. I look at the weather and everything, so I look at the bridge reading and all that. And that should be it. I'll just come back and clean them off. Building Division is responsible for making sure that all the codes that the state has adopted in construction is adhered to. And basically what we do is we look at, we go and do our plan reviews when the customer brings a set of plans in that they want to construct a commercial project or a residential project. We'll review the plans to make sure that they comply with all amenable codes that the state has adopted. After we issue the permit, then we'll go out and do all the inspections and make sure that they are constructed according to the plans. We're responsible for the uh, safe construction of all these buildings and we look at all aspects of the construction from footings, foundations, uh, block walls to roof construction, plumbing, mechanical, electrical in both commercial and residential. So when 
we have a commercial project that comes in, we're looking at all aspects of that to make sure that it is a safe environment to, and it has to be designed to withstand the 160 mile an hour wind criteria that the state has mandated that we look at. Our job is life safety, just making sure that the building is constructed in a safe manner that it will stand the hurricane's design wind loads that we have down here. And uh, that's what our job is, is to make sure people are safe in their building, that they can walk into their building knowing that Northport has done the best possible job we can to make sure that their, con their building is constructed in a manner that they feel safe in, they can go home in. The Planning and Zoning Division is responsible for all development management of the City of Northport, large-scale commercial developments, residential developments. The City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division is divided into two separate uh, sections. One is the Strategic Planning Group and the other is the Tactical Planning Group. The Strategic Planning Group is responsible for development management through the preparing and updating of our comprehensive plan, its amendments, all the annexations, and reviewing development of regional impacts and zoning applications. The Strategic Planning Group is also responsible for updating our demographics, population projections, and land use data through GIS, and also maintain our land use and zoning maps. The tactical side of the office is responsible for maintaining the Unified Land Development Code, ensuring all development proposals that are submitted to the city are consistent and in compliance with ULDC, all of our master plans, our pattern books, zoning requirements, and the city's comprehensive plan. Tactical operations also helps coordinate all development proposals through the city departments, the division, and external agencies through our staff development review process managing development's appearance, their architecture, traffic impacts, fiscal impacts, compliance to signage, landscape, and other development management requirements. We work closely with utilities, building, and public works. We also manage the environmental compliance issues on site development. The Property Standards Division is what's otherwise known as code enforcement in other municipalities. We are located on the first floor of City Hall, our job is to assure the health, safety, and welfare of our residents and assist in maintaining the community standards. We enforce the Unified Land Development Code, the Northport City Code, and the Florida Building Code. Northport City Code would be like grass and weeds. That's one of our major violations, especially in the summer. Uh, Unified Land Development Code would be like the number of vehicles on a property. Uh, Florida Building Code would be someone building something like a shed or something like that on the property without a permit. The purpose of code enforcement is to make sure that everything's safe in the communities, to make sure that everything's being built properly with the proper permits, to make sure that basically everything looks nice. If someone has an issue with a neighbor or a house that they drive by, they do have the option to contact property standards through the phone, fax, or our North Report. What's it like? Undescribable. Um, the only word I was using is Armageddon, um, sheer loss, destruction, um, not just wood frame homes. These are concrete structures that are destroyed. Just the compassion that I am thankful that as a crew in, in Northport, we could give them. I mean, if we weren't putting out fires or if we weren't um, finding people to save, it was simply giving them a hug. Um, helping them get some of the furniture out of their house, assisting them with a ladder to the second story because maybe the stairs were wiped out, uh, climbing up in there and, and getting that little piece of home that they wanted back so badly and able to give it to them, and then just listen to their story and, and, their, and, and hear their, about their loss. Personal safety for my family, I will not ride out a storm again. I will not take that chance. Um, if I see it coming up the Gulf towards our city, uh, my family's going to get out. Getting home is unbelievable. So thankful to be home, that my family is safe, to be back here, where this, this simple creature comforts are back at home to have those things back and normal meals. Unbelievable what we saw there, the loss that we saw there and the destruction there.
Frank Lamas, Always Manager for the City of Northport. Uh, we're here today to talk about three recycling tips. The first one is plastic bags. Now, plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So let's talk about some of the plastic bags. Grocery bags, okay, they're very important. We see them inside the blue container quite often. They need to be returned back to the grocery stores. And that would be your Publix, your Walmarts, your Targets. Please return them back there. Do not place recyclable uh, items inside these bags. Tie them and place them in the blue lid tote. If it goes down to the processor, it is called contaminant. It's contaminated and they will not accept it. So please, keep the grocery bags outside. Now remember, it's not just grocery bags. Okay, we're talking about bread bags, lunch bags, uh, big plastic garbage bags that fill the recyclables. And we have one right here to show you. And I'll go ahead and show you. This is what we find out there. This right here is contaminated. All this clean recyclable is contaminated because it's inside a plastic bag. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So thank you very much for watching this video. Please, if you have any questions about recycling materials or how to recycle, place it in the comment below and we will try to get to you in a future video. Frank Lamas, always manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with you for Let's Recycle Right Northport. So, a couple of things. We have an aluminum can and a straw. Now, the aluminum can right here, 500 million are consumed each day. This is the most valuable recycling item you can see out there in the world today. Let's talk about the plastic straw, okay? The plastic straw, 500 million are used each day. This is not a recyclable item right here in Northport. That's right, even though it's plastic, don't let it fool you. Just because it's plastic, it is not a recyclable material right here inside our program. Now the aluminum can, yes, that is a recyclable item right here in Northport. And Lana, thank you very much for your comment and question. And the question was about plastic bags, uh, water bags, salt bags. These are not a recyclable item right here in Northport. These belong in your trash, please. They belong in the trash, they do not belong in the blue lid container. Bleach bottles, that's right, bleach bottles are a recyclable material right here in Northport, a number two. They belong in the blue lid container. The only thing you'll have to do is make sure they're empty, clean, and dry. If you have any more of the questions or comments, please place them below and we'll get to you in the next video. Thank you very much. What makes this place so special is, is the people, um, the, the community who you serve and the people who you work with. Our mission statement is to provide the community with the elite law enforcement services out there with the highest priority being the protection of life and property. We work 24-7, holidays, you know, there's no time off. Uh, our agency is rapidly growing. We have a, um, a detective bureau, we have a traffic unit, uh, we have a full crime scene unit. Northport PD is an accredited agency. Actually, we're double Excelsior accredited, which is we are one of 14, I believe, other agencies in the state of Florida that have reached that double Excelsior accredited. It's a very prestigious uh, accomplishment to have. Most of the people only see uh, the police officers in uniforms out there doing the day-to-day -day tasks, but they can't do that alone. In the background, what people don't see a lot is the support staff here at Northport Police Department. We go from very high density areas to very rural areas uh, throughout the city. The challenge that Northport Police Department is facing right now is the rapid growth in the city of Northport um, and trying to keep up with those levels of service. Law enforcement officers wear many different hats, um, but at the end of the day, it's their, their problem solvers. Um, they're there for you 24 seven. 
uh, and the, their, their importance of all of our officers that we stress to is to go home safe at night. The Administration Division of Public Works does a variety of different tasks. Uh, the main one is our Customer Service Division. They answer several hundred phone calls a day, ranging from solid waste questions to uh, water drainage questions on a day like today. Also, we have a uh, Budget Finance Administration Division that handles accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable, and budget. The Northport Public Works Department also has a technical section that handles GIS, mapping, and um, also our work order system. The engineering division, we analyze any drainage issues that the city might have, water control structures. We're also in charge of all the roadways. The roadways include design for multi-use trails, sidewalks, the city has been experiencing tremendous growth. The biggest project that we have right now is called the Price Boulevard Whitening. That road is a two-lane road. Capacity for that two-lane road is about 17,000 vehicles per day. Uh, our latest numbers for that show that currently there are 21,700 vehicles traveling every day, meaning it's way over capacity. Engineering also is in charge of uh, revising new development. When uh, a new gas station comes, uh, a new hotel or building, they submit plans to us. So it's our responsibility to check that they comply with water treatment, the drainage that they got to design the pond and the piping and everything is per code and standards. I have one professional engineer that takes care of all the uh, roadway design. Then I have a stormwater manager and then we have a group of inspectors they inspect uh, when there's a new house being built they got to inspect the, the driveway the culvert pipe and making sure that it's set up at the right elevation to provide positive flow they also inspect the roadways on the, through the row bond they inspect uh, to see that the correct thickness of pavement is being applied also the water control structure when it gets into construction we have our own inspector that go and make sure that the project is being built per the plans and specifications Fleet Division, we have uh, over 600 vehicles and equipment that we maintain. I've got seven mechanics, shop supervisor, two staff assistants, and a fleet asset technician. That um, We do everything from cradle to grave for all of our vehicles and uh, equipment. So we order the equipment, maintain the equipment, and ultimately dispose of the equipment. We do everything from weed eaters to all the way to airboats to solid waste vehicles, grapple trucks, uh, solid waste trucks, fire, fire engines, ambulances, police cars the entire fleet of the city. Well, we're able to maintain all of our own vehicles. That's the biggest thing. So all of our mechanics have a relationship, if you will, with these vehicles. They know the, in, the nuances of all the vehicles. Uh, it makes it easy for our departments to come and see us. We, we, you know, we're an on-site facility for them, so they don't, they don't necessarily have to schedule safety-related issues. They can come directly to us. Um, the city fleet maintenance also carries 44,000 gallons of fuel that we maintain our vehicles with as well. We've got over 200 years of mechanics experience among them so we've got gentlemen who have been here for over 30 years and we've got guys who have been here for just over a year. Public Works Operations Department currently has 71 employees. Of that 71 employees were divided into two sections which is roadway and drainage. Our roadway section takes care of the over 800 miles of roadway. Of striping, pothole repairs, all of that is handled by the road section. 
in the roadway section, we, we maintain all of the street signs, uh, install, replace, we maintain all of the traffic signals. We have 19 traffic signals that we maintain in the city, as well as mowing all the right-of-ways, the vertical mowing to push back the uh, impinging vegetation out of the right-of-ways. In that division, we also have the waterway crew that handles all of our aquatic spraying. We have two crews that go out in airboats that spray those waterways to keep the vegetation down. We also have crews that operate all our water control structures. We have 23 gated water control structures that facilitate the movement of the stormwater through the city during storm events uh, and even just our typical rainy season. Then we have our drainage section. It maintains all of our roadside swales, our retention ditches, and all of our pipe installs, our catch basin installs, uh, anything that, that has to do with getting the water from the properties or the roadways into the secondary drainage, which is our retention ditches, and into our canals. Our mission is to ensure the safety and health of our citizens through the proper and efficient collection and disposal of all solid waste. We collect uh, over 30,000 residents here in the city. Garbage, garbage bulk, yard waste, uh, yard waste bulk, uh, recycling, also metal. This year we're probably going to do about 600 tons more of recyclable material over the last year. So that's pretty awesome. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, myself, I've been here 18 years. And when I first started here at the Solid Waste Division, there was only about 15 people. And right now, we have grown, as the city grows, so have we, uh, we're up to 39 people and employees. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We also collect from our commercial accounts, we collect dumpsters and roll-offs, and from businesses and organizations, and it's starting to really pick up also. Uh, we have about three, over 350 accounts right now, and some of those accounts go maybe three, four, five times a week. Uh, we get 3,300 service requests a month for bulk of garbage and collection. We have some good, good people that work here, so we really care about the community. Remember, if you have any questions at any time, you can always just give us a call at 941-240-8050. Give us a call, customer service. They'll gladly help you with any questions. Many times, Crisis can't be avoided. A family's car will accidentally break down while their electric bill is due. A health emergency will arise just as it's time to pay the rent. It's a reality that so many people face. What makes the City of Northport unique is that it offers a way to help. The City of Northport Social Services Division connects the public with valuable resources to improve their overall quality of life, especially in unexpected times of hardship. As part of the city manager's office, the social services division's mission is to ensure the availability, awareness, and accessibility of programs and resources in the community, and to assist families and individuals while improving their overall quality of life. With five staff members, including a manager, two full-time caseworkers, a staff assistant one, and a staff assistant two, the social services division assists Northport households experiencing a short-term, unavoidable crisis with financial assistance. Staff can assist with rent or mortgage, utilities, and more. In addition, staff will connect families and individuals with available community resources. The Social Services Division also oversees the City of Northport's Family Service Center and the Community Education Center, located on Pan American Boulevard. Both the Family Service Center and the Community Education Center house a variety of nonprofit and government agencies that provide aid to residents. Located on a campus that includes the Sarasota County Health Department and Children's First, this one-stop location offers a variety of resources that residents would otherwise have to travel outside the city to access. The offices of the Social Services Division are busy. Every Monday morning, Northport residents visit the Social Services Division for what is known as pre-screen Mondays. Clients can meet with a caseworker who gathers basic information about their current situation. From there, referrals and appointments are made to further assist the Northport household. In addition to assisting with rent, mortgage, or utilities, the Social Services Division also is an intake location for families and individuals experiencing homelessness. 
The division is a one-by-one -one coordinated intake access point. This is a system that has been created to identify eligible resources and connect clients with the appropriate assistance regarding their situation. Outside of their daily operations, the Social Services Division hosts events in the community designed to further connect the public with area resources. Every April, the Division works with the Healthy Start of Sarasota County to host a community baby shower and preschool expo. This event features businesses and community agencies that offer information and services for parents of both toddlers and newborns. The Division also hosts a back-to-school resource fair every August to provide school-aged children supplemental school supplies and backpacks. The fair features exhibitors that provide services for parents with school-aged children. During the holidays, Social Services hosts an annual Home for the Holidays program. This program has two parts, a senior giving tree and adopt and shop. In both cases, seniors and parents register with social services and are adopted by individuals, businesses, and organizations who help provide a holiday experience. Many city departments will adopt families or seniors through this program. Ask your supervisor how you can get involved. There are many other ways that you can help through the social services division. City employees are invited to volunteer time or donate resources. Donations can come in the form of gift cards to gas stations or grocery stores. Monetary donations are also accepted. The Social Services Division and Northport Utilities work together to offer an H2O program in which monetary donations are used to assist Northport households to pay their Northport Utilities bills. Social Services also works with Parks and Recreation to facilitate a youth scholarship program so that our local youth can participate in programs offered by the Parks and Recreation Department. The Social Services Division makes a difference in the lives of Northport residents every day through the services that they provide. If you or someone you know are in a short-term crisis and need assistance, contact the Social Services Division. They are here to help. The Utilities Department is in charge of all water and wastewater services for the City of Northport. We currently serve 17,000 sewer customers and 22,000 water customers throughout the city. The utilities is comprised of five different divisions. We have our Administration Division, Engineering, Field Operations, our Water Treatment Plant, and our Wastewater Plant. Our administration division has two locations. One is the admin office and field office over on West Price Boulevard next to the high school. Or the other office is our cashiering and customer care office and that is located on the first floor of City Hall. Our engineering division, they oversee all of the utilities projects, uh, new development going in, infrastructure inspections, everything that the city has in the ground has to be located for new construction. Also in the field office on Price Boulevard is our field operations division. They are in charge of maintaining everything out in the distribution and the collection system. They're the ones that do all the new service installations. Anytime there is a break or a repair, they're the ones that respond to that. And we have field operations staff um, available and on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our meter readers are part of our field operations division and those meter readers read every single one of our 22,000 water meters every single month. Our wastewater treatment plant is located on Pan American Boulevard and that plant basically treats all wastewater, sewer water throughout the city. And what we do there is we take all that incoming sewage and we treat it to uh, produce reclaimed water. The reclaimed water is pumped out to several parks, city facilities, commercial customers, golf courses and used for irrigation so that way potable water is not used for those purposes. Our Mayakachi Creek water treatment plant is located on Northport Boulevard next to the skate park and that facility is a conventional B class surface water plant that also has a reverse osmosis treatment plant on the same site. Utilities is largely on the front lines when, when anything's happening within the city if it's an emergency situation, it's generally 
utilities that are right in the thick of things, right behind fire. We provide a lot of support to fire. And in instances like Hurricane Irma, as soon as the roads were clear, utilities was right in the thick of things, making sure that we had sanitary sewer and water to be provided to our citizens in their time of need. My name is Dominic Caravella. I'm actually the chief mechanic for the city of Northport for uh, fleet. Well, we do every vehicle that the city owns. We do the entire city. So that includes your PD, fire, um, sanitation, public works, your building department, landscaping, because we do, you know, lawnmowers as small as that all the way on up. Anything the city owns that has a motor on it, we do it here. I oversee the work out here in the shop. I just make sure it's flowing. If somebody has a, a problem, or if they're running into something they're not familiar with, uh, then the two of us would get together and try and figure it out and do the best we can and, and get it up and going. I started out when I was young, went to a trade school, graduated from there, and started off um, doing oil changes and things. Well, I was always interested in transmissions and I became a transmission mechanic for many years. I came down here, I used to vacation down here. My mother-in-law lived here, my in-laws. And uh, when we used to come down on vacation for two weeks, I sort of liked the area. I've got three kids. My daughter is a high school teacher at the high school here in Northport. My son's a, an officer for, for Northport. My wife works for Northport, and I work for Northport. <laughs> and my youngest daughter is uh, in nursing program. She's doing nursing. I got two pieces of fire equipment in here. Now, if we don't repair them or this or that, the fire departments without that equipment, so they can't service the general public. We have to get that thing running, get it fixed best we can, get it back to them, and then they put it in service for the public. It's incredibly important. I mean, all right, we'll take, for instance, that rescue, all right? We're gonna fix that rescue, we're gonna do what we can, right? You call, that rescue comes to your house, boom, somebody's having a heart attack. They throw them in that rescue, they take it. It better make it from point A to point B, so I have to make sure that everything is running as best as it possibly can. That's, that's the matter of life and death. Same thing with a, you know, an officer of the law. If that guy is running, he has to be able to hop in that car. He relies on that thing to start, drive, and perform like he wants it to. My job to keep it working that way so he can do his job. I can't speak for everybody in here. For me, it's the reward of knowing that that vehicle is repaired it's back out there in the field, it's doing its job, that man's doing his job, so I feel like I did my job. It's just the gratification of doing the repair. I love my job. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, we have a hydraulic leak, so I gotta change a hydraulic line from the um, tank all the way up to the main control. So we gotta take it off, I gotta get a hand. Steve, can you grab one of them pans from over there, please? One of them drain pans? Thank you. We'll be making a hydraulic hose uh, on our hydraulic machine. Let me get the operator to get his lunch bucket out of there. I need you to get your lunch bucket. I gotta lift the cab. I gotta get in the back, if you can. We got his, one of his main feed hydraulic hoses. What happened to it? Uh, it blew out. It actually had a hole in it and it was leaking. We're gonna make one right now. I'll show you how we do that. It, where it goes through the clamps, a lot of times it'll rub and it rubbed through. So we get, we get a uh, leak from it. So we're just gonna replace the whole thing and we make them here. Uh, we have all the dies. So I just got to get the fittings from the parts department and we're just going to make it. So we generate work orders and then they issue all the parts for the vehicle to be repaired and it basically goes on this work order. Um, 
I'm gonna need some hydraulic fittings. Some, okay. um, I'm making a hydraulic hose. Okay, how many do you need? Uh, two. You um, wanna get those first and then we'll, you want me to look first? Yeah, let's see if that is the size. I, I believe it's 16 by 16, but I could be wrong. A part of this job is um, taking care of, you know, roadside assistance, whether it be a hydraulic line, flat tire, dead battery, uh, anything along those lines. Or sometimes the vehicles, the guys will get in them at the end to come in and they don't want to start. So the heavy equipment operator now is calling, hey, my vehicle don't start. So we have to send a guy out, either throw a battery in or check out why it's not, you know, why it won't run. It's not only a physical thing, it's a thinking thing. You know, you got to be able to think these things through. Especially if you're on a call out and you're out in the field, now there's, you know, I mean, yeah, they can touch base, you can call in and, and get assistance, but a lot of times you got to be able to, you know, you got to think on your feet, as they would say. That's the first step. Here comes my parts guy with my fittings. Thank you, Mike. You put the fitting on the end. 3.1. It could take some time. It depends on, um, you know, like right here we're dealing with one inch line, but if you were to deal with bigger size line, uh, it could take some time. Usually it takes about 20 minutes, a half hour, you know, give or take. That's, that's removing the part, making the line, and possibly putting it back on. And that's what it looks like. That's finished product. That's finished product. A lot of times I like to add sleeve. What this is, if that line should ever blow out and get a hy uh, hydraulic leak, this restricts it. So instead of spraying, it's just going to ooze out of this, this outer liner. Okay. So it's, it's a protective casing for the operator and whoever is nearby when it actually springs a leak. I said, if you're not a good climber, it's hard to get in some of these spots. We're testing the hose that I made, the hydraulic hose, making sure it isn't leaking, and uh, all the functions on the truck work properly. When you get a chance and you build up air pressure, can you move it ahead some? When you run the can, because over there we got a... Okay, you're clear. Have a good day. That's how you do a hydraulic line. Our mission statement is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, and professional manner. All of our line personnel are highly trained, state of Florida certified firefighter, EMTs, and paramedics. We cover approximately 105 square miles of the city of Northport and 20 miles of interstate. Camaraderie is important because you start working as a group, you do it in training, and it all seems to come together when you get out on the fire ground and you really need your partners. Everybody knows never to leave your partner and they don't, it's been, they've been trained in it. We have five fire stations located throughout the city in various locations and uh, we are planning number six in West Village's area. We also have all of our fire stations are considered safe places and safe havens. Safe places are for youth who are at risk and are in need of help and they can come walk into any fire station and get the help that they're looking for. Safe havens for newborns is a different program, different age group where infants can be brought to a fire station without question. All of our fire stations now are hardened facilities so that we can stay in them during storms and everyone stays safe. So police departments is in there, utilities, public works, whoever we need to go out immediately after the storm then they're there with us to go. A lot of questions that people ask are why we send an ambulance and a fire truck to an EMS call and a lot of that is for manpower. 
there's a lot of things to do when somebody is having a cardiac incident. So we send the fire truck with them for the extra manpower and lifting assistance and extra help. The whole goal for fire rescue is everybody goes home safe. Frank Lamas, Solid Waste Manager for the City of Northport, back here again today with Let's Recycle Right Northport. Got a few items for you today. Last week, we did notice in the tan lid container, shredded paper put in a plastic bag. Please, shredded paper does not belong in a plastic bag, okay? It belongs right here in a paper bag, please. And it belongs in a tan lid container. This right here, being in plastic, will be considered contamination and garbage. Let's talk about a candle, a glass candle. Yes, it is made of glass, but it is not recyclable right here in Northport. That's right, only glass jars and glass bottles are recyclable in the blue lid container. Let's also talk about the milk jug, water jug, number two. Definitely recyclable, right? Here's the cap. If the cap is not attached, it will be garbage. So, if you crush it down, Put the cap on real nice and tight. This will make it through the process. This will be a number two. Okay, so let's talk about the plastic ring. That's right, the plastic ring. This is a 12 holder. They have six, six holders out there. Please, this is not a recyclable material and needs to be placed inside your trash. So listen, put your comments below. We'll see you in a future video. makes me feel important that I'm doing something for the community. I like helping people and I love the work. We got 2.8 inches of rain last night. How I approach it is I got to release some of that water out that we got and get prepared for the next day because you know it's going to rain again. It's like I've been draining these for the last two weeks between 16 and 20 inches every day below the wall. And that one little rain, look what it did. For being here so long, you get experience, you get the feel of the water, how the water flows and all that. So if you've done it long enough, you get the feel. I could do this in my sleep because I'm so used to doing it. Yeah, I've been working for the city for 20 years. I'm from North Hills, Pennsylvania. I came down here to help my dad out when I graduated from high school. I started looking for like a future place I can work, retirement, and something's gonna be for, helpful for me in the long run and help people out. So I put an application for the city and they hired me, which was good, best thing that could ever happen. The city's got 30 water control structures, five gated structures. I'm opening uh, at least minimum 15 today. I got three kids, three, two boys and a daughter. And my oldest son gave me my first grandkid. He's, he'll be three. So I spent a lot of time with them. Because family's first. Oh, I'm a real sports fanatic, big hockey fan. Yeah, I was hoping my Penguins would win it this year, but I can't complain. They won the last two years. <laughs> you can't win it all the time. Yesterday was 16 inches below. It's 10 inches above today. 
So what I'm doing here now is when I open this one up, so how high it is, I'm draining it down. By the end of the day, this should be like 16 inches below the wall. And there's a hard ditch, ditch here, and there's like outfalls that come in. But once you get to a certain level, you'll see the water coming into the canals. And then when I get done, I gotta log it on the computer. What I do is I write the time I was here, when I inspected it, what I did, the water level, and the height. This was like 20.4 20 this morning, and it's almost up to 21. Plus, the water that I'm bringing down raised it a little bit, but you see how it's pushing the water over fast? Each one controls a gate. If you put on auto, it works on the computer. And then manual, this is for gate two. If I wanted to close it, I hit the blue button, I hold it in until the gates get completely closed. If I want to open, I do the vice versa, the other opposite. And there's one for each one. Oh, I love my job. I get to work with good people and we can in enjoy what we're doing when we're at work. That's how I was brought up by my dad. He was real caring about his work and so was I. So like I take I take it do I do take it home. I look at the weather and everything, so I look at the bridge reading and all that. And that should be it. I'll just come back and clean them off. Building Division is responsible for making sure that all the codes that the state has adopted in construction is adhered to. And basically what we do is we look at, we go and do our plan reviews when the customer brings a set of plans in that they want to construct a commercial project or a residential project. We'll review the plans to make sure that they comply with all amenable codes that the state has adopted. After we issue the permit, then we'll go out and do all the inspections and make sure that they are constructed according to the plans. We're responsible for the uh, safe construction of all these buildings and we look at all aspects of the construction from footings, foundations, uh, block walls, to roof construction, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, in both commercial and residential. So when we have a commercial project that comes in, we're looking at all aspects of that to make sure that it is a safe environment to, and it would have to be designed to withstand the 160 mile an hour wind criteria that the state has mandated that we look at. Our job is life safety, is to making sure that the building is constructed in a safe manner that it will stand the hurricane's design wind loads that we have down here. And uh, that's what our job is, is to make sure people are safe in their building, that they can walk into their building knowing that Northport has done the best possible job we can to make sure that their, their building is constructed in a manner that they feel safe in, they can go home in. The Planning and Zoning Division is responsible for all development management of the City of Northport, large-scale commercial developments, residential developments. The City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division is divided into two separate uh, sections. One is the Strategic Planning Group and the other is the Tactical Planning Group. The strategic planning group is responsible for development management through the preparing and updating of our comprehensive plan, its amendments, all the annexations, and reviewing development of regional impacts and zoning applications. The strategic planning group is also responsible for updating our demographics, population projections, and land use data through GIS, and also maintain our land use and zoning maps. The tactical side of the office is responsible for maintaining the Unified Land Development Code, ensuring all development proposals that are submitted to the city are consistent and in compliance with ULDC, all of our master plans, our pattern books, zoning requirements, and the city's comprehensive plan. Tactical operations also helps coordinate all development proposals through the city departments, the division, and external agencies through our staff development review process managing development's appearance, their architecture, traffic impacts, fiscal impacts, compliance to signage, landscape, and other development management requirements. 
We work closely with utilities, buildings, and public works. We also manage the environmental compliance issues on site development. The Property Standards Division is what's otherwise known as code enforcement in other municipalities. We are located on the first floor of City Hall. Our job is to assure the health, safety, and welfare of our residents and assist in maintaining the community standards. We enforce the Unified Land Development Code, the Northport City Code, and the Florida Building Code. Northport City Code would be like grass and weeds. That's one of our major violations, especially in the summer. A uh, Unified Land Development Code would be like the number of vehicles on a property. Uh, Florida Building Code would be someone building something like a shed or something like that on the property without a permit. The purpose of code enforcement is to make sure that everything's safe in the communities, to make sure that everything's being built properly with the proper permits, to make sure that basically everything looks nice. If someone has an issue with a neighbor or a house that they drive by, they do have the option to contact property standards through phone, fax, or our North Report. What's it like? Undescribable. Um, the only word I was using is Armageddon, um, sheer loss, destruction, um, not just wood frame homes. These are concrete structures that are destroyed. Just the compassion that I am thankful that as a crew in, in Northport, we could give them. I mean, if we weren't putting out fires or if we weren't um, finding people to save, it was simply giving them a hug. Um, helping them get some of the furniture out of their house, assisting them with a ladder to the second story because maybe the stairs were wiped out, uh, climbing up in there and, and getting that little piece of home that they wanted back so badly and able to give it to them, and then just listen to their story and, and, their, and, and hear their, about their loss. Personal safety for my family, I will not ride out a storm again. I will not take that chance. Um, if I see it coming up the Gulf towards our city, uh, my family's gonna get out. Getting home is unbelievable. So thankful to be home, that my family is safe, to be back here, where this, this simple creature comforts are back at home to have those things back and normal meals. Unbelievable what we saw there, the loss that we saw there and destruction there. Frank Lamas, Always Manager for the City of Northport. Uh, we're here today to talk about three recycling tips. The first one is plastic bags. Now, plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So let's talk about some of the plastic bags. Grocery bags, okay, they're very important. We see them inside the blue lid container quite often. They need to be returned back to the grocery stores. And that would be your Publix, your Walmarts, your Targets. Please return them back there. Do not place recyclable uh, items inside these bags, tie them, and place them in the blue lid tote. If it goes down to the processor, it is called contaminant. It's contaminated and they will not accept it. So please, keep the grocery bags outside. Now remember, it's not just grocery bags. Okay, we're talking about bread bags, lunch bags, 
uh, big plastic garbage bags that fill the recyclables. And we have one right here to show you. And I'll go ahead and show you. This is what we find out there. This right here is contaminated. All this clean recyclable is contaminated because it's inside a plastic bag. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. Plastic bags are not accepted within our recycling program. So thank you very much for watching this video. Please, if you have any questions about recycling materials or how to recycle, place it in the comment below and we will try to get to you in a future video. Frank Lamas, always manager for the city of Northport, back here again today with you for Let's Recycle Right Northport. So, a couple of things. We have an aluminum can and a straw. Now the aluminum can right here, 500 million are consumed each day. This is the most valuable recycling item you can see out there in the world today. Let's talk about the plastic straw, okay? The plastic straw, 500 million are used each day. This is not a recyclable item right here in Northport. That's right, even though it's plastic, don't let it fool you. Just because it's plastic, it is not a recyclable material right here inside our program. Now the aluminum can, yes, that is a recyclable item right here in Northport. And Lana, thank you very much for your comment and question. And the question was about plastic bags, uh, water bags, salt bags. These are not a recyclable item right here in Northport. These belong in your trash, please. They belong in the trash, they do not belong in the blue lid container. Bleach bottles, that's right, bleach bottles are a recyclable material right here in Northport, a number two. They belong in the blue lid container. The only thing you'll have to do is make sure they're empty, clean, and dry. If you have any more of the questions or comments, please place them below and we'll get to you in the next video. Thank you very much. What makes this place so special is, is the people. Um, the, the community who you serve and the people who you work with. Our mission statement is to provide the community with the elite law enforcement services out there with the highest priority being the protection of life and property. We work 24-7, holidays, you know, there's no time off. Uh, our agency is rapidly growing. We have a, um, a detective bureau, we have a traffic unit, uh, we have a full crime scene unit. Northport PD is an accredited agency. Actually, we're double Excelsior accredited, which is we are one of 14, I believe, other agencies in the state of Florida that have reached that double Excelsior accredited. It's a very prestigious uh, accomplishment to have. Most of the people only see uh, the police officers in uniforms out there doing the day-to-day -day tasks, but they can't do that alone. In the background, what people don't see a lot is the support staff here at Northport Police Department. We go from very high density areas to very rural areas uh, throughout the city. The challenge that Northport Police Department is facing right now is the rapid growth in the city of Northport um, and trying to keep up with those levels of service. Law enforcement officers wear many different hats, um, but at the end of the day, it's their, their problem solvers. Um, they're there for you 24-7, uh, and the, their, their importance of all of our officers that we stress to is to go home safe at night.
The Administration Division of Public Works does a variety of different tasks. Uh, the main one is our Customer Service Division. They answer several hundred phone calls a day, ranging from solid waste questions to uh, water drainage questions on a day like today. Also, we have a uh, budget finance administration division that handles accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable, and budget. The Northport Public Works Department also has a technical section that handles GIS, mapping, and um, also our work order system. The engineering division, we analyze any drainage issues that the city might have, water control structures. We're also in charge of all the roadways. The roadways include design for multi-use trails, sidewalks. The city has been experiencing tremendous growth. The biggest project that we have right now is called the Price Boulevard Whitening. That road is a two-lane road. Capacity for that two-lane road is about 17,000 vehicles per day. Uh, our latest numbers for that show that currently there are 21,700 vehicles traveling every day, meaning it's way over capacity. Engineering also is in charge of uh, revising new development. When uh, a new gas station comes, uh, a new hotel or building, they submit plans to us. So it's our responsibility to check that they comply with water treatment the drainage that they got to design the pond and the piping and everything is per code and standards. I have one professional engineer that takes care of all the uh, roadway design. Then I have a stormwater manager. And then we have a group of inspectors. They inspect uh, when there's a new house being built, they got to inspect the, the driveway, the culvert pipe, and making sure that it's set up at the right elevation to provide positive flow. They also inspect the roadways on the, through the road bond. They inspect uh, to see that the correct thickness of pavement is being applied. Also, the water control structure, when it gets into construction, we have our own inspector that go and make sure that the project is being built per the plans and specifications. Fleet Division, we have uh, over 600 vehicles and equipment that we maintain. I've got seven mechanics, shop supervisor, two staff assistants, and a fleet asset technician that um, we do everything from cradle to grave for all of our vehicles and uh, equipment. So we order the equipment, maintain the equipment, and ultimately dispose of the equipment. We do everything from weed eaters to all the way to airboats to solid waste vehicles, grapple trucks, uh, solid waste trucks, fire, fire engines, ambulances, police cars, the entire fleet of the city. Well, we're able to maintain all of our own vehicles. That's the biggest thing. So all of our mechanics have a relationship, if you will, with these vehicles. They know the, in, the nuances of all the vehicles. Uh, it makes it easy for our departments to come and see us. We, we, you know, we're an on-site facility for them, so they don't, they don't necessarily have to schedule safety-related issues. They can come directly to us. Um, the city fleet maintenance also carries 44,000 gallons of fuel that we maintain our vehicles with as well got over 200 years of mechanics experience among them so we've got gentlemen who have been here for over 30 years and we've got guys who have been here for just over a year. Public Works Operations Department currently has 71 employees. Of that 71 employees were divided into two sections which is roadway and drainage. Our roadway section takes care of the over 800 miles of roadway and of striping, pothole repairs, all of that is handled by the road section. In the roadway section, we, we maintain all of the street signs, uh, install, replace, we maintain all of the traffic signals. We have 19 traffic signals that we maintain in the city, as well as mowing all the right-of-ways, the vertical mowing to push back the uh, impinging vegetation out of the right-of-ways. In that division, we also have the waterway crew that handles all of our aquatic spraying. We have two crews that go out in airboats that spray those waterways to keep the vegetation down. We also have crews that operate all our water control structures. We have 23 gated water control structures that facilitate the movement of the stormwater through the city during storm events uh, and even just our typical rainy season. Then we have our drainage section. It maintains all of our roadside swales, our retention ditches, and all of our pipe installs, our catch basin installs, 
Uh, anything that, that has to do with getting the water from the properties or the roadways into the secondary drainage, which is our retention ditches, and into our canals. Our mission is to ensure the safety and health of our citizens through the proper and efficient collection and disposal of all solid waste. We collect uh, over 30,000 residents here in the city. Garbage, garbage bulk, yard waste, uh, yard waste bulk, uh, recycling, also metal. This year we're probably going to do about 600 tons more of recyclable material over the last year. So that's pretty awesome. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, myself, I've been here 18 years. And when I first started here at the Solid Waste Division, there was only about 15 people. And right now, we have grown, as the city grows, so have we, uh, we're up to 39 people and employees. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We also collect from our commercial accounts. We collect dumpsters and roll offs and from businesses and organizations, and it's starting to really pick up also. Uh, we have about three, over 350 accounts right now, and some of those accounts go maybe three, four, five times a week. Uh, we get 3,300 service requests a month for bulk of garbage and collection. We have some good, good people that work here, so really care about the community. Remember, if you have any questions at any time, you can always just give us a call at 941-240-8050. Give us a call, customer service. They'll gladly help you with any questions. Many times, Crisis can't be avoided. A family's car will accidentally break down while their electric bill is due. A health emergency will arise just as it's time to pay the rent. It's a reality that so many people face. What makes the City of Northport unique is that it offers a way to help. The City of Northport Social Services Division connects the public with valuable resources to improve their overall quality of life, especially in unexpected times of hardship. As part of the city manager's office, the social services division's mission is to ensure the availability, awareness, and accessibility of programs and resources in the community, and to assist families and individuals while improving their overall quality of life. With five staff members, including a manager, two full-time caseworkers, a staff assistant one, and a staff assistant two, the social services division assists Northport households experiencing a short-term, unavoidable crisis with financial assistance. Staff can assist with rent or mortgage, utilities, and more. In addition, staff will connect families and individuals with available community resources. The Social Services Division also oversees the City of Northport's Family Service Center and the Community Education Center, located on Pan American Boulevard. Both the Family Service Center and the Community Education Center house a variety of nonprofit and government agencies that provide aid to residents. Located on a campus that includes the Sarasota County Health Department and Children's First, this one-stop location offers a variety of resources that residents would otherwise have to travel outside the city to access. The offices of the Social Services Division are busy. Every Monday morning, Northport residents visit the Social Services Division for what is known as pre-screen Mondays. Clients can meet with a caseworker who gathers basic information about their current situation. From there, referrals and appointments are made to further assist the Northport household. In addition to assisting with rent, mortgage, or utilities, the Social Services Division also is an intake location for families and individuals experiencing homelessness. The division is a one-by-one -one coordinated intake access point. This is a system that has been created to identify eligible resources and connect clients with the appropriate assistance regarding their situation. Outside of their daily operations, the Social Services Division hosts events in the community designed to further connect the public with area resources. Every April, the division works with the Healthy Start of Sarasota County to host a community baby shower and preschool expo. This event features businesses and community agencies that offer information and services for parents of both toddlers and newborns. The division also hosts a back to school resource fair every August to provide school aged children supplemental school supplies and backpacks. The fair features exhibitors that provide services for parents with school-aged children. 
During the holidays, Social Services hosts an annual Home for the Holidays program. This program has two parts, a senior giving tree and adopt and shop. In both cases, seniors and parents register with social services and are adopted by individuals, businesses, and organizations who help provide a holiday experience. Many city departments will adopt families or seniors through this program. Ask your supervisor how you can get involved. There are many other ways that you can help through the social services division. City employees are invited to volunteer time or donate resources. Donations can come in the form of gift cards to gas stations or grocery stores. Monetary donations are also accepted. The Social Services Division and Northport Utilities work together to offer an H2O program in which monetary donations are used to assist Northport households to pay their Northport Utilities bills. Social Services also works with Parks and Recreation to facilitate a youth scholarship program so that our local youth can participate in programs offered by the Parks and Recreation Department. The Social Services Division makes a difference in the lives of Northport residents every day through the services that they provide. If you or someone you know are in a short-term crisis and need assistance, contact the Social Services Division. They are here to help. The Utilities Department is in charge of all water and wastewater services for the City of Northport. We currently serve 17,000 sewer customers and 22,000 water customers throughout the city. Utilities is comprised of five different divisions. We have our administration division, engineering, field operations, our water treatment plant, and our wastewater plant. Our administration division has two locations. One is the admin office and field office over on West Price Boulevard next to the high school. Or the other office is our cashiering and customer care office, and that is located on the first floor of City Hall. Our engineering division, they oversee all of the utilities projects, uh, new development going in, infrastructure inspections, everything that the city has in the ground has to be located for new construction. Also in the field office on Price Boulevard is our field operations division. They are in charge of maintaining everything out in the distribution and the collection system. They're the ones that do all the new service installations. Anytime there is a break or a repair, they're the ones that respond to that. And we have field operations staff um, available and on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our meter readers are part of our field operations division and those meter readers read every single one of our 22,000 water meters every single month. Our wastewater treatment plant is located on Pan American Boulevard and that plant basically treats all wastewater, sewer water throughout the city. And what we do there is we take all that incoming sewage and we treat it to uh, produce reclaimed water. The reclaimed water is pumped out to several parks, city facilities, commercial customers, uh, golf courses, and used for irrigation. So that way potable water is not used for those purposes. Our Mayakachi Creek water treatment plant is located on Northport Boulevard next to the skate park. And that facility is a conventional B class surface water plant that also has a reverse osmosis treatment plant on the same site. Utilities is largely on the front lines whenever, when anything's happening within the city. If it's an emergency situation, it's generally utilities that are right in the thick of things, right behind fire. We provide a lot of support to fire. And in instances like Hurricane Irma, as soon as the roads were clear, utilities was right in the thick of things, making sure that we had sanitary sewer and water to be provided to our citizens in their time of need. My name is Dominic Caravella. I'm actually the chief mechanic for the city of Northport for uh, fleet. Well, we do every vehicle that the city owns. We do the entire city. So that includes your PD, fire, um, sanitation, public works, your building department, landscaping, because we do, you know, lawnmowers as small as that all the way on up. Anything the city owns that has a motor on it, we do it here. 
I oversee the work out here in the shop. I just make sure it's flowing. If somebody has a, a problem or if they're running into something they're not familiar with, uh, then the two of us would get together and try and figure it out and do the best we can and, and get it up and going. I started out when I was young, went to a trade school, graduated from there, and started off um, doing oil changes and things. Well, I was always interested in transmissions and I became a transmission mechanic for many years. I came down here, I used to vacation down here. My mother-in-law lived here, my in-laws. And uh, when we used to come down and vacation for two weeks, I sort of liked the area. I've got three kids. My daughter is a high school teacher at the high school here in Northport. My son's a, an officer for, for Northport. My wife works for Northport, and I work for Northport. <laughs> and my youngest daughter is uh, in nursing program. She's doing nursing. I got two pieces of fire equipment in here. Now, if we don't repair them or this or that, the fire department's without that equipment, so they can't service the general public. We have to get that thing running, get it fixed best we can, get it back to them, and then they put it in service for the public. It's incredibly important. I mean, all right, we'll take, for instance, that rescue, all right? We're gonna fix that rescue, we're gonna do what we can, right? You call, that rescue comes to your house, boom, somebody's having a heart attack. They throw them in that rescue, they take it. It better make it from point A to point B. So I have to make sure that everything is running as best as it possibly can. That's, that's the matter of life and death. Same thing with a, you know, an officer of the law. If that guy is running, he has to be able to hop in that car. He relies on that thing to start, drive, and perform like he wants it to. My job to keep it working that way so he can do his job. I can't speak for everybody in here. For me, it's a reward of knowing that that vehicle is repaired, it's back out there in the field, it's doing its job, that man's doing his job, so I feel like I did my job. It's just a gratification of doing the repair. I love my job. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I can't see myself doing anything else. Um, we have a hydraulic leak, so I gotta change a hydraulic line from the um, tank all the way up to the main control. So we gotta take it off, I gotta get a hand. Steve, can you grab one of them pans from over there, please? One of them drain pans? Thank you. We'll be making a hydraulic hose uh, on our hydraulic machine. Let me get the operator to get his lunch bucket out of there. I need you to get your lunch bucket. I gotta lift the cab. I gotta get in the back, if you can. We got his, one of his main feed hydraulic hoses. What happened to it? Uh, it blew out. It actually had a hole in it and it was leaking. We're gonna make one right now. I'll show you how we do that. Where it goes through the clamps, a lot of times it'll rub and it rubbed through. So we get, we get a uh, leak from it. So we're just gonna replace the whole thing and we make them here. Uh, we have all the dies. So I just got to get the fittings from the parts department and we're just going to make it. So we generate work orders and then they issue all the parts for the vehicle to be repaired and it basically goes on this work order. Um, I'm going to need some hydraulic fittings. Some, um, I'm making a hydraulic hose. Okay, how many do you need? Uh, two. Um, you want to get those first, and then we'll, or you want me to look first? Yeah, let's see if that is the size. I, I believe it's 16 by 16, but I could be wrong. A part of this job is um, taking care of, you know, roadside assistance, whether it be a hydraulic line, flat tire, dead battery, uh, anything along those lines. Or sometimes the vehicles, the guys will get in them at the end to come in, yep. and they don't want to start. So the heavy equipment operator now is calling, hey, my vehicle don't start. So we have to send a guy out, either throw a battery in or check out why it's not, you know, why it won't run. It's not only a physical thing, it's a thinking thing. You know, you got to be able to think these things through. Um, especially if you're on a call out and you're out in the field. Now there's, you know, I mean, yeah, they can touch base, you can call in and, and get assistance. 
but a lot of times you got to be able to, you know, you got to think on your feet, as they would say. That's the first step. Here comes my parts guy with my fittings. Thank you, Mike. You put the fitting on the end. 3.1. It could take some time. It depends on, um, you know, like right here we're dealing with one inch line, but if you were to deal with bigger size line, uh, it could take some time. Usually it takes about 20 minutes, a half hour. You know, give or take. That's that's removing the part, making the line, and possibly putting it back on. And that's what it looks like. That's finished product. That's finished product. A lot of times, I like to add sleeve. What this is, if that line should ever blow out and get a hy uh, hydraulic leak, this restricts it. So instead of spraying, it's just going to ooze out of this this outer liner. So it's, it's a protective casing for the operator and whoever is nearby when it actually springs a leak. I said if you're not a good climber, it's hard to get in some of these spots. We're testing the hose that I made, the hydraulic hose, making sure it isn't leaking and uh, all the functions on the truck work properly. When you get a chance and you build up air pressure, could you move it ahead some? When you run the can, because over there we got a... Okay, you're clear. Have a good day. That's how you do a hydraulic line. Our mission statement is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, and professional manner. All of our line personnel are highly trained, state of Florida certified firefighter, EMTs, and paramedics. We cover approximately 105 square miles of the city of Northport and 20 miles of interstate. Camaraderie is important because you start working as a group, you do it in training, and it all seems to come together when you get out on the fire ground and you really need your partners. Everybody knows never to leave your partner and they don't, it's been, they've been trained in it. We have five fire stations located throughout the city in various locations, and uh, we are planning number six in West Village's area. We also have all of our fire stations are considered safe places and safe havens. Safe places are for youth who are at risk and are in need of help, and they can come walk into any fire station and get the help that they're looking for. Safe havens for newborns is a different program, different age group where infants can be brought to a fire station without question. All of our fire stations now are hardened facilities so that we can stay in them during storms and everyone stays safe. So police departments is in there, utilities, public works, whoever we need to go out immediately after the storm, then they're there with us to go. A lot of questions that people ask are why we send an ambulance and a fire truck to an EMS call and a lot of that is for manpower. There's a lot of things to do when somebody is having a cardiac incident. So we send the fire truck with them for the extra manpower and lifting assistance and extra help. The whole goal for fire rescue is everybody goes home safe. Frank Lamas, Solid Waste Manager for the City of Northport, back here again today with Let's Recycle Right Northport. Got a few items for you today. Last week, we did notice in the tan lid container, shredded paper put in a plastic bag. Please, shredded paper does not belong in a plastic bag, okay? It belongs right here in a paper bag, please. And it belongs in a tan lid container. This right here, being in plastic, will be considered contamination and garbage. Let's talk about a candle, a glass candle. Yes, it is made of glass, 
but it is not recyclable right here in Northport. That's right, only glass jars and glass bottles are recyclable in the blue lid container. Let's also talk about the milk jug, water jug, number two, definitely recyclable, right? Here's the cap. If the cap is not attached, it will be garbage. So if you crush it down, put the cap on real nice and tight, this will make it to the process. This will be a number two. Okay, so let's talk about the plastic ring. That's right, the plastic ring. This is a 12 holder. They have six, six holders out there. Please, this is not a recyclable material and needs to be placed inside your trash. So listen, put your comments below. We'll see you in a future video. makes me feel important that I'm doing something for the community. I like helping people and I love the work. We got 2.8 inches of rain last night. How I approach it is I got to release some of that water out that we got to get prepared for the next day because you know it's going to rain again. It's like I've been draining these for the last two weeks between 16 and 20 inches every day below the wall. And that one little rain, look what it did. For being here so long, you get experience, you get the feel of the water, how the water flows and all that. So if you've done it long enough, you get the feel. I could do this in my sleep because I'm so used to doing it. Yeah, I've been working for the city for 20 years. I'm from North Hills, Pennsylvania. I came down here to help my dad out when I graduated from high school. I started looking for like a future place I can work, retirement, and something's gonna be for, helpful for me in the long run and help people out. So I put an application for the city and they hired me, which was good, best thing that could ever happen. The city's got 30 water control structures, five gated structures. I'm opening uh, at least minimum 15 today. I got three kids, three, two boys and a daughter. And my oldest son gave me my first grandkid. He's, he'll be three. So I spent a lot of time with them. Because family's first. Oh, I'm a real sports fanatic, big hockey fan. Yeah, I was hoping my Penguins would win it this year, but I can't complain. They won the last two years. <laughs> you can't win it all the time. Yesterday was 16 inches below. It's 10 inches above today. So what I'm doing here now is when I open this one up, so how high it is, I'm draining it down. By the end of the day, this should be like 16 inches below the wall. And there's a R ditch, an R ditch here, and there's like outfalls that come in. But once you get to a certain level, you'll see the water coming into the canals. And then when I get done, I gotta log it on the computer. What I do is I write the time I was here, when I inspected it, what I did, the water level, and the height. This was like 20.4 this morning, and it's almost up to 21. Plus, the water that I'm bringing down raised it a little bit, but you see how it's pushing the water over fast? Each one controls a gate. If you put it on auto, it works on the computer. 
and then manual, this is for gate two. If I wanted to close it, I hit the blue button, I hold it in until the gates get completely closed. Okay. If I want to open it, I do the vice versa, the other opposite. And there's one for each one. Oh, I love my job. I get to work with good people. And we can in, enjoy what we're doing when we're at work. That's how I was brought up by my dad. He was real caring about his work, and so was I. So, like, I take, I take it, I do take it home. I look at the weather and everything. So, I look at the bridge reading and all that. And that should be it. I'll just come back and clean them off. Building Division is responsible for making sure that all the codes that the state has adopted in construction is adhered to. And basically what we do is we look at, we go and do our plan reviews when the customer brings a set of plans in that they want to construct a commercial project or a residential project. We'll review the plans to make sure that they comply with all amenable codes that the state has adopted. After we issue the permit, then we'll go out and do all the inspections and make sure that they are constructed according to the plans. We're responsible for the uh, safe construction of all these buildings and we look at all aspects of the construction from footings, foundations, uh, block walls, to roof construction, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, in both commercial and residential. So when we have a commercial project that comes in, we're looking at all aspects of that to make sure that it is a safe environment too. And it would have to be designed to withstand the 160 mile an hour wind criteria that the state has mandated that we look at. Our job is life safety, just making sure that the building is constructed in a safe manner that it will stand the hurricane's design wind loads that we have down here. And uh, that's what our job is, is to make sure people are safe in their building, that they can walk into their building knowing that Northport has done the best possible job we can to make sure that their, con their building is constructed in a manner that they feel safe in, they can go home in. The Planning and Zoning Division is responsible for all development management of the City of Northport, large-scale commercial developments, residential developments. The City of Northport's Planning and Zoning Division is divided into two separate uh, sections. One is the Strategic Planning Group and the other is the Tactical Planning Group. The Strategic Planning Group is responsible for development management through the preparing and updating of our comprehensive plan, its amendments, all the annexations, and reviewing development of regional impacts and zoning applications. The Strategic Planning Group is also responsible for updating our demographics, population projections, and land use data through GIS, and also maintain our land use and zoning maps. The tactical side of the office is responsible for maintaining the Unified Land Development Code, ensuring all development proposals that are submitted to the city are consistent and in compliance with ULDC, all of our master plans, our pattern books, zoning requirements, and the city's comprehensive plan. Tactical operations also helps coordinate all development proposals through the city departments, the division and external agencies through our staff development review process managing development's appearance, their architecture, traffic impacts, fiscal impacts, compliance to signage, landscape, and other development management requirements. We work closely with utilities, buildings, and public works. We also manage the environmental compliance issues on site development. The Property Standards Division is what's otherwise known as code enforcement in other municipalities. We are located on the first floor of City Hall our job is to assure the health, safety, and welfare of our residents and assist in maintaining the community standards. We enforce the Unified Land Development Code, the Northport City Code, and the Florida Building Code. Northport City Code would be like grass and weeds. That's one of our major violations, especially in the summer. Uh, Unified Land Development Code would be like the number of vehicles on a property. Uh, Florida Building Code would be someone building something like a shed or something like that on the property without a permit. 
The purpose of code enforcement is to make sure that everything's safe in the communities, to make sure that everything's being built properly with the proper permits, to make sure that basically everything looks nice. If someone has an issue with a neighbor or a house that they drive by, they do have the option to contact property standards through phone, fax, or on North Report. What's it like? Undescribable. Um, the only word I was using is Armageddon. Um, sheer loss, destruction, um, not just wood frame homes. These are concrete structures that are destroyed. Just the compassion that I am thankful that as a crew in, in Northport, we could give them. I mean, if we weren't putting out fires or if we weren't um, finding people to save, it was simply giving them a hug. Um, helping them get some of the furniture out of their house, assisting them with a ladder to the second story because maybe the stairs were wiped out, uh, climbing up in there and, and getting that little piece of home that they wanted back so badly.
Ms. Heather, are you ready? Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our commission meeting. Today is September 8th. And just for the record, we do have Commissioner Hanks, Vice Mayor Luke, myself, Mayor McDowell, Commissioner Carasone, Commissioner Emmerich um, in attendance. We do have a quorum. We have Acting City Manager Yarborough, our City Attorney, our City Clerk, and our Recording Secretary. We also have uh, Chief Garrison in the back. And we also have, very rarely do I get to do this, but I do have the pleasure of recognizing former Commissioners uh, Mr. Tower and former Commissioner Blucher. They're also in the house along with uh, former Commissioner Morgan. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. A lot of staff and a lot of citizens. Um, before we get started, let's set some ground rules because I know this is a very sensitive subject. Um, City Manager Lear is in the house also. Um, please don't have any sudden outbursts. We're here to conduct business on this sensitive nature. If you're happy about something that's said, clap your fingers like this. If you don't like what's being said, use downs. Do not outburst. Please keep your comments nice and quiet. If you have your cell phone, please make sure it's on silent. So um, at this time, this was my agenda item that I asked to have put on the agenda. And before I turn it over to city attorney or even acting city manager, um, I just want to explain the reason why I put it on the agenda for today. Um, on July 14th, we put the, the commissioners voted to place the city manager on paid leave pending the outcome of the investigation. That took a motion and that took a vote. So now that the investigation is complete, I felt that it would be in everybody's best interest to have a discussion, have a motion, and have a vote on the results of that investigation. Um, commissioners, since this is very sensitive, please wait until I call your name before you speak. We will also have public comment. And I am thinking that as soon as city attorney or acting city manager weigh in, maybe we'll do public comment right away and then get into the meat and potatoes of the meeting. So city attorney, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Introduce the item um, properly. I'm happy to answer any legal questions you have that are related to government. We do have an expanded legal team here today. Our special legal counsel, Suzanne Boy, is here. Ms. Boy is board certified in employment law and works with the firm of Boy Agnew Batonovic. She will be assisting the commission with any questions today that relate to employment law. Thank you, City Attorney. Acting City Manager, did you want to weigh in? No, ma'am, I don't have anything. Thank you very much, Commission. If it'll be all right, do you mind if we do public comment at this point? I think everybody's up to speed as to what we're talking about. Yes? I think we need to, not only that, but we need to determine how, if uh, we're going to allow city manager to participate by either an opening and closing statement or being able to answer questions. In the past, as past practice, when this has come up with city attorney as well as the city clerk, we've allowed them to participate one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but in this case, with a new policy and procedure, we need to make a determination. Is he only going to be limited to the three minutes, like public comment? Will he be able to have some sort of a closing statement, an opening statement? We need to make that determination as well. And I would suggest not only making it very clear that no personal attacks should be made, but that, um, you know, to allow an opening statement, public comment, the presentation and questions, and then a closing statement from Mr. Lear, so that it's very clear and concise. Thank you. Um, my, my comment on that is this is not a hearing. It's not a quasi-judicial. Mm -hmm. It is simply um, coming to the conclusion, finding a conclusion to the investigation. So I don't believe an opening and a closing statement uh, come in. That is why he's allowed a three-minute comment, just like anybody else in this meeting. Uh, if it were a, he a hearing or something that was quasi-judicial, then yes, that would be part of it. Um, but this is just the closing of the investigation that was given to us. And I... I I believe that public comment should be heard. And as far as any opening and closing statements, I think that he was already in, investigated by the investigator, had every chance to say what he needed to say at that time. 
We are here today to determine if he is coming back or not. I, I don't know if an opening or closing argument is going to change what is in this investigation. So if you want to make a motion and we'll vote on it, I think that would be the wisest thing because I'm hearing differing opinions on what we should do. So um, I don't... I think maybe you need to ask the city attorney also as to how uh, this should be conducted because this is a different type of procedure. So how the proceedings that uh, that govern how the commission moves forward on this should be decided by the body by motion. There's nothing specifically legal in place with respect to the proceedings. Uh, I would defer to Ms. Boyd to explain to you a bit about what type of rights the employee may or may not have with respect to today's proceedings. That would be helpful. Thank you. If she would um, please come up and just state your name for the record. Good evening, everybody. Suzanne Boy from Boy Agnew Potonovic. Thank you for having me. Um, I think it is important that the commission set parameters for how the, the meeting is going to go. I also think is it is important to recognize that as vice mayor, I believe, raised, this is not an actual hearing where there's going to be the presentation of testimony, the questioning of witnesses. Um, this is an opportunity for you all as the commission to um, basically decide what impact the investigation is going to have on the city manager's contract. Um, I do think that you certainly get to set those parameters. Um, if you would like to give him an opportunity to speak over and above what he's entitled to as part of public comment, um, I think that's totally within your discretion. Um, but I would recommend that you keep that limited to um, additional statement as opposed to a closing argument, an opening statement, which is more like a formal hearing. Thank you. So, you want me to make a motion? If you would like. Um, so, how about I move to uh, allow for public comment first, presentation and questions second, and to allow Mr. Lear a closing statement? Uh, to uh, end before decision. I have a motion on the floor. Hope I captured this correctly. To allow for public comment, presentation, question and answer, and then the city manager Lear's closing statement. Is that captured correctly? Yes. Yeah. There's a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carasone. Any second to that motion? I'll, I'll second for discussion because I have a question on that. Go ahead to speak to the motion, uh, Commissioner Carasone. I just think that if there's anything that has been stated or that's said or that's being presented that may not be presented correctly, that they should have the opera that city manager should have the opportunity to, you know, rebut that because. Uh, Regardless of whether this is a, this is not a hearing, but this is also the decision where his career is on the line. So I think that it's only fair. We've done it with other charter officers that, at the very least, that they should have the ability to, to speak on behalf of what's being presented. That's all. Commissioner Emmerich. The question I had, did, did he put in for public comment? Yes, he did. <laughs> Okay, yes, so this would be over and above that. Yeah. So, okay, I feel that the public comment is sufficient at that point. Then. That's what I wanted to ask. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, hang on one second. You already put in for public comment. Okay. So, are you, and I just need clarity to the motion. Um, are you saying that city manager would have public comment and closing statement? No, I was just saying closing statement, that there was no need for public comment, that to just to allow him at the end to, to make a comment or a okay. statement, that's and, all. And as the chair of the meeting, I cannot deny a citizen public no. comment. True. So 
So, unless he wants to. Unless he wants to pull it. And that's entirely his prerogative. But at this time, the way that the motion stands and he has a public comment mm -hmm. card in, he would be allowed public comment and then closing statement. So I just wanted that for the gotcha. record. So three City minutes. Attorney, did you want to speak? Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, you are correct. We cannot deprive any member of the public of public comment. That's completely up to, to Mr. Lear's termination. Um, with respect to the motion, I would ask if we could get clarity with respect to what a presentation would be. I, well, I wasn't sure what you planned on doing as far as the presentation of the actual um, report. So it was just maybe discussion and questions. It's been presented to us on <clears throat> Friday. I'm sure everybody's had a chance to read it. There, nothing, is, as far as I am concerned, to present. I don't know if city attorney or city man, acting city manager has anything to present. No, I have nothing to present. Neither do I, Mayor. So, and it's literally just questions about. The so report, then, my I next, guess. if we're going to be setting parameters, um, the. Question, answer, city manager, closing statement. Where and there are we doing um, motion before or after city manager's closing statement? After closing statement. Thank yeah. you. It wasn't in the it wasn't in the motion. I That's why I, I did want. say that. No. And I'll challenge <clears throat> that because you can lay out a motion and then have discussion on that motion. So I don't see a problem with having a motion right off the bat and then having discussion on it to take the vote. That's the way Robert Rules goes. So I don't think delaying the motion to the very end is necessary. Yeah, we do that so, all the time. We so do the, it that way all the time. The way that the mo the way that the motion is read, and City Clerk, you'll have to correct me if I'm incorrect, is public comment, presentation, which we have established there is none, question and answer, city manager's closing argument, and an added part of motion. And then we have our deliberation like we normally do. Good. Is that yeah. correct, City Clerk? Yes. Thank you. And how long are we going to give City Manager for closing <coughs> statement? <clears throat> I will amend the motion to allow for the closing statement to last no longer than five minutes. Is that okay as the second or to amend it to be for five minutes and include the motion after his closing argument or closing statement? Yes. All right. Does anybody else have anything to add to the motion or comments or questions? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and call the question. And that motion passed three to two with, I'm sorry, you got to leave it up a little longer, guys. <laughs> that was like really fast. I have to state on the record who dissented, please. City Clerk, who dissented on that motion, please? Mayor and Vice Mayor Luke. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, anything to your dissension? Any comment? Just that I don't see it that way, so I didn't vote for it that way. <laughs> Thank you. I just thought five minutes was too long, um, but especially when he still has public comment that he can give. So moving on to public comment, um, I will do those that are... Well, you heard it too, right? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I've never like, heard that phone ring. Hold we on one second. Ringing? Hearing ringing in our ears? All right, so I will call two of you up at a time. Please make sure you stay far enough Salvation, apart, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Scott and then Margie Hathon. And these are in no particular order. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Jeffrey Scott, Twinkle Avenue, homeowner. I have several takeaways from the investigative report, and I'd like to state them as follows. City Manager Lear abused his power and the resources of his charter position, where he colluded with another employee, Nicole Galehouse, in an effort to take advantage and exploit the Northport taxpayer. Number two, 
City Manager Lear did not exercise his official duties as city manager in an ethical and responsible manner. He breached the public trust, which impacted the integrity of his charter position and in his ability to manage the daily operations of this city. Number three, the collusion between Lear and Gale House could have affected the financial probity of the city's budget. In other words, Without this investigation, tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars would have vanished and never been accounted for. As financial dishonesty and the misuse of taxpayer dollars would once again rule the day. Number four, the collusion between Lear and Gale House was outside the purview of their employment. They both demonstrated their lack of commitment and poor judgment to staff, administrators, our city commissioners, and the taxpaying public. In summary, City Manager Peter Lear has created a dysfunctional city hall that is mired in suspicion, mistrust, and secrecy, that is unresponsive to our seated city commission and the taxpaying public. He's unprofessional. He's reminiscent of a troubled adolescent with a past history of delinquent behavior. He has no shame as an appointed charter officer, and that will never change. My recommendation is to take appropriate action without hesitation and terminate his employment effective immediately. The reputational damage he has caused our city is inexcusable. Even more troubling is his willful abuse of power and deception directed towards the Northport taxpayer, which is very appalling to any to say the least, at no other time in this city's history has the phrase taxpayer beware become so meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And just for anybody that's come in late, if you want to make public comment, please just fill out your card and hand it to the officer up front, and we'll get you, you your card with your ability to speak. Um, Ms. Hath, on your next, please. My name is Margie Hathen. I'm a very concerned citizen of Northport. I, as many others, would like to know, in good conduct, how can you, Commissioners Carasone, Hanks, and Emmerich, pre-decide to ha retain Mr. Lear without knowing the outcome of the investigation and also knowing the effects that he will have on many employees with the misuse of power and intimidation? How can Commissioners Carasone, Hanks, and Emmerich impede on an investigation when the ramifications are so damaging to the city and the lives affected. Mr. Lear, along with Commissioners Carazone, Emmerich, and Hank, and other city employees were given a legal directive by the city attorney to have no contact. Yet Mr. Lear and the three named commissioners did not heed that advice and had contact on several occasions. Please speak to us, not to okay. the gallery. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Lear, who stated he didn't use city resources, and when in fact he did, he had Captain Bote check into an email he received to see if the oranges can be traced on July 10th. Mm -hmm. He then told the officer he discussed the email with several commissioners. Also, Mr. Yarbrough heard, heard Lear discuss the complaint with three commissioners who agreed with Mr. Lear. July 22nd, Mr. Lear was seen talking with Commissioner Hanks right before the 5 p.m. meeting. July 28th, Commissioner Emmerich had lunch with Mr. Lear. Also on the same day, Mr. Lear was seen talking with Commissioner Hanks on city property during a break from the city commission meeting. Mr. Lear has admitted to having lunch with Commissioners Carasone, Emmerich, and Hanks. On August 18th, I personally witnessed at Commissioner Hanks' watch party Mr. Lear was there along with Commissioners Emmerich and Carasone. I personally witnessed that. All in blatant directive, this is all in blatant directive, directive given by the city attorney for no contact. To set and impose such a short timeline for an investigation can be, can be perceived that Commissioners Carasone, Emmerich, and Hanks might each have something to hide. It also begs the question to be asked, were Sunshine Laws violated? If the investigator had the proper time to do her job, we would have those answers. 
reopen the investigation, let it run its course without interference from the commissioners, and with cause, fire Mr. Lear. Thank you. Mayor, I have a question real quick for a slight for clarity. We get through public comment and then is it related it's to It's related to that oh, public related comment to the right why there. That was just said, yeah, I'm sure. Ms. Layton, I feel it. When when we were told about mm -hmm. contact with Mr. Lear, we were not given a no contact order. We were given a um, suggestion and to not discuss the investigation, correct? That's correct, Commissioner. The recommendation that I made to each commissioner was identical, and that was to avoid discussing the investigation or its underlying facts with anyone. Okay, so we could still have contact with Mr. Lear and say, hi, bye, how you doing, correct? At your discretion. Thank you very much. And I would like to point out, Mayor, if I may, uh, Tuesday, July 14th at 6 p.m., quote, uh, city attorney says, uh, and anyone who is involved in an investigation as a witness or otherwise should not be discussing that with anyone else, but they are not prohibited in their personal time from spending time with anyone, unquote. Thank you. Let's go back to public comment. Um, Peter Lear is next. And get cool. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Pete Lear, City Manager for City of Northport. Um, I would just like to say thank you, first of all, for addressing this investigation in such a timely manner after its completion. Before we get into the main topic, I'd like to share a few words with you all. First of all, I'd like to apologize for some of my decisions I made that I thought would only impact my personal life but had much greater implications than I could possibly have foreseen. As you all know, I have tried to keep as much of my personal life personal over the years, but unfortunately, in this case, my decisions have crept into the workplace and impacted the city, the great team we have assembled to serve our community, and the community as a whole. If given the opportunity, I look forward to repairing the many relationships that have been impacted by recent events and building an even stronger team to serve the great city that we all love. Next, I'd like to address the invest investigation report that has been issued and my response to the conclusions. The report states that the investigator was to make findings of fact. When the report is filled with opinions not backed, by, uh, not backed by evidence, as well as inaccuracies. Rather than go through the report page by page, I will be here to answer any questions you may have of me during this process. One of the most important things I gather from the report itself is that it clearly saw people's events and interpreted some of, them, some of my actions very differently than I intended. I would like to address, address the ICMA Code of Ethics charge, though. While I completely agree with the Code of Ethics and strive to follow it, the code can only be interpreted for violations by the ICMA committee themselves after they conduct an investigation and review both sides of the situation on a case-by-case -case basis. This has not happened at this point in time. Again, I would like to thank you all for addressing the report in such a timely manner so that regardless of the outcome, our team of city staff and the community as a whole can put this behind them and start to move forward. I've spent the last 12 plus years serving the community and the last eight weeks reflecting on all the events that have led us to today and what I could have done differently with hindsight I have today. Based on all of this, if given the opportunity, I plan to start meeting with staff to heal from this process immediately and assure them all that we will only move forward in a positive direction that is best for the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Poole and then uh, Connie Bruni. <laughs> Gibbs Pool, Northport, Florida. I don't know what happened. I haven't read the report, and I really, right now, I don't care. Here's what concerns me. The investigation, based on the information that I have, was short-circuited. It was cut down. It was not allowed to run its whole cycle. And that bothers me, because when this began, we were talking about the city manager, and then another name comes up, okay? So here we are at an investigation end without the investigation really being complete. I think the investigators should be given the time they need and ask for to complete a full and total investigation. Because the only thing this commission has to offer the citizens is due process. And if you don't follow due process, you've got nothing to stand on. Everything from taxes to manpower is due process. And I see this process being short-circuited. 
So what do you do? Do you make a decision on a man's career based on incomplete information? Are there other people out there affected by this that you haven't heard from because the investigator hasn't gotten to them? I don't know, but I can tell you this, there's not one of us that would go to a doctor because we're sick and the doctor says it'll take an hour to do the complete examination. We say, no, make it 30 minutes because that's what I want you to do. We wouldn't go to a surgeon and go, oh, it's take an hour for the surgery. But you know what? Do it in 20 minutes. That should be enough. No. And I think when you're dealing with personnel problems in this city, you need to do the complete full due process. And I don't feel like that's what's happened here. And he's got no decision on what he did or didn't do or his future or nothing. I am concerned about the lack of due process. Because sooner or later, there may be somebody else in this room that wants their due process. And how do you tell them, oh, we don't really do that here anymore because we're in a hurry to come to a decision on something. And I don't think that's the way you should run a city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Ms. Bruni. <clears throat> Connie Bruni, Northport Taxpayer. Tonight, as you as commissioners have four options regarding city manager Lear, as I understand it. I urge you to do what is right for the taxpayers and employees of the city. Terminate Lear's contract, city manager employment agreement for good cause as per section 7B of said agreement due to the city manager's misconduct as defined in Florida statute 443.036 subsections A, B, and E1. Violations of Florida Statute 112.313, subsection 6, and violation of city's personnel policy and other city policies, rules, and regulations, which would subject any employee or public officer to termination or removal from office. Number one, the city charter, section 1206, states the city manager, as chief administrative officer of the city, shall be responsible to the city commission for the proper administration and management of all affairs of the city. He shall, subsection B, he shall employ or remove all employees of the city. Subsection C, promulgate such rules and regulations and amendments thereto for appointment, promotion, discipline, and removal of employees of the city. Therefore, any argument that Lear's sex life is just personal is illegitimate if it involves him and any city employee at any level. The imbalance of power is inherent in the charter. Florida Section 112.3136, Misuse of Public Position, states, No public officer shall corruptly use or attempt to use his or her official position or any property or resource which may be within his or her trust or perform his or her official duties, emphasis added, to secure a special privilege, benefit, or exemption for him, herself, or others. Based on clear and convincing evidence revealed by the investigator Sprout, I believe Lear misused his position pursuant to the Essex statute as referenced on pages 14 through 53 inclusive. Number three, policy 2.11.D, personnel, I did not have direct access to that. This came from Sprout. Prohibits retaliation against any employee who participates in good faith in the investigation of a complaint of harassment or discrimination. Retaliation is defined as any interference, coercion, restraint, or reprisal against an employee in response to an employee's investigation, page 58. Most disturbing to me is the commission's action of August 17th to place an artificial deadline of 9-4 upon the external investigator engaged by the city attorney pursuant to resolution number 2019-R-07 passed by this commission July 9, 2019. The investigator was unable to complete their work. I have begun to hold you accountable today by filing ethics complaints with the Florida Commission on Ethics against three commissioners named herein. I will give them to the city clerk for you to review. They have been mailed accordingly by the USPS. The citizens of Northport will not be silenced. Mayor. Yes, Mayor. Madam, Madam hang Mayor. on, hang on, hang on. City Attorney. Better, yeah. Any documents from the Commission on Ethics should be held to be confidential. They should not be Madam distributed Attorney. to any person in the meeting. They should not go into the official record, and the city clerk should not review them. Thank you. Uh, I, before we move on, can we talk can you about. Hang on one second. Uh huh. I'm sorry. Um, 
Ms. Bernie, the Commission on Ethics, everything is confidential. Not by me. Of course not. I called them today. It's public record. They now have Okay. Thank you. So it is not public record of the city. city There's attorney, we accept, I'm going to ask you, city attorney, should we accept these documents as presented or return them to Ms. Bruni? I, I would suggest the documents not be accepted. Not be accepted. Thank you. Um, we do not have any additional public comment cards. If anybody would like to fill them out, please do so. City Clerk, you do have public comment that was received through the online version, correct? Mayor, Please go ahead and read that into the record. I would really like to address this whole, well, I'll wait. Thank I you. What you're saying. <laughs> okay, this one is from Marsha Laverde. Because, because of the truncated investigation, Ms. Sprout said she was unable to determine whether Mr. Lear's actions involved moral turpitude or would cause disrepute to the city government at large. I felt an obligation to tell you why I feel it will have negative re reverberations for years to come. This is my third year as a Florida full-time resident. I have an embellished 30 plus year career in the federal government as a former military officer and senior executive in the intelligence and defense communities. I have commanded troops and sent them into harm's way. I have defended multi-million dollar budgets to Congress. Throughout my career, I executed my duties with the knowledge that my salary was on the back of taxpayers' dollars, and it was my responsibility to uphold my duties with the knowledge that, oh, I'm sorry, their trust and faith in the government, that we would always do the right thing and act in good faith, not just when it suited us. To ensure that happened, we received code of conduct and ethics training on a reoccurring basis. We were called upon to live the standards set before us and held accountable if we strayed. We didn't have the luxury to look the other way or decide what standards didn't apply to us. Leaders do not have the option to lie. We cannot demonstrate a blatant disregard for the integrity, duties, and responsibility of our positions. We can't abuse the position's power for personal gain. We can't circumvent established policies and procedures, and we can't display a willful disregard for investigations into infractions of the above. In short, we cannot demonstrate even the slightest hint of conduct on becoming, lest we lose the faith and trust of the people we are sworn to represent. Leaders are supposed to be better. They are supposed to do better. We are supposed to set the example and coalesce for common for the common good, not individual wants and needs. Leaders cannot usurp the responsibilities of others for their own personal gain. Leaders cannot undermine the principles of the rule of law, such as legality and independent oversight. Leaders must uphold ethical principles to include respect for others, stewardship of property, privacy, and not show disregard for misconduct and conflict of interest. Leaders are always held to a higher standard. There is no room for questionable behavior, no room for lies, deceit, and fiscal mismanagement. Leaders are supposed to demonstrate effective decision-making capabilities, empower others, inspire others, not take advantage of others. Leaders are called upon to be accountable. You've read the report. Clearly, Mr. Lear fell short on so many levels. Ask yourself, where did you fall short? While the city manager rightfully said he would take a no-pay raise, it should not even be on the table given the grave economic impact to so many over the past year. What should be on the table is Mr. Lear's resignation or termination. I call upon you to do the right thing and take responsibility. Marsha Laverde. This one's from Kevin Shaughnessy. Due to the significant time restraints imposed by the September 4 deadline, I was unable to provide a detailed explanation of the conclusion outlined in Section 6 of the report. Please let me know if the Commission would like me to prepare an addendum of, to the report that provides further detail and support. This is the lead-off statement from the investigator. What circumstances required the Commissioners to not allow sufficient time for a complete investigation? Another two weeks or so was required. Why was it not permitted? This is a very clear case of misuse of position, favoritism based on personal relationship that should not have occurred in the first place, and numerous violations of in instructions given to the city manager when he was put on leave. Who else knew what, when, and why was no action taken? If commissioners were aware of this relationship prior to the complaint, why did they not take appropriate action actions to bring it to light? While we are struggling to find ways to save money and reduce taxes, we find out that director level positions are being created were unnecessary, a $100,000 budget permitted to rearrange offices for a new department that is not needed, and other new positions requested that are clearly not essential for other than building up a departmental reorganization that should not have, been, should not have happened or be suggested in the first place. A full and thorough investigation is required to understand the entire picture here and to understand whether internal controls broke down, what new controls are required, and what other issues that may exist that need to be addressed. 
The citizens of Northport deserve full transparency regarding this situation and any others that may be identified with proper and fully transparent investigation. Any Northport City Management staff member or commissioner that had prior knowledge of this unacceptable situation and did not take appropriate action to notify the proper parties should be addressed by Human Resources and asked to tender their resignation. Based on the shortened investigative report, at a minimal, the city manager need to be fired for cause with no severance payments. In addition, a very detailed review should be made of any new hires and organizational changes recently made or being suggested. This should not be brushed under the rug. This is from Maria L. Favoritism, off-limits, romance, and blatant disregard for the rules in place for good reason at one's professional workplace is absolutely unforgivable. The city manager and Ms. Gail House should be fired for taking advantage of the city. This behavior cannot be tolerated, especially by city officials. As for the commissioners or any other city employee that knew of the debauchery at hand and withheld this pertinent information, they should be fired as well. This is now a scandal that reflects badly on Northport and has eaten up city funds that could be better used elsewhere if people would only act like professionals that they were hired to be. And that's all. Thank you. Last call for public comment. Uh, Stephanie Gibson is so far the last one. After hers, that will be it. So a lot of the, my points have already been addressed. Um, I agree with Ged. How do we move forward when y'all didn't, y'all interfered? Three of you or the board interfered. Um, I am gonna to respond to some of the questions brought to one speaker about sunshine and about speaking to who they can talk to and who they can't. We have at least three commissioners who have clearly put out in the public, even though they hide from some of us, others take photographs of those posts. They're not capturing them for sunshine. Vanessa, you can shake your head. City Watch is blocked. Steve Burke is here. He took photographs. He provided them. It's you discussing. How can I read you were discussing stuff. the. It's my time. It's my time minutes. afterwards. A liar. Go ahead. Say please. that again. You're Loudly. a liar. Thank you. All right. Stop. Thank you. Yeah, she was talking Stop. directly so, to me. Personal. Personal attack. Several months usual. ago, the CM was offended because I made reference to him as being made the king. And it wasn't to offend More him. It was because y'all abdicated your power all to him. As it turns out, the debauchery absolutely is happening. And it's not just in the city office suite, our city clerk, our city manager suite. This week, I pulled a public record response from Sarasota County, where I inadvertently learned the term of Eiffel Tower style. It's inappropriate that was done on our time in the city, and that needs to be investigated. I don't know what the cluster is, I don't know what the interruptions are, but now it's, it's time for the FDLE. It's not just about the city manager, it's also about the whole board, the whole entire leadership, and it needs to be unvetted completely and thoroughly wherever it leads and prosecuted or cleared, maybe that he's cleared. I have supported this, this city manager, I believed in him. He swore to me he was turning around the, the culture in this city, and he blew it big time. And you can't tell me that's not special favors, and it's not what we're, leading, we, we're asking for from our leaders. They both should be immediately fired with a cause. There's no other responsible choice, unless you put it on pause today and go get a full, absolute investigation, and then come back, and then give the public some time to get into this. We were not notified about this inter interruption. It was a commission comments at the end of a five hour meeting. Public wasn't involved. We get, the, we get the 50, 60 page report on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Friday night, 707 I think, on a three day weekend. I work, most of us work, it's four o'clock. I have to take off early because somebody screwed up and I can't post 24 hours beforehand. That's gotta be fixed too, it needs to be unwound. Thank you. At this time, we are closing public comment. There will be a final opportunity at the close of the meeting, but as far as this agenda item, public comment is now closed. So we will move on to presentation, and I believe we've already established there is no presentation. I would like to address some of the things. So now we will move on to question and answer. Is Commissioner Luke's name is up there first? I don't know if she's got something that she needs to say first or what. 
Vice Mayor, did you want to start the question and answer Your second? Your name is up there first, that's all. I don't it know was, if it was left Because I was actually yeah. going to make a motion that he be terminated. But because um, we have to wait for the motion later <laughs> in the meeting per the thing that went on, uh, I'll make some comments. Um, questions? <sighs> Well, I don't know what is in a question. Question, it's a, answer, yeah. it's a comment. Question and answer. That is the motion. It was public comment, presentation, question and answer, and then closing statement by city manager, and then the motion, and then we have our discussion. All right, then can I ask the uh, council to come up so I can pose some questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the report that was given to us, the conclusion of the investigation, under section six, the conclusions. Uh, A, there is sufficient evidence to conclude Lear violated the ICMA code of ethics. Um, are they a member and sworn to that code of ethics once they become a member? My understanding is that as a member, they are bound by the code of ethics, yes. And even though a member does not have credentials, are they still a member? I believe that the answer to that is yes, that someone can be a member of ICMA without actually being credentialed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> ten three. In the Code of Ethics states, members should not engage in an intimate or romantic relationship with an elected official, a board member, employee they report to, one they appoint and or supervise, either directly or indirectly, within the organization. With that tenant being spoken, when we look at the contract that Mr. Lear is signed for his employment, does it not state that he has to have that accreditation within the first five years of employment? The contract does state that he must have that credential, I believe, by 2021. Okay, and does that then the violation prohibit him from being able to accomplish this because he has violated? I, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I don't believe, I believe that decision would be up to ICMA as to how they would handle that, and I am not a member of ICMA, nor do I know how they would handle that. So does this board need to request that an investigation be done by ICMA before there's a conclusion of this so that we see if he can even fulfill the obligations of his contract? I would say if the question is, can he fulfill that obligation of his contract, then I think the only body that can answer that question would be ICMA. However, I do not believe that you as a body here need a determination from ICMA in order to make your own determination as to how that conduct may or may not implicate or impact the city man manager's contract with the city. But if your question is, do we need that determination to determine whether he can fulfill that contractual obligation? I think you would have to get that naturally from ICMA, yes. Okay, so their conclusion, if I'm reiterating this correctly, their conclusion would have to be made by them. But we can determine ourselves whether he violated that code of ethic or not in our determination. That is, yes, that is. Because his contract states that he is to abide by the ICMA. And if we find that he violated any of those tenets, the investigation brings two of them forward. I'm focusing on three because it is clearly, clearly a violation of it. Uh, so we can say, yes, that was a violation. 
and not have to wait for a report from ICMA. Yes, I believe that is accurate. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, if I may clarify. Yes, ma'am. You wouldn't be able to make a decision again as to what impact that may have on Mr. Lear's ICMA membership or credentialing, but I believe you as this body could make a decision as to what impact that has on his contract. Correct. Uh, sufficient B is sufficient evidence to conclude Lear engaged in misconduct as defined in state statute 443.036 section 9. Could you define uh, misconduct in the in comparison to the good cause clause in the contract, how they correlate. So they correlate by this statutory provision, which actually comes from the unemployment misconduct definition under Florida law. The implication or the correlation, if you will, between this and your good cause provision of your contract is that this statute gives the commission essentially examples or explanations of what misconduct is um, as defined by this statute. Thank you. C, sufficient evidence to conclude that Lear violated city policies, section 7B and I of the employment agreement also includes the definition of good cause. So it correlates within that section and the Florida statute, correct? There are additional examples, yes. Thank you. Uh, the ethics section of city policy 2.12, um, conducting of business fairly and impartially, uh, ethical with proper manner, that is, more subjective is it uh, for us to determine whether the actions taken were being conducted fairly and impartially? That's a tough question because I think it there is no direct legal definition that I can give you for that. So I believe that is a subjective determination that you can make based on your own judgment. Thank you. And the final No, uh, non-discrimination and harassment-free workplace from policy 2.11. Uh, I think that stands for itself. Uh, but the final one, uh, D, the investigator is unable to determine whether Lear committed in an act which involves moral turpitude or which causes the city disrepute. Uh, is that because uh, the investigator really isn't a citizen of the city or knows what the reputation or the standard of ethical ethicalness uh, I, of the city <clears throat> is? That's why she couldn't make a statement? So I, I can't answer for the investigator as to why she wrote that in her conclusion. My interpretation of that is that she is viewing moral turpitude and disrepute as subjective determinations. And I think, at least from my perspective, it is difficult for one person to define for another person what moral turpitude may be or what disrepute may be. I think it could also have something to do with the fact that she is not a resident of the city, but I, I, don't, I can't opine as to why she gave that answer. I, I can understand because it is subjective, um, but she doesn't really speak to any of the others, A, B, and C, as being subjective, only D. She finds A, B, C, and D as being proven. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Carson? Okay, before I start with my questions, I'd like to do some uh, disclosures here. Uh, first, the disclosure, I did have lunch with, well, it wasn't even lunch, it was chips and salsa, uh, with uh, City Manager Lear on August 13th. 
lasted a whole whopping maybe 40 minutes, and it was in reference to the uh, budget shortfall that we had just been uh, told about, which I have a timeline, and that was uh, July. Let's see here. Told about the shortfall on uh, right after my surgery, so that was... July 29th, maybe? 28th? Not sure. Okay, so anyways, there's that. Next, as far as the um, deadline on Sprout, <clears throat> read right from their, their uh, workplace investigation. Our primary focus is workplace investigations, work with employees or their counsel and identify the scope of each investigation so it co covers all relevant issues and to create a focused investigation plan that is efficient, cost-effective, and tailored to those issues. Our unbiased investigation techniques allow us to gather details, facts, through witness interviews and document acquisitions, uh, and it goes on. The Maltzby case in Sarasota County, which was actually a, a, a large civil issue, um, had its change of scope, it was through the school board, had its change of scope uh, midway through it, only took three months. Uh, Cape Coral investigation on the city, ma city manager only took two months. The investigation on the Naples fire chief only took two months. Um, so my point is that uh, after a excess of two months that this had been going on, uh, that is the reason why I asked for a deadline, not to mention the fact that we have deadlines on everything. So those are my two disclosures. Um, as for policy, okay. Um, first question. Is it true in the resolution, and I guess this would be the city attorney, is it true in the resolution 20-19R-07 when it talks about the investigative procedures for city manager, number one says that the human resource resources shall notify the city manager of the allegations or complaint and pending investigation. Correct? Yes, you Okay. So then I go to... Um, the city attorney's letter that restates what was sent um, to city manager, where it only states the violation of employment contract, and it states specifically the ICMA, CM, Code of Ethics, and Guidelines, um, an act which involves more moral turpitude and disrepute, um, the personnel policies of 2.2 and 2.8. Correct. That's what your letter reiterates what the city, what yourself and HR had stated. I apologize, Commissioner. I was not reading the letter along with you, but I, I trust that you read it accurately. <laughs> uh, is it safe to say that that letter? There you go. I, I have it pulled out. Oh, okay. But I wasn't, that, that I, I wasn't letter, reading it while you were talking. So. That that letter is a summary of what was uh, produced to Mr. Lear and was what the human resources notified Mr. Lear as. The letter is a summary of uh, what human resources and I jointly notified Mr. Lear of orally on July 7th. Okay. That's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. So with that said, since the... Policy states that you must have the allegations. The allegations are essentially related to those four items, in my opinion, correct? Are you asking if the, the scope of the investigation is limited to those four items or must be limited to those four items? Uh, yeah, unless it's a unless it's a legal, uh, you know, an unlawful act, I would think that uh, 
because the policy states that he has to be told what the allegations and what the investigation is going to contain. Uh, one through four is pretty much what we should be focusing on. Yeah, I'll let Ms. Boy answer that. Thank you. So I understand where you're coming from. Um, but the way that I look at this, and, and I understand my understanding, and I was not part of drafting this letter, I was not part of the meeting. My understanding is that this is a notification of the allegations that were made by a city employee. Mm -hmm. um, and I see here that they are described, you know, the four that you read off. Um, and I look at the resolution in the policy that says, um, the, the human resources shall notify the city manager of the allegation or complaint. Mm -hmm. I think that, I guess I'm not sure I understand the question, and, and, and just bear with me so for a minute. Maybe I think if I'm I gonna explain get, I think I'm gonna, where I'm going okay. with this, you'll get sure. what I'm saying. Okay, so um, in the complaint, it addresses... Um, and its conclusion, 2.11D of the non-discrimination and harassment free workplace, which is a policy in the city, mm -hmm. but yet that is not one of the four that was notified to him as a complaint. Okay, so I think I understand where you're going. Okay, so my understanding of the letter that Ms. Slayton sent to Mr. Lear was putting him on notice that there was going to be an investigation. She is outlining what I believe to be the violations that were alleged by the employee. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look at the scope of the engagement with Sprout Workplace Investigations, um, it indicates that she is investigating um, an allegation that the city manager engaged in conduct that violated city policies, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, I, I think the problem with such a narrow reading of Ms. Slayton's letter is that what that, in my opinion, would require is the complaining employee to essentially make legal determinations as to what potential contract violations are. And I don't think that was the purpose of the resolution. I think the purpose of the resolution is to put the employee who has had a complaint made about him or her on notice that there's going to be an, an investigation into allegations. But I don't believe it's a reasonable interpretation to require the complaining employee to identify every potential law, rule, policy, et cetera, that has been violated. I think that is something that is within the purview of the investigator as the investigator completes the investigation. Okay, so that's your interpretation, and I just want to make sure that it's clear. I don't agree, but I don't have your law degree either, so there's that. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to stick with um, the ICMA code. The ICMA code uh, which is uh, one of the truly only one, two, the three things that, uh, well, four things that Sprout defers to. And um, I guess I could give you this. This is the rules uh, of procedure. I don't know if you need it or not, but um, the way that I read it, it sounds to me that uh, number two, all members of ICMA in active service to a local governance are subject to the code of ethics and are subject to sanctions for any violations thereof which occur during their membership, however, elected officials are not subject to tenant seven and members are not in service. Uh, but it goes on to explain that the jurisdiction, uh, if you keep on going front and back, the responsibilities lie solely within the ICMA executive board um, to determine this. In fact, it goes in further as to how the investigation all is played out and decisions are made and um, made within 60 days of appointment of fact-finding committee. Uh, so I have to wonder how we or even this investigator can make a determination on codes of ethics that none of this was followed. So I, 
again, my interpretation of that is that I don't disagree that it's within ICMA's purview to make a decision as to whether a member or a credentialed member has violated the code of ethics for purposes of ICMA membership or for purposes of ICMA credentialing. Again, I don't think that's the necessary determination for the purpose that we're here today. I think the purpose that we're here today is because the contract specifically mentions ICMA code of ethics to determine what Where? this body. Where does the contract mention that? In the credentialing. It doesn't specifically mention the code of ethics, but it no. does specifically mention the ICMA credentialing. Correct. Paragraph that he 12. will be a member of it, but it does Correct. not mention code of ethics. In there. So, see where I'm coming from? I do. Okay. I still think it's within ICMA's purview to determine. Oh, absolutely. The it is absolutely in their purview. Sure. I agree wholeheartedly. Okay. So then we go on to. Um, so that dismisses ICMA Code of Ethics because it is basically not in our jurisdiction and it is not listed in the city manager's contract conditions for termination. So that eliminates that as far as I'm concerned. Um, then there is a belief that there is a violation of Florida State Statute 4430369, misconduct. And when you look that up, there are a few caveats to that as well. But basically, all of these are based off of the same thing, uh, one of which is the reorganization. And so, city clerk. I know, this is going to be a tough one, too. Because nobody was here. So, all I can do is reference the minutes. Thursday, July 27, 2017, uh, there was a city commission workshop discussing recommendations of the budget. The city manager, who was replaced uh, with Mr. Lear from Mr. Um, whatever his name is, Jonathan Lewis, uh, <laughs> talks about the organizational structure and that a um, updated and that it will be outsourced a plan and that um, Mayor Yates at the time asked that the $75,000 be taken out and be done in-house and uh, Scott Williams at the time says that this has been budgeted and the reevaluation of the organizational structure um, was proposed in 2014. And I, again, am in immense support and express how building and planning were not together in the past. And I can, plan I can actually send those down if you guys want to see that. That's all the previous organizational charts and the one that was proposed in the backup. Then we have, so I'd love to say, city clerk, can you verify that? But I don't know. I think she wants it passed down to clerk. Sorry. <laughs> I was hoping you guys would look it at it. Oh, but I thought you wanted it to No, to no, I was giving it to you to look at so that you had what I was trying to say, well, that it was, you know, uh, for that there was previous split of Is the there departments. only one copy or did you provide a copy I gave one everybody? copy that way one copy that way so okay. um, but you can I'm sure clerk can send it back and <laughs> all right so then in May 15 2018 uh, yet again we discuss about the city staff reorganization I express explicitly how uh, both the planning and zoning and the building department need to be um, separated out um, and that 
at that time, um, we discuss social services, we talk about parks and recs reorganization, so on and so forth. And um, that is where parks and recs discuss, or social services discusses a um, redo of their area to make it more uh, part of the um, normal everyday activities. Anyways, uh, it's discussed there. So that's 2017, that's 2018. Then we get to uh, June 6th of 2018, where we discuss it again, uh, and that we talk about splitting divisions, specifically property maintenance and facilities to public works, parks and recs to maintenance with parks. And so my point is, is that to say that this, oh, and then, yet again in 2020, where we talk about um, there was a consensus to bring back an ordinance to restructure neighborhood services and presented by the city manager. And I just wanna make sure that the quote is mentioned here that uh, this is not in this budget uh, because it requires a lot more than just a budget change. It requires a city ordinance. Um, so this was supported by, in fact, uh, Commissioner McDowell said, long time coming. Um, Commissioner Luke said, I love it. Uh, and she even mentioned, Vice Mayor, at some point, the overload becomes too much. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich said, you're sure there's no impact to the tax rate coming from this, 0%. He said, yes. And there's that. So that is all seen on June 17, 2020. So my point is that in this investigation, the reorganization is mentioned and it is presumed, essentially, that this was a big surprise, that nobody ever heard about it, that it was never talked about, and that it would never be brought back before the commission. And yet, in 2020, on June 17th, it is adamantly stated that a city ordinance and a lot more work had to come back before the commission. Um, that's that one. Uh, next is the... Um, The, uh, let's see here, disregard for not engaging in communications. And I already read what was stated that you could engage in personal communications, but to limit it from, um, from the city's or, or the, the points of the case. And so while there's a ton of innuendos in here about people uh, being asked about, um, I know I asked specifically the city, the city manager when we met about the budget shortfall, uh, do you have any idea when this thing's gonna be over? And he said, no. Now that's not specific to the investigation facts or the underlying um, case itself. It was just a simple question. So nowhere, if anyone can find something in here that states where facts of the investigation were discussed after, where's my timeline? After July the 7th would be the specific time. Um, Find it, because I don't see it. Buddy, got any, any of the, anything in here that says that the facts were discussed specifically after July 7th? No? Okay. All right, so, um, <clears throat> Are you getting to a question, Mary? I That was a question, but nobody's answering, so I'm going to move on, I guess. Um, there's an email to the commission, 
And um, this is noted under the non-discrimination and harassment free workplace. And again, I feel that's irrelevant, but um, trying to find anything else. I mean, I gave you the ICMA, gave you the investigation policy. Oh, ethics. So I don't know who this would be directed to, but the ethics 2.2. Um, says that the city of Northport is committed to conducting its business fairly, impartially, ethical, uh, proper manner. And again, I need to know where there are facts, a preponderance of proof and evidence in this report that shows that the business was not done fairly or ethical anymore. Anyway. I know there's a lot of assumptions, but I don't see where it is. Nothing. Are you asking them to look for something, ma'am? I, I would like question? anyone that knows where the evidence in this report is, and I would assume that all the commission ripped this thing apart as much as I did to determine what was evidence, what was facts, what was factual, what was hearsay, what was, uh, you know, actual. I mean, you can't, can't dispute a conversation that's been put on record by a phone log. You can't dispute uh, in and out of a... Of a a door, you know, a keypad, but where in here is the facts that specifically say that one, the non-discrimination and harassment free workplace policy was violated and uh, the misconduct uh, was violated because uh, again, most of it's based off of the reorganization, if you go back and look at those V's and H's and all that lovely stuff. But um, I, I just don't know where that would be. So, anyone else got something? I mean, if. Are you asking us? Anyone. Anyone that can find these facts that are being well determined. May I say something, Mayor? I, I don't have her answers on the facts because I don't find very many facts in this report either. What's disappointing to me is I thought that possibly uh, the investigator themselves would be here so I could ask questions about the report, but apparently that's not going to happen. So, I mean, if we're going to ask ourselves, did you see this or did you see that? My answer is going to be no because I saw very little facts. Saw a lot of hearsay, a lot of, you have a lot of opinions. No, you you said I could talk I to her. She asked the question. I'm okay. giving her an answer. Nobody yeah. saw the fact. Well, I have a question. Hold on, hold on. It's still her floor okay. until she's finished. Is it a question to me or a question overall? Well, it's a question towards what you were saying. I mean, uh, go ahead, Commissioner Hanks. Did we did we inquire about the investigator being here for for questions? Or ask her to be here? Or? I did ask the investigator if it was her normal process procedure to be present at a meeting, and she said in her professional experience she had never been summoned to a meeting, that she delivered her report and let the report speak for itself. Oh. Okay. Commissioner, on the floor still yours. All right. So um, pretty much we were, we're looking at the... the um, 4430369 in misconduct. And so um, one of the defenses is the rule is not fairly or consistently enforced. And I started looking at case laws as well, and, and some of these acts of misconduct, for instance, one was in uh, March of 2017, physical violence was no misconduct found. And that would be Salas versus Island Hospital, 
Hospitality Management and Gallagher Bassett. Um, here's another one, in Uninvited Touching of a Female Coworker. Uh, that's I Polito versus Mortons of Chicago, Palm Beach, LLC, and Corval Corp. And again, no misconduct found. Um, I could go on, but my point is, isn't it very difficult to find uh, that someone acted intentionally or with a degree of careless or negligence that evidences wrongful intent? I think you are looking at this as if this is a judicial determination. Yeah, and right. that is not the purpose of this meeting. The purpose of this meeting is for you all as a body to determine, based on what you have in this report, whether you believe that there has been a contract violation or, or what impact you believe this report should have on Mr. Lear, Mr. Lear's contract. I don't think there's any indication that the standard should be what it would be in a court of law um, for that determination. I can tell you from practicing in this area, um, there's all sorts of evidence and different, different, different definitions of misconduct and some things that you think are and that aren't, and you never know what the tribunal's gonna do. Um, but I will say, I don't believe that you all are operating under that same standard with respect to what I understand the purpose of this meeting here. So we're said. saying that, that we operate on Feelings on not on feelings, but you are making a determination within your discretion based on what you have in this report as to whether and this is just one example of cause and these are you're citing to the misconduct section again of the employment unemployment statute. Um, and this is, I believe, in Mr. Lear's contract that to is. give the commission examples mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. could constitute good cause for termination. And so I believe it's up to you all as the body. To determine whether you believe, based on the investigation, that there has been a violation of this standard or any of the other good cause reasons that are in the contract. But don't you really have to have those facts and look at it? Because I looked at it as a case. I looked at it as this is our jurisdiction right here in this little square, these four, this is the policy, this is the charter. Um, and I kept within the context of that when I looked at all of these accusations. So then I went further to make sure that these accusations were actually substantiated by clear and concise facts, which is what she says twice in page one, uh, that the investigator uh, makes findings of fact, determine whether the facts establish violations of Lear's employment agreement uh, and city policy. So my point is, is that I looked at it in that level, in that token, that where are the facts? And so, I, I mean, the only thing that I see that was really put upon anything was the reorg of NDS. And again, I, I can share all my documents that that is not a big surprise. Um, so the only thing I can do is look at it in that legal sense. I can't, I am looking at it that I don't have feelings towards this. And the only way to do that is to look at it through a legal sense. And that's how I looked at it. So maybe others looked at it differently and I guess that's okay. But to me, I look at it as it also, if whatever action you take also has to be defensible, correct? It does. So, one has to, you know, you can't turn around and say, well, I feel like. I'm certainly not intending you know I mean, to suggest right? that you base your decision off of feelings. And if that's what I've communicated, then I apologize. Okay. Because that is not at all my position. My position is that you all have an almost 60 page report that you all have. I know everybody has read and analyzed and given detail and thoughtful consideration to. And I think your job now is to take a look at what's in that report, take a look at the contract including the various definitions that there are mm -hmm. for misconduct, the unemployment statute, um, the code of conduct for public officers, all of the other you know, definitions of good cause, and make mm -hmm. a determination based on your best professional judgment as to whether or not that impacts the contract and how it, how it impacts the contract is a better way to say it. Okay. So, I mean, so when it says believed to be 
to violate FS 4430369 misconduct. And the facts presented says reasonable standards of behavior, which pretty much just talk about um, a deliberate conscious disregard. We're just supposed to believe that the reorganization of NDS was a disregard and all the other without the facts so, that's what without you're asking. the facts yeah. so if i may add to that I, I do think that there's an important distinction between what i believe you're explaining and also what the investigator mentions in the report which is looking at whether or not not necessarily that the organiza the reorganization was correct or proper or Mm -hmm, the things mm -hmm. that you've been talking about, but whether there was based on whether it was based on any kind of favoritism as a result of the personal relationship. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so I already proved that with all the past minutes and the meetings. So now we'll get to uh, that's a great point because in here one of the the subjects is the floor plan. Okay, which again I reiterate is in the minutes that all this had to come back before the commission. And so, um, city clerk, when um, Ms. Pito was here, didn't wasn't there a redevelopment or a renovation of the city clerk's office that you all um, put in for, do you remember that? And maybe that was actually in It was after she left. It was after she left. So, and now you had the renovation and participated in how you wanted to see that, correct? Yes. Right. Okay. So, um, you developed essentially the floor plan. Yes. Okay. All right. And so, um, when you had new positions in your organization, do you help with the uh, job description? I haven't had any new positions. Gosh, you're right. <laughs> Okay, I can't. Oh, okay, city attorney. When you did the assistant city attorney, um, that was a new a new position, didn't you? Uh, put in for the job description and the right of that and how that should look. It, it was an additional position, but the position had already been established, so no. So you didn't review the job description. Not to, not that I recall. Is there a new job do a new position that was ever put in there? No. No. There have been additional of the same type, but all the types but are already But those defined. are already, I yes, gotcha. Okay. I was trying to find, I do know in the, all I can say is in the past that the person involved with it helped with the job description along with HR. Um, let's see here. And um, the trip to Ikea with four others. Um, that, those, those are the only things that are actually notated in her findings of facts and her reasonable standards of behavior. And I then go to the city charter, which states that he is the purchasing agent for the city. So um, essentially, I had a right to be there. Um, so that's that one, and I mean, I think that with that as the basis, everything else kind of followed. So I'm just going to reserve my any more comments because I have to say that I have a plenty full of information and evidence right here to substantiate the factless and baseless report. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Hanks or Commissioner Armitage, did you want to ask any questions? I don't have any questions. Uh, there was a, a couple that I had that they were asked between uh, the vice mayor and the mm -hmm. Commissioner Armitage. Let me look one second. Most of it was for Ms. Broat. No, let me look. Um, I did have a question for. The city clerk. Just to make a point. And this was on page 49. Um, it said, Commissioner 
Holmes made a motion to place Lear on administrative leave during the pendency of the investigation. The motion carried by three to two votes. Now, that one was uh, about putting Mr. Lear on paid leave. If I'm correct, that passed as a four to one vote. Is that correct? What meeting was it again? What's the date? Uh, that was the. July 21, 22 budget workshops decided that it was right here. It was well, actually well, then this whole sentence is it's wrong. It's wrong because it was by Commissioner, uh, it was by Mayor McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Hanks, and it was four to one. Here's the verbatim. At the yeah, the July 14th commission agenda. That's verbatim. That's verbatim. Uh -huh. To that. I questioned that also after I received the report and basically was told because of the time restriction on Ms. Broke mm -hmm. that, uh, no, that she wasn't able to go through uh, and critique everything that so was So she made it up out. because she could. That's what you're saying. Because why would that you? That is not that? what I said. Well, I'm just asking the question. Because and I said no. I understand, but she did put in there specifics. Because she had no idea, so she went ahead and made up specifics. No, nope. well, that is what, not what. Uh, city what attorney, what? can you tell me or tell the rest of the group here what you told me when I questioned that and some other errors and misspellings and things like that? That's not a misspelling. There are city misspellings attorney. in there. No, no, but that wasn't. Enough. The attorney, please. Yes, Mayor, when Vice Mayor made that inquiry to me, I said that, that yes, I had seen some uh, inaccuracies in the report and that the investigator had expressed that she felt rushed by the tightened timeline and my assumption was that she had not gone back to verify some of the details, such as you know, the exact vote. There's another reference to a vote in here that is 3-2. And so my assumption was that that was an oversight, and based on what she had said both in our cover letter and when I spoke with her, that she wasn't able to go through and refine some of those details for confirmation um, to try to get the report back on time as requested by, or as uh, determined, directed by the commission. May I ask the city attorney a question on that? Yes. City attorney, if, uh, what would your advice be to any of your attorneys, if they didn't have all the information, would it be to go ahead and report on it, or probably just to leave it out, or at least to give a disclaimer that what I'm putting in here may not be accurate? Well, we don't conduct workplace investigations in, no, no, in our office. No, I mean office, in so anything. I feel I feel un uncomfortable speaking to a, a hypothetical. Um, all I can say is that the, the investigator, when I contacted her the day after the, I believe it was the August 17th meeting when the commission put a deadline on the report for the first time, and it was about two weeks away, that she said that that would be a very difficult deadline to meet, and could the commission reconsider? I notified her the commission was on break for August. This had been a special meeting, would not be reconvening until the afternoon of September 3rd, you know, just before the, um, the report was due, so there wasn't an opportunity to get an extension from the commission and that I had, um, you know, told the commission that I thought that this would, would feel tight from her perspective. So I felt that that perspective had been presented already. So would you require your staff to be... Um, can't can't even me. ask it. I know what you're trying to do, but I, I think it's unfair. Can you... Yeah. Uh, I know, but I, <laughs> I'm I mean, trying to say, uh, you know, know the, you, the, in, the entire point behind what is being said here is that there is something specifically put into this document that is absolutely inaccurate. Absolutely. So, so what I'm trying to get at is we're trying to justify that it's okay to have inaccuracies within a document that affects someone else's life. It's okay to do that as long as it's about someone else. So what I'm trying to get to is if this was my staff, I would expect accurate information or don't put it in. So I'm trying to get a professional opinion based off of uh, uh, one of my charter officers, how she would manage her department. I could ask the city manager, doesn't matter to me. I could ask anybody 
do you expect, is it a reasonable expectation to have your employees provide accurate information um, in any given Maybe ask situation. the police chief. Huh? Police chief. I'm trying to think okay. of who would do an investigation. but It is his. Oh, okay, floor, let, let me do that. I'll ask and the police chief. Please let me chief. call I, on you. May I ask the police chief? You have to get to manager, from city manager. May I ask the manager. police chief a question? Uh, if you think it will be relevant, sure. Okay, sure. I do think um, it will be relevant. I would just ask that the commission please be sensitive that uh, uh, this, this is a very sensitive topic and dragging a lot of staff into the middle of y'all's determination uh, may have uh, negative consequences. I greatly appreciate that. So is receiving documentation that is full of inaccuracies. Um, well, you heard the question. Do I need to re-ask it in a different way for you or? or could you just you repeat, know? Todd Garrison, police chief, could you just yeah. repeat the question? Yeah, so, so my question is, um, when, when your officers are providing information um, for whatever purpose, whether it's to you, whether it's to anyone, do you encourage them to be accurate in the information they provide? And if, and if they don't have that information, do you encourage them to go ahead and put whatever they think into it, or, or are they to leave that information out if it's not relevant the or, first, or inaccurate? The first part of the question is yes, I do expect accurate information. Okay. And we are, our investigations are fact-based, so we don't put opinions in our investigations. Right. Hmm. Well, this one is too, because it said right in the front, it's fact-based. So thank you very much. That was just what I, what I was wanting to know was whether or, or not anybody would expect that. And I thank you for coming up here, and I hope I didn't uh, cause any undue burden to you. All right, going back to Commissioner Emmerich, this is your floor for question time. Yeah, and this one this one is for Commissioner or Vice Mayor Luke, um, since she was mentioned in the report, and it's mm -hmm. it's talking about page fourteen uh, about when you had uh, a meeting with Mr. Lear concerning the employees that it apparently came to you with concerns about management in NDS. This was back in March of 2020, according to this report. Is that true? I believe it was earlier. I believe it was earlier than that, and it was something that I had heard. That is not the only time I've ever heard anything about staff. But every time I hear something about staff, I took it to Mr. Lear. Now, what he did subsequent to receiving that knowledge, that was on him, not me. And as I said, I have done that several times. But this is not this investigation has nothing to do with any other staff other than city manager but i understand that and i'm not holding you to fault on anything my point and my question was we we have multiple witnesses in this whole thing were you ever interviewed no because i'm a commissioner they didn't interview oh no us. but we're mentioned as commissioners and stuff in this report quite a bit but i'm just saying <laughs> Yeah, Here's something that happened in March 2020. They're complaining about the time shortness and this, that, and the other. But yeah, here's something that took place way before. They had plenty of time to get some nuts and bolts for this investigation if they had just asked you a few questions about the beginning before they go into all this process and everything. All because there's, there's five pages at least, and then another nine pages of ir irrelevant material in here that I've read. So I just but wanted I want to ask if you got interviewed. That's all. That's all I, I needed not, to know. I, I could not give anything on this investigation because what I reported to the city manager was a staff issue. He's the one that's over staff, not me. Mm -hmm. So I heard something, took it to him. How it turned out, I don't know. He doesn't report back to me. He reports to a commission. And if there was some kind of issue that he felt he needed to bring to the commission, he would have. But he didn't. But you could have been asked what that information was to validate. Yeah, but what, what, what's the relevancy? Because it had nothing to do with him. It had to do with another staff member. Well, so why would they talk to me? The staff, but the staff member, the, the information you Mentioned brought that. to the city manager was brought to you. There's a collaboration of evidence there. So it makes sense that they, would, that they should have contacted you to collaborate 
what with their investigation oh, since you were the very first since you were the very first contact on it that I mean, no was I wasn't the very first because the employee that you guys are talking about now instead of the city manager there had been a 360 evaluation done on him as well as a complaint brought in October of 19 so I was not the first one <laughs> I had just heard something and took it to him. Same way as I have heard of pro probably every other mm -hmm. department within the city, including another employee that th this huge amount of material that was gathered, uh, the old building official, I had to turn in a video that a citizen took of that gentleman telling the contractor how he could short skirt the codes, that how he could get around it and he wouldn't violate uh, the, the contractor. So there's umpteen stuff that I have taken to the one who's over staff, not me, him. Go ahead and my question. Rich, no, I, Commissioner Emmerich, go ahead and finish up, please. Again, Vice I was not faulting you. I was asking a question to Correct. see if you were interviewed. Yeah, trying because to get a basis. After, after that original thing, this is when this all really starts to boil down and all the memoirs start and everything else, and it's the same hub going forward. Just showing pattern. That's all. Thank you. It, it does deal with a different um, staff member. Uh, the city manager being overall staff had the right to terminate the individual, had the right to uh, do whatever he wanted to do, um, to split the department, which we weren't told in the June meeting, we, weren't, we didn't even say that until the July meeting, that an, that an ordinance had to go on in order for a unanimous vote for it to go on. And so, Whatever he does with staff, that is up to him. Yes, and I know 17th. you're not. I know you're not um, trying to come at me about that. But I'm just letting you know that was no different than a dozen other times, at least, that I have taken a staff issue to him. June seventeenth. Did you have any other questions, Commissioner Emmerich? No, the rest would have been for the investigator. So. Yeah, I'm, good. I'm good for now. Can I ask a question about oh, the discrepancy? Turn. It's my turn. I haven't had a chance to ask my questions, and I just have just a very few of them. City Attorney on... Let me get my eyes on so I can read. On July 15th, it says that you sent the city manager an email confirming the commission's decision to put him on paid administrative leave. I know in the past probably 48 hours, we got another 100 pages of documents to review. Could you quickly pull that up and tell me what is in that email? When that it was, was on, it, My timeline says that uh, it was July 15th that you, mm -hmm. the city attorney, sent him an email about our decision on the 14th. Yes, ma'am, I'll need just one moment. The link is not working. I'm going to have to get it from another Thank you very much. Direction. Please take your time. Oh, right here, July 15th. So on July 15th, um, I sent Mr. Lear written correspondence and I delivered that by email. So I, I didn't pull up the email. The email just essentially said, see attached. It might have asked for confirmation of receipt. Um, but the July 15th correspondence that was an attachment to the email summarized what had happened the night before, um, that he'd been placed on administrative leave effective immediately, confirmation of that, um, informing him that he would be conduct contacted by the investigator and identifying that person um, reminding him that cooperation during the investigative process was expected and required, uh, reminding him that he's not authorized to, uh, while on leave, not authorized to conduct or participate in any city business, if he'd not already done so, to provide the city with all city equipment and collection of items, um, to keep human resources informed of any changes to contact information, 
and that due to the sense of, and they then again reaffirmed, um, due to the sense of nature of the process, the investigation is conducted in a manner that protects the privacy of all involved to the greatest extent possible, reminds him not to discuss the details of the investigation with any person other than the investigator, that uh, the confidentiality restrictions are to protect all and parties involved and are in place to reduce the likelihood that anyone may be victimized as a result of their involvement in the investigation. He would be notified when the investigation is concluded. If you had any questions regarding the investigation, please contact me directly. Okay. That's not verbatim. That's sort of a summary going through sentence by sentence. And you did advise him to not conduct city business while he is on leave. Um, yes, in the third paragraph, the first sentence states, pursuant mm -hmm. to the commission's direction, you are not authorized to conduct or participate in any city business during the term of your administrative leave. So um, at the beginning of today's meeting, well, shortly after this 4 o'clock meeting, Commissioner Carason had disclosed that she met with city manager, and they did discuss city business because they did discuss the budget. Yeah. Is that in violation of what you had suggested that he not do? That would be up to the, dis the commission to determine. Thank you. So the dis would discussion having, of the budget me. be actually creating city business, asking information? Commissioner Carason, I really still have the floor, city please. Business? Oh, you're making so, accusations. I think I'm, I should have an ability to actually I'm not ask making the any clarification. Commissioner Carason, I am asking the city attorney a question. There will be round two. You put your light on. You can come back with further questions. I've lost the whole thing. Um, I am wondering, could you, city attorney or maybe city manager, maybe it's an HR thing, I'm not sure, when exactly was Sprout hired officially or formally? Yes, ma'am, I can answer that. Again, if you'll give me a second, there's no so, many, so many different documents I know. as you are aware. You can find them much quicker than I can. <laughs> While I'm, if I can, if I can multitask, and we'll see how successful this is, um, I did reach out to Ms. Sprout, I believe on July 7th, to say that the city, that on behalf of the city, I would like to engage her services. Um, and in my opinion, that was a, that was the date that there was a termination made to conduct an investigation. Um, and so for purposes of the public records exemption, that, that technically that was the date the investigation opened. It was a few days before we actually got an engagement letter signed. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. If what you was the like date the you date just gave? The, I'm sorry. July 7th for the... July 7th, City Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Hanks, July 7th, but she's looking for the date that it was returned, signed, accepted. I will tell you that we were billed for July 7th in the amount of $80 for initial. Like it was the 15th. 15th. July 15th. Oh. Thank you. So I contacted her July 7th. On July 10th, she that, that's the date that's on the you know typed into the top of the engagement letter. Um, looks like she signed it on that date, and I signed and returned it to her on Sunday, July 12th. So in intents and purposes, the start of the investigation was July. I, I would consider it to be July 7th, but just, okay. just for purposes of transparency to the board, anyone who's listening, well, that might have been the start date of the investigation. The actual work of reviewing documents and interviewing witnesses did not begin on that date. Correct. When, and, and I think it's in the report, I'm sure that there's, so even though they have interviews with, um, with staff, and it appears that most of the interviews took place in, in August, a few of them at the end of July, would there be like, a, would the invest, the investigator have to like look up the basics before they can start interviewing. Is there like um, 
a history gathering time frame, learning about the city, learning about the layout of the city, learning about. Yes, ma'am. There's some kind of background gathering. Background. There's requests for documentation, uh, documents that we began gathering and began ob obtaining from other city departments. Um, then based on that, additional documentation requested, some um, initial discussions to learn kind of how the, the city functions, that type of thing. And then when the investigator got to the point, the particular point in her investigation, she began the uh, formal interviews. So the first interview did actually not start until July 31st. And then other interviews took place. And it appears the last interview was like the 20th. Seven? It is correct that the first interview was scheduled on Friday, July 31st. Um, I see that email. I know the interviews went until at least August 25th. Um, They're on the front. I, I'm not right? positive about the. Yeah, I see the one with City Clerk on August 26th and a Corey Merchant on August 26th. So Assistant be, City Attorney Golan, do you know do you know the last date of interviews? Oh, 27th. If I may, Amber. Oh, uh, Ms. Boy. It, according to the report, from what I can tell, the last interview was on August 27th. So August 27th was the last day of interviews. And then typically, how long does it take to write up a report? Figure. I, 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 I not. I don't conduct workplace investigations. Okay. I don't know if Ms. Boy knows in her experience. I don't believe she's all, I, an investigator either. But I don't know if you I, I do have not other conduct experience. workplace investigations. But I can tell you, a report of this size is obviously very time-consuming to draft. Um, and if I was drafting a one of the legal documents that I would draft, um, it would be a, a, a multi-day, possibly multi-week task, if not longer, because you're having to not only draft the report, but refer back to documents, refer back to interviews, refer back to all of your um, evidence or data that you have compiled in order to, you know, not only recite the facts in the report, but make your conclusions. So it's a, it's a, it's an extensive process. Thank you. Um, I think it was you, Ms. Boyd, who made this statement, code of conduct for professionals. And I don't know if that was your, maybe it was city attorney. <coughs> Can you explain what that means to a typical lay person? So if that was what I said, what I meant was this Florida statute that governs conduct for public employees. It's one, well, it's in here, 112 something. Mm -hmm. um, I think for lay people, <coughs> there, there are a lot of provisions in the code of conduct. I don't have it open right here, um, but I think, you know, Maybe I should. I'm not going to opine without looking at it. So <laughs> Thank you. At it. I know better than that. Uh, let's see. So the standards of conduct for public officers is one. It's floor statute chapter 112.313. Um, and just as an example, um, in paragraph six, misuse of public position. And it goes through what a public officer employee of an agency shall not do. Um, and use your official position um, to secure a special privilege, benefit, or exemption. I think for a layperson, that would mean don't use your role within a government agency to curry favor for yourself. <coughs> that is what my layperson definition would be. I think different interpretations could be different, um, but that is what my example of a layperson interpretation would be. Thank you very much. Um, one final one, city attorney. I know that this report has what would commonly be referred to as Scrivener's errors <laughs> uh, on most reports that we get, um, that there's errors on reports and documents, contracts. We've seen it just sitting up here on the dais. Things were pointed out that were not necessarily maliciously inaccurate, but just errors, human errors, typing errors, any kind of errors. 
city attorney, does the errors conducted in here, for example, that was brought to the attention that it was the um, myself who made the motion and the vote was four to one and there's some typos in here. Does that actually affect or change the, the validity of the report as far as the overall of the report? Uh, so in my opinion, it would, it would come down to whether the error, whatever it may be, whether it's a typographical error or a apparent misstatement of a vote or who made the motion, it would come down to whether that was um, a substantive piece of information that was critical to the determination. And what I will say as an attorney who writes for a living, um, I know for me personally, um, I, I think to go back to Commissioner Hank's point, is it everybody's goal to state things accurately? And I think it is. But I also think that there's a difference between making a scrivener's error, as the mayor has called it, and intentionally making a misrepresentation or making up facts. And I know when I'm drafting something especially substantial, um, even on an, um, without a deadline, it can be hard to edit your own writing sometimes. <laughs> and you go back, and I know for me, because I am a stickler about that, and I just cringe when I, sometimes I don't even want to go back and look if I've already turned something in, because it will drive me crazy. But I think to go back to your question, to the extent the errors are Scrivener's errors or errors that don't affect the substance of the determination or the conclusion, then I don't think that that leads to a determination you know, against the report, if you will. I Thank think you. it comes down to what the substance is. So ethics. Let's talk about ethics. Um, every person has a different code of ethics. And sometimes that code of ethics can change based on where you are in life. Um, a, a teenager's code of ethics is far different than somebody who's in the military. So the military has a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. And I know we're not in the military, but a lot of, a lot of law is, is very much, I want to say, paralleled to the military's code of ethics. Um, it, code of, is it safe to say that code of ethics is subjective? I think it depends on whether you're talking about just code of ethics sort of in a vacuum or if you're talking about a specific code of ethics that enumerates different things that could be in violation of it. I think just generally... Um, code of ethics is subjective, just like moral turpitude that, we've, that I mentioned before, I think is subjective. And disrepute, which I have a hard time saying, is um, <laughs> subjective. Um, so I, I think, to answer your question, yes, I think code of ethics can be subjective. Um, but I also think it matters what code of ethics you're talking about, whether it's just somebody's personal code of ethics or whether it's a code of ethics, for example, that's enumerated in this you know, city's policy. So I think those can be different. So if a person says that they have ethics and integrity that is of the utmost importance in their endeavors, would that... I'm trying to formulate it in a question, and I am so sorry. I, I, I've got it here, and I'm trying to put it in a question. Um, by that statement, would that mean that they have a high regard for ethics? And I know I'm asking opinion, and, and, and that's... I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding. If this is a statement of fact that was said, how does that compare to the investigation? Uh, because it, it seems to go parallel to each other. It doesn't, here's the question. Does it go against what is outlined in the report as far as what they found to be unethical? 
whether it be the ICMA, the... Um, I hate to do this, but I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand I'm it perfectly. So sorry. <laughs> if I may, I what I think is critical in the determination that you all have to make is looking at the code of ethics that's you know talked about in the contract, the policy, and determining whether you believe, based on the statements that are in the report and the expectations that you have of somebody in Mr. Lear's, or of Mr. Lear, because he's in the position, um, and whether, I, I can't remember exactly, exactly how you phrased it, but you know, upholds it with the uh, utmost. Ethics in, and integrity, integrity are of the utmost importance in endeavors. I, I think that is a subjective determination that you all have to make given the facts that you have in the report based on what the obligations and responsibilities and duties of the city manager role entail. Thank you. And I just am going to double check to make sure I do not have any other questions at this point. <laughs> And just for the record, that statement is directly out of City Manager Lear's self-evaluation that he did right before all of this happened that he wrote when all of this was going on that we were not unaware of. So with that said, um, oh, Commissioner Carison, I do see your light on for questions. The um, page nine of the report, as well as page 54, both have the incorrect date for the ICMACM certification. It's off by two years. Well, in one case, it's way off. Um, one on page nine says 2021, and then on page 54, it says that um, it's 2012. And so when we talk about the basis of these particular um, errors, my concern is when someone looks at the ICMA and the Code of Ethics, you would think either A, they've been a city manager and worked under the ICMA <coughs> since 2012, okay, or that they should have worked long enough that they're going to be getting it within the year. So it could have relevance as to the way that these facts are presented because they should have known given those dates of when it's a possibility that that certification was given or is perceived to be given. You see where I'm going with that? I do, and, and I see on page 54, I see that just as a typo. I think that she transferred one and two and meant to say 2021. Or did she or did she reverse transverse on page nine and thought it was supposed to be 2012? That's a good question, but okay. I think given the fact that I don't believe, and I'm just going off memory, I don't believe I Mr. Understand. Lear was the city manager <laughs> But I understand so. that, but that is what I'm trying to get at. While many people will look at it as a possibility that these are just typos, in the same token, those typos can be misconstrued as the way that this evidence is determined. So in, for instance, in ethics, when you go before an ethics violation or even an elections violation, they are going to look at it and say, is this your first year? We get it. We understand that you have not, you were there for eight years, 12 years. They're going to be a little bit more difficult to say you didn't know. And I, and I believe that's what you were saying as far as the errors. It all depends on error, correct? What I'm saying is, I again, I see page 54 is a clear Scrivener's error, and I understand Mr. Lear, it's 2022. I was corrected yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, but, both but I also in. think, again, returning back to the substance, and I'm not sure if that is significant. That's what my point is, is the, the substance could be significant if the uh, person believed that it was 2012 or 2021. That's my point. Um, city attorney, under the July 15th letter, at what time was that email sent, please? No, I pulled up the letter, but not the email. <laughs> I told you so. Uh, 
have to find it. What Gmail again? I'm sorry, Commissioner. July 15th, 2020 okay. email that was sent to Mr. Lear. My my sent email <clears throat> indicates that it was issued. It was sent July fifteenth at five forty nine p.m. Okay, five forty nine p.m. on July fifteenth. I have, you know, this thing was so clustered. I had to do an actual timeline to see what was what here. Um, nine. Okay. Um. And then as far as the comment before on June 17th, I will reiterate verbatim um, that the restructure of Neighborhood Services Department as presented uh, would not require anything in this budget. It actually is required a lot more than just a budget change, requires a city ordinance. And so it was told to us in June 17th, 2020, to be clear. I'm done. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, I think that's another question since it just came up to you. We were talking about, you know, misrepresenting the facts. And this came from here. And I'm just going to ask you, would this be one that would be considered misrepresenting the facts? The investigator believes the more than likely scenario is that Lear and Gale House saw each other face to face sometime while they were both in City Hall on the night of July 4th, and that they probably talked about what he would do now that Wheatley had threatened he would contact HRs or commissioners. Now, isn't that leading and misrepresenting the facts? How do you know factually that that happened? Because there's a ton of that in this report. I don't know exactly where you were reading from, but just based off of Page your... Page 34 to 35. Just based off of your recitation of it, I don't... I don't interpret that as a misrepresentation of fact. I interpret that as something, as a determination she's made based on the facts that she received. Because I think part well, of it- They both denied it prior to that, so that's okay. And I don't, I, again, I don't know. I can't speak to what her intent was. What I can say as a lawyer who analyzes these things is part of, part of our jobs is to take the facts and interpret them and make conclusions. And so that's how I read that as a lawyer. Um, but I do not know what the investigator was thinking okay. as she was reporting this. That's all I have. Commissioner Hanks? What would you suggest our job is? Is it to take the facts just as you stated and to do the same thing that you're doing? Where would you typically get those facts? Would you be given a report by anybody and then just go through it and then that's all you have and that's all you look at and that's what you base everything on? Whenever you say you look at the facts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's impossible to completely divorce yourself from extraneous or outside information. But I think by and large, you created that resolution to deal with this type of situation where you have to do an investigation into a charter officer. You have made the decision through the city attorney's office to hire an outside investigator. Um, she did the investigation that, that she believed was necessary. Sorry. And I think your job is to take what you have based off of that report and apply it to the contract and come up with a determination. And if we had any questions towards it, we have absolutely nobody to ask. I mean, we have you, but you don't have, you have <laughs> yes. no insight into any of her intent or where she gathered her information or any of that. Correct. I do not have any personal knowledge of, of that part of it, no. I, I, I think you would have the opportunity if you wanted to reopen the investigation or engage in a further investigation if you felt it was necessary to make additional fact-finding as the body, um, but based on... I cannot answer those thank questions you. based on this report. Yeah, thank you. Uh, City Manager, I'd like to ask the police chief another question, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, yes, sir. <clears throat> Doug Garrison, Chief of Police. Thank you, sir, for coming. Um, you do internal investigations, or your department does, maybe not you directly. Correct, your department my department does. does. Um, 
in in your um, let me just think how how I word this. Are there timetables ever put on your internal investigations? Like we need this done by a certain amount of time in order to, to uh, I mean, I guess, what is it said here? Um, to propagate an element for procedural fairness? We have uh, internal timetables. I have 45 days for an investigation. Um, however, an extension can be done. There is for, a Florida for statute. extenuating cir circumstances. Correct. There, that's just an internal policy, but Florida statute governs 180 days on complaints. Okay. And if there's an extenuating circumstance that would uh, go beyond that, what you, you said, 45 days? 45 days. days. Um, and you would you would suggest that even a 45 day interview or investigation is a very is um, the investigation you're doing whether it's 45 days or 120 days or whatever it was you you said that doesn't uh, dictate the level of sense of um, severity. Yes, correct. I mean, like you know, like I mean, if if uh, somebody. Uh, smack somebody in the back of the head messing around and they had a complaint or if somebody had a harassment complaint, you don't determine the time based off, the, off of the severity. It would be, say, 45 days, and then if there's an extenuating circumstance, that would be brought to you or to whoever is in charge of that, yeah? Correct. The severity of it doesn't dictate the time schedule. However, at the end of 45 or before the 45-day mark, the chief of police has to give the okay for it to go beyond the 45 days. However, I cannot go beyond the 180 days per state statute. Per state statute, okay. Um, and and uh, I, I just want to clarify, though, that is for an administrative investigation, not a criminal investigation. Yes, yeah, well, well that's specifically what I'm asking. Okay. Yes, I absolutely. I figured those okay. two would be different. Um, and as you mentioned before, in those 45 days, if, if uh, that timetable came up and, and uh, there was an extenuating circumstance that would be brought to you or, or it would be brought to the, to the, I guess, to the superior officer, um, and that determination would be determined then by you whether or not uh, the case would go beyond the 45 days. That is correct, yeah. sir. And... Um, I actually just kind of squirreled myself in my last question, but um, the that's all I have for now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Vice Mayor Luke, do you have any questions? Uh, I've got some follow up. Um, Not with you, okay, sir. Thank you. <laughs> oh, actually, I do have one for him. If okay, you don't wait mind. a minute. Let and her go first. I'm sorry. Do you mind since he's oh, up here? Go ahead. Okay. And Mayor, I do remember my question now. Then go so, ahead. Um, and and at the end of that timetable, once that timetable is given, um, again, you expect the information to be accurate because this affects folks' lives, right? Yes, sir. And if it's and if they don't have the proper information, you encourage them to go ahead and make a report on, or if they don't have all the information, you encourage them to go ahead and put it in the report, uh, whatever they think is going on? No, I expect factual information in the report before it comes up. Only yes. factual information being in. So only information that they know to be true. Correct. And fact. Actually. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Mine will be quick for the chief. Um, on July 10th, sorry, Captain Boutte, <laughs> um, City, uh, City Manager Lear asked Captain Boutte to um, come and check out an email to see if it could be determined the identity of an anonymous email that was sent to commission and forwarded to City Manager. Do you know of any time that your department checked the identity to see where an email has ever come from that was anonymous? Yes, we've actually have done it on several occasions for emails coming into the 
City several Hall. occasions. Re give me some instances how several occasions this happened in the past. You're asking me to go on recollection. I can tell you that, yes, we have done it on specifics. I don't have that. But we have um, looked at emails that have come into the city commission and tried to verify where those emails have come. We get a lot of phishing emails mm -hmm. and stuff like that, so we have looked at those um, emails, and because of Captain Bote's professional experience, we have utilized them for that. Okay, so it's mostly to determine for security purposes for the phishing. I, I'm going off a recollection of what I've used them for, yes. The reason why I'm, I'm asking this is I'm trying to determine how commonplace this is because I'm reading this in the report and it sounds like city manager who is at this point under investigation, we get an email that is anonymous that goes into salacious details of this affair and city manager is asking to find out how we can find out who that identity of that sender is. is does those kind of situations get investigated on a regular basis or is it more the security phishing kind of thing? Well, I don't know what the validity, I don't know what the um, content of the email was or, or, or anything about the email. All I was asked was, is there any way to find out if Captain Bouquet could tell where an email came from that was sent to the commission? was not provided any other information, whether it was pertaining to this or pertaining to something else. I was just given generic information as to an email. Can I ask a question on that? You bring up a, were you, uh, Captain Boquet, were you, who was here when um, um, the previous chief was here? Not, not. Talking about Reg SBA. Dupree? Yeah, Vespio. When Vespio was here, who was running that? Reg. Was it Reg? Yes. Because I do remember that I had several emails that came in anonymously that were somewhat of a threatening manner that they did automatically look into. And I don't know if maybe it was a policy that just carried you too, right? That just kind of carried over. Never had a look at emails. You've never had any threatening no. emails? Well, aren't you lucky? Well, I'm sure they'll start now that you met. <laughs> 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 I, I was just, I couldn't, I didn't know if maybe you were involved in that or maybe it was just Reg, okay. No, I can tell you though, since I've been chief, it's not uncommon and it's happened several times since I've been chief that we have looked at the origin of an email, not the content of the email, just right, the right. origin of the email. Right. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead, Vice Mayor, and thank you for letting me save him some steps because I know he's... <laughs> Not wanting to count those anymore. For the record, I've had threatening emails, but they didn't cover up their address. <laughs> we, knew it, we knew exactly who did it. Uh, the split of NDS, um, that is actually addressed in the charter. And doesn't, I, you know, I have no issue with. Um, an ordinance being made and uh, it coming to the vote of the commission. I have no issue with that whatsoever. Uh, it's a unanimous vote that has to be obtained in order to split or to create a, a department. What I had issue with was how it was being orchestrated, how it was coming about, the staff time that was utilized and, and the money then for paying the staff to develop um, this process before it was even, the ordinance even came before the, the commission. I can see giving an approximate cost in the budget, you know, how much it would be that that would need to come before the commission for us to have an understanding of whether we want it or that. But to work up um, job descriptions and all that sort of stuff and that, to me, I have a problem with utilizing staff to do that. Uh, I view the facts that this investigator is talking about as the statements of our staff. And I cannot thank them enough for doing the right thing. Can you get into a question? I said I'm addressing things. Thank you. 
And so isn't that what that investigator would conclude? Why she comes to her conclusion is because she has had staff telling her their stories, their testimonies. I mean, I'm sure some of them told their emotion, but she can't take in the emotion. She can only take in the testimony and the stories that they tell. So wouldn't it be proper that I view these facts that she talks about as actually being the testimony of the staff? I, I, yeah, I th absolutely. I think she's got the information that she received, maybe not verbatim in a transcript, but she is received, from my understanding, documentation and interviewed, according to the report, a number of people. And if I was the investigator, I would use that information, test testimony statements, whatever you want to call them, documentary, documentary evidence as my facts to draw the conclusions if I was asked to draw conclusions. And she saw those facts coordinating with one another. They, they timing uh, statements were all coming up with the, the same story, the same testimony. She didn't see variance within them, correct? All I know is what is in the report. Um, and it, it appears that she has made connections between them, yes. That is what I read also. Um, trust is the utmost highest thing in city government. Um, I want to thank staff for doing what they did. And I trust them emphatically. And I'm... That, that trust of the staff in the community, I'm afraid, is broken. Thank you, ma'am. All right. I see no other questions. Um, we have to get a motion, and then we have debate about the motion, I am sure. We've been I, getting there. Hang on. Hang on. Um, it's, it's almost, it's a little after 6.15. Um, I would like to take a 10 minute break. We are in the middle of all of this. Please, commissioners, do not talk to anybody. <clears throat> Staff, please do not approach commissioners. Let us do our job and keep it as pure as we possibly can. Let us take our break, whether it be a smoke break, whether it be a health break, but commissioners don't talk to each other. Staff and, and public, please don't talk to us. And we will be back at 6.30 promptly. Thank you.
All righty, everybody, it's 6.30 and we're back. And based on the parameters that were set at the beginning of this meeting by motion, um, we are done with our Q&A. And at this time, the city manager has five minutes of a closing statement. City manager, if you could please come over here. I'll set my little timer. We have time. <clears throat> we won't take that long. Oh, you do? Okay, then. All righty, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Just um, state your name for the record, please. Pete Lear. Thank you. Um, same guy I was earlier. I do. Um, no, I just wanted to bring up a few things that were discussed. One, I, um, one of the residents brought up due process. Due process was not an option here. Um, I was denied due process because I was told this was not a legal proceeding. I could not have an attorney present with me. There was a lot of things that I was told I was not allowed to do. Um, specific, so to talk about this being due process, um, this wasn't a legal proceeding, so I was told that didn't apply. As far as the reorganization itself, no funds were spent on the reorganization. The commission was presented with the reorganization data in June, as well as the idea of a, a director for that position. That all started also, as was mentioned, it's been around for years. The department used to be two departments, bringing an ordinance forward. Um, honestly, one of the things I'm going to look into if I am brought back is whether the original planning department was ever deactivated. I don't know that that happened back when the departments, departments were combined. So there may not be the need for a ordinance, but that's a legal opinion that can be made later on. Um, but as part of the strategic plan, commission wanted to do, as well as gave direction, to create a natural resources department. That was part of what was going to happen here. Job description for the department director was not started until after Commission gave unanimous support for the new department in June. The next day, the job description was worked on. The other job descriptions within that department were changes to existing job descriptions, which is something a department should be doing any time their employees work changes. They, do, they work with HR routinely on that. It's not a commission direction. It's not a commission decision. That's something that is done by staff with HR. Um, so none of that was worked on beforehand. Um, the only things that were worked on by staff or changes to internal jobs that already existed. Um, any funds that would have been spent, like I said, none were spent. Any that would have been spent for whether a remodel was or was not going to happen would have come in front of commission because in order for that to happen would require a contract. All contracts must be approved by the commission before they're signed. So, you know, statements like that money was spent, no money was spent. No money was spent on the IKEA trip that's been brought up. This was a fact finding mission. The city has routinely done fact-finding missions in the past. We did one for the Bearcat. We did one for the LPR process that you all are looking at right now um, to find out what it's going to cost. Is it a good idea? Is it a fit for the city of Northport? These are routine functions. They're actually routine functions of my job. Um, sometimes the department directors do them. Sometimes I do them. Sometimes we both do them. <clears throat> um, as far as the report itself, as was mentioned, there were things that were looked into that were beyond the four charges I was presented to. Um, I understand what, what Ms. Boyce made, mentioned to you all. My concern with that is when I got interviewed, that's the first I ever heard of them. So I was asked to be prepared to answer questions I had no idea were coming. Um, I did answer some. I did not answer others because they required a legal interpretation. Again, I did not have an attorney there. Interpreting the state statute is not a city manager function, it's a legal function. And since I couldn't have an attorney there, I wasn't prepared and I didn't answer that question. There was a lot of statements that I made in the interviews, including that I was not going to answer that one, including that I had some um, reservations with some of the processes. All of that's left out of the report. None of it's in there. Um, my contract, as was eventually stated here, does not state anything about the ICMA Code of Ethics. It states that I have to become a credentialed manager by July of 2022. That date's not here. If it is determined by ICMA that I violated the Code of Ethics, they determine the punishment. They may say, you know what, you did something wrong, but we're just gonna make you go through some classes. That would not preclude me from becoming a credentialed manager. There's no way to determine that at this point in time. So I have not violated that provision of the contract and can't until July of 2022, if and when I do or do not become a credential manager. Um, so, and again, it was stated that the four charges or the four allegations that were made, those were guidelines of what to be looked into or something similar to that. 
problem with that is if I'm not notified of them, I have no way to prepare to defend myself against them. Whether it be my own interview and, like I said, without due process, I wasn't allowed to provide any witnesses to defend my point. So, like I say, I think there's some, some problems here. There's some statements that have been made. There's some inaccuracies. And there's some opinions that are being represented as fact. But with that, that's, my, that's all I have. So, again, thank you again. I appreciate this being concluded quickly. And I look forward to the opportunity to get back. All right, so now at this point, we have the motion. City manager has finished his closing statement, and is anybody ready to make a motion? I am. Okay, I was going to, go ahead. I move to remove the city manager from right. office Sorry. immediately for good cause as defined in his employment uh, amend, uh, agreement and to terminate his employment with the city to direct the city attorney to draft written notice of same and that the notice specify that the city manager has five days after receipt of the written notice to request a written charge and public hearing with the city manager's termination being final upon expiration of the five-day period if no written request of public hearing is made or upon conclusion of the public hearing hearing if written request for public hearing is made. Motion on the floor by Vice Mayor. Do I hear a second? I will second that motion. Vice Mayor. Uh, this was an investigation into um, complaint. It was not a hearing. Uh, within the motion that was made, if he wanted to file for a hearing, he could. That's when uh, there's legality and, and that type of stuff is in a hearing, not in the conclusion of an investigation. Thank you. Thank you. As a seconder, I will reserve my right to speak to the motion at the end, uh, right before we take the vote. At this time, does anybody want to speak to the motion? Um, Commissioner Carrison. I won't support it, so go ahead. Anybody <laughs> else want to speak to it? All right. Uh, we're not voting yet, folks. Why not? Why not? Well, I'd like to speak to the motion. Oh, oh. I thought you said you were going to reset no, I, the right. Before the vote, I was going to let oh. my fellow commissioners speak oh. first. Oh, but I they don't want to speak, so I'm gathering my wits. Give me a minute. I prepared a statement, and I am going to read the whole thing. It'll be available for public record for anybody who wants to see it. And just bear with me. I will try and speak fast, but I also want to make sure my points get across. I was shocked and, and could not believe what I was told when the city attorney called to advise me that the city manager was being placed under investigation for having a sexual relationship with staff. As the conversation continued, I was angry at myself <laughs> for being so buffaloed to think that he acted in such a highly ethical manner. <laughs> Joke's on me. Then I became mad as hell at him for his lack of self-control and for putting the city in jeopardy. Both parties admitted there was a sexual relationship and that it was consensual. Was it? Can a subordinate really offer consent. This was not a peer-to-peer -peer sexual relationship. The city manager is her boss. This wasn't just sex. It was about power. He held all the power, and in my opinion, using that type of power could never allow for a consenting sexual relationship. While he admitted he had a sexual relationship with a subordinate, I finally realized what was missing from this investigative report. Nowhere in that report does he admit he did anything wrong. That in itself, in my opinion, speaks volumes to his lack of character, 
The actions of the city manager and the employee put a cog in the day-to-day -day operations of the city. It delayed important projects, ultimately costing taxpayers money and put more stress on staff. Staff at this point is fearful of retaliation and in numerous times stated that to the investigator. In June, I gave consensus to reorganize the department, no disputing that fact. However, thanks to the investigation, I've learned the full story, which the organization included remodeling the entire third floor and purchasing furniture. In my opinion, the city manager was not honest in his original pitch. The reorganization has nothing to do with benefiting the city. It was only to benefit a sexual relationship that he was having with a subordinate and was doing everything in his power to further her career. Even after being placed on leave, his actions were not remorseful. His actions were brazen and displayed extreme power. He disregarded the investigative process by interfering in a calculating manner, hanging around City Hall after hours on days of commission meetings, having lunch with his bosses, my fellow commissioners, and talking with staff who were part of the investigation. This interference in his actions made staff feel extremely uncomfortable. There were, where was his ethics and morals in any of those actions? At some point, the city manager will be required to have his ICMA credentials, and I am confident the ICMA tenants have been covered at some point during the training that he has received so far to reach those accreditations. He cannot buffalo me into thinking he didn't know what those ICMA tenants were and that he was bound to them. Even the investigator found sufficient evidence that he violated those codes, but that is ultimately the ICMA, ICMA's um, duties. He engaged in misconduct, which was clearly not in the city's best interest. He disregarded the city's attorney's instructions not to interfere with the investigation by intimidating staff and so much more. He even went so far as to ask the Northport Police Department to identify the identity of that anonymous email. Still don't know when that was done under those kind of circumstances. That clearly alone was for his own benefit. By allowing the city manager to continue as our city manager as if nothing happened, what are we really doing to our city? What message are we sending to our staff? What message are we sending to our citizens? We will be setting a precedent, folks. Why bother with the rules? Why bother with ethics? Why bother with the morals? How many lawsuits will the city be subjected to as we head down this slippery slope? The city manager is supposed to be the example, be the example. And this behavior is anything but setting a good example. The bottom line is city manager had a sexual relationship with a subordinate. There's no disputing that fact. And based on his actions, I have lost all confidence in his ability to carry out the duties as a city manager. I do not trust his capacity to make decisions that are in the best interest of the city. He harmed the city, he embarrassed the city, the taxpayers and staff in so many ways that cannot be measured. There's an old phrase, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So now let's change it up a little bit. Fool the city once, shame on you. Fool the city twice, shame on the city commission because we are his boss. As your boss, I cannot give you another opportunity to shame our city. And for that reason, I will be supporting this motion. We'll go ahead and call the vote. And the vote failed. Two, no, I'm not. <coughs> the vote failed. I have to do my job, please. Vote failed two to three with Commissioner Hanks. Commissioner Carrison and Commissioner Emmerich dissenting. Now I'm done. Okay. That Move. Vote, excuse me, hold on. Could you please put that back up on the screen because it said it passed and it did not pass. I no. saw failed. I saw failed. I saw green passed. 
Okay, so the record shows that the motion to, it failed. Okay, to remove him for good cause failed. Thank you. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, move to return to duty uh, city manager. I move to take the city manager off paid administrative leave and return him to duty. Uh, hold on, hold I didn't say anything when this tyrant was going this, on. This. I didn't say anything while you were making your accusations. Okay, guys, so. please let us do our jobs. Please keep your comments and, and stuff to yourselves. But, uh, Commissioner Carasone, you want to make a motion, please okay. do so. Okay, move to take the city manager off of paid administrative leave to require training of ethics and a suspension without pay for five days, at which point after he will return to full duty. I'm writing, sorry. Got a motion on the floor, and I hope I capture this correctly, city clerk. Um, motion on the floor by Commissioner Carasone to take the city manager off paid leave require him to take ethics and be on hmm. suspension without pay for five days, returning to work at full duty and capacity. After that time, yeah. Motion on the floor. Um, Anyone? Do I, anybody want to make a second? Uh, Hearing I'll none. Second. So I've got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Carasone and seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that, Commissioner Carson? I want to ask the city attorney real quickly something. Um, do we have to be, I'm looking at the motion proposal, do we have to be more specific in the ethics training, ethics through ICMA, ethics through FLC, or is that? I want to make sure Ms. Boyd doesn't have anything right. to add, but my suggestion would be to be as specific as possible or to provide some type of parameters so that if the motion is successful, the city manager and the commission will know whether or not those conditions have been met, including possibly a, a time frame. Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. I see where you're going with that. Okay, so um, I'd like to amend the motion. That's why I was asking uh, that the um, ethics training be uh, completed well, with COVID. I would say completed within six months. Um, and to be completed through uh, one of the, be it ICMA or Florida League of Cities. Excuse me, is that fine? And do you have, I mean, is that an hour of ethics training? You know, do you I have thought a they just the had the ethics training was. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are either. That's why I'm saying. Um, ask, you know, or ask the ACM, maybe. You know. uh, yeah, maybe Jason. Uh, you know? The, the Florida, uh, Florida State has some, uh, the Florida Institute of Government has some ethics stuff. I think Florida League of Cities has a four-hour class that, you know, Pete and I are, by being FCCMA members, we're required to take four hours of, of ethics annually anyway. But um, um, those are just the things right off the top of my head that I can think of. So then if I was to say Florida Institute of Government, Florida League of Cities, or the ACMA, to be no less than four, well, maybe eight hours of ethics. This way, it's not the four hour required, it's on top of the four, four hours required. I think that's enough information to provide. Is that good? Us. I think so for okay. everyone to know whether or not it's been. been so, met. did that make sense? How City about clerk? you restate your amendment, please? Okay, so I'm amending the ethics requirement to be a no less than eight hours of uh, ethic courses and be it through Florida League of Cities, Florida Institute of Government, or the ACMA, ICMA itself. And to be completed within six months, sorry. Motion on the floor to have the city manager complete ethics training to be completed within six months, mm -hmm. consisting of no less than eight hours through the F 
Florida League of Cities, the ICMA, or, and I'm sorry, the Florida Institute, Institute of, of Government. Government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a new one I'd never heard of. Uh, and that motion was made by Commissioner Carison. Do I hear a second to the motion? That was the amendment to, to the, the motion. the amendment to the motion. Second. And that was seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that, Commissioner Carison, to the amendment? I'm going to wait till after everybody talks. That's fine. And Commissioner Hanks. <sighs> it's just the amendment, right? Yeah. This is just for the amendment. Oh, yeah, no, I'm good. Okay. So we'll go ahead and vote on the amendment. And the amendment passed four to one with Commissioner Luke dissenting and your reason for dissension? Totally against keeping him. Oh. And just for the record, the only reason why I voted yes for ethics training is I feel that ethics training is always imperative. So that's why I did vote Are for Are we that. still good on the, Mayor, no, we had a flicker. I don't know, some things went, went off here. Are you good? No, well, are we well, recording? I mean, recording and all that? They're checking on it. Watch keeps I going thought it off. was lightning. Nice. Is, no, lightning's popping all over. Yes. All right. Okay, so that amendment passed four to one with Commissioner Luke dissenting for reasons mm -hmm. stated. Now we're going to the main motion, and Com uh, Commissioner Carison, do you want to speak to the main motion? Um, yes, I will, but if anyone else wanted to speak first, I don't know. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have really tried to take myself out of this situation and look at this as it's presented because the investigator says time and time again, finding a fact, whether the facts, 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 facts. There is no verbatim of conversations here. Um, it's just essentially a belief. It's an opinion of what that uh, investigator had found um, in their discussion with all of these interviews. In fact, I find it very hard to believe that so many people say the same words. So that kind of in and of itself gives me credence to not really believe a lot of this. I also believe that they, the investigator has put things in here that make it look like some of our employees are saying things that were not meant the way that they were said or put themselves in a position that they did not mean to put themselves in that position. So when I say I don't believe this report in its context, I truly don't believe that there are things in here that some of these employees are claiming to have done or said or I believe that there's a it's like the inquirers there's there's probably a little sliver of truth to it but the way it's being presented almost sounds like they're trying to be um I don't know how to explain it but like uh deceiving or or deceitful towards towards a city manager, and I don't believe that to be true at all because I think that every employee in here has the best interest of the city at heart. I don't, I don't believe that any of these facts as they were presented were for any employee to do something bad to the city manager. So I just, I want to say that on both sides, I, I find it very difficult to believe some of the stuff that's being said in here. Um, but some of it I know as factual. Um, so that is why I had to kind of step aside and actually create a timeline that shows <coughs> and go back to the basis of, of what are we, what is our jurisdiction in this? I had to look at it in that way. And that's why it's so important that I looked up other cases where standing of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, now I have to go back to it. <coughs> Where there was a violation of the um, ethics codes and the disrepute and the turpitude and um, the subjects of termination, um, 
most of which at the good cause itself is very, very difficult to prove in a lot of the cases that I looked up. In fact, I looked up a lot of the cases that this agency actually did their investigative work on and was very um, surprised to see that pretty much it's the same revelations in every uh, report, but the report is put together much better than what this is. And, and I'll, I'll say that maybe um, I'll take blame that, you know, I thought that two months or was, was good enough. I thought it was pretty cut and dry that, you know, was there uh, anything used that was city equipment? Was there any violations of the policies? Was there a violation of law? I, I thought it was very simple and easy to find. Um, but apparently there was, it, maybe someone's writing a book. I really don't know. But, um, to me, I thought it was pretty cut and dry. And nothing in this report shows any of those violations occurred, not by fact, at least not by the, the preponderance of evidence. So on top of that, we talk about ethics and morals, and I got to say I am absolutely astonished at having a prepared written statement by the mayor here this evening, which tells me that nothing we discussed this evening meant anything that it was all just on, on deaf ears. Um, <clears throat> to say that there was a violation of ethics and morals by looking at this report is equivalent to us saying that there was a violation of ethic and morals on other people's behalf as some things have been deemed to be investigating recently. So let's just all remember that we can put our feet in those shoes just as easily as where those shoes are today. So with that, I think that I can't say that I'm not disappointed. I think uh, city manager knows I'm disappointed about uh, the, the things that have taken place, but you know what, we're all human. There's only one perfect person. He was hung on a cross many years ago, and I gotta tell you, this person right here ain't it, and nobody else's. Um, so there's that. And it's not my business what goes on in his, his life or his relationships or anyone else's relationships. It only is my business when it comes to the facts of a violation of law, a violation of policy, or a violation of the agreement. That, that is truly the only three things that are my business. And based on the evidence proposed, I can't see that. So I feel that the ethics training is essential because I want him to understand that relationships, regardless of it being business or not, really need to be looked at a whole lot harder. Um, and there should be something, and because the, the um, pra past practice has been three to five days suspension, uh, I picked the higher of the two. And so um, those are the reasons that there had to be some sort of a something uh, because we are here where we are here. But in the same token, I just, I cannot even fathom that this report would have credence in anyone's professional board committee or anything else, because to, to have just baseless opinions, um, just very scary. Thank you, God. I agree. I'm done. Does anybody else <laughs> want to speak to the motion? No, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hanks, you were the seconder, please. Thank you. <sighs> I've said uh, for almost four years now that I've been up here that I can't legislate and I don't run my businesses based off of emotion. Um, doesn't mean you don't have emotional uh, ties to things, but you, as Mr. Carson said, you separate, you, you, you always try to separate yourself from that and you always try to take a look at things. So when I did get this report, I was expecting something that would be cut and dry, filled with facts either way, uh, determining guilt or innocence. I opened it up, and it's funny you mentioned a book because 
the very thing I thought was this is a romance novel. And it's very entertaining. It really is, has great entertainment value. As a matter of fact, when I read it, I want to get to the next page because it is a phenomenal write. Uh, 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 it's a phenomenal, uh, I guess, uh, written document uh, if you're writing a romance novel. I would have expected this to be more written as an investigation or by an investigator than what feels like a, an, an author. Um, that being said, not only does it have entertainment value, but it is absolutely filled with conjecture and opinions. And anybody who reads this that says this is the facts that we need to use did not read this stinking document because it is just filled with, with stuff. I have, she has written in here, I have no evidence, however I believe. I'm sorry, I don't make my, my, my decisions based off of stuff like that. I look at the facts. And, uh, you know, here's, here, here's the reality here. You know, did this man do something that, uh, that, that for most or for uh, most in a society maybe, maybe isn't, uh, I don't know, I guess you, it's sin, I don't know what you'd say, maybe so. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, there was some things that, that uh, took place that were, that were between two consenting adults, um, you know, we can say, can, can a subordinate um, consent? Well, hell yeah, they can consent. Are you freaking kidding me? Everybody's a freaking adult, and people can make a decision for their own lives. Uh, that being said, could there be heavy pressure? Maybe. I don't know. But what we have right now, the evidence we have, is there are two consenting ad adults. So is it righteous or right to read into somebody else's dialogue? No, but yet certain members of, of the, this board do that all the time. Um, that being said, was anything, was any policy broken? I don't believe any policy was broken. Does it mean that things didn't look uh, out of place? Sure they did. But I've got to look at this from a, from, from a factual standpoint. And there was not a policy broken that was worthy of this. Should we create a resolution or something maybe directly identifying this situation so we aren't having to jump through hoops because an opportunity arose to be able to fire someone? Maybe we should. So that way things are cut and dry. That would be my suggestion after this motion that we look and maybe get a consensus to bring back an agenda item that directly uh, uh, addresses this situation, but right now what we have is we have an opportunistic, or we have an opportunity being taken right now, and it's being shown by the hoops that we're having to jump through in order to fire this man. And with that, uh, yeah, no, he doesn't deserve to be fired. No. Does anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, uh, I'm watching the process that we put in place for investigations to be done to just flush, be flushed down the toilet. Uh, we set this uh, in motion uh, so that we could have a process, but yet we're sitting up here judging the investigator and the conclusion of the investigation. Uh, to me, the facts, again, were arrived at from the staff, and I thank them for that. I honor them for doing what they did. The fact is, he had a romantic relationship that was admitted to. So I only see one conclusion of it, and that is termination. So I will not be voting for this. Thank you. Mr. Emmerich, did you want to weigh in? Nope. Thank you. I'm good. Um, you go to page 12 of the report, it, it has one sentence that sums it up. It is undisputed that Lear and Gale House had a consensual, intimate, and romantic relationship while Lear was employed as city manager and Gale House was employed as planning manager. He had, con he had sex with a subordinate. That is the most unethical thing a city manager or a manager can do to any of their subordinates. If that is not classified as unethical to any of my peers up here, 
I have to wonder what is then considered unethical. He could have used his power as the city manager to coerce or to pressure Miss Nicole. Miss Nicole did say it was consensual. She can turn around tomorrow and say, guess what, folks? He pressured me. And there's not a damn thing we can do about that. This investigation report is all we have to go by. We followed the process and procedures and required an investigation. Now I find it utterly ironic that the very people who wanted to hurry the process along are the ones questioning the investigation. It doesn't include this. It has a typo here. It doesn't include that. It's not factual. It doesn't. That sentence I read on page 12 says it all. I feel bad for HR. How are you ever going to process anything when somebody comes up and says, hey, I have a problem because my boss pressured me into having sex or makes a claim of having sex. This is the most unethical thing a manager could ever do. He's our city manager. We trust him. He has the highest level of trust. And now that is broke. So we did receive three public comment cards. Um, I don't know if, can, take a vote? can you hang on please one moment. We've already had public comment. I closed public comment. I am asking the board, do you want to hear these three additional public comments before we do the vote? Can I get a consensus, Commissioner Hanks, to hear these three public comments, yes or no? Before the vote? Before the vote. No. no. Not before the vote. Commissioner Lula. Yeah, I'm fine with it before or after. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Carrison. No. Commissioner Emmerich. Not before the vote. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take the vote. And that motion passed three to two with Commissioner, I'm um, sorry, Vice Mayor. Luke and myself dissenting. Vice Mayor, do you want to speak? To, oh, do you want to speak to that? Can we hear the? Uh, She's asking about the. Uh, I'm asking. The vote was three to two with Vice Mayor and myself dissenting. Vice Mayor, do you want to speak to the reason for your dissension? I put a, a lot of value in trust in relationship. Mine's broken. Thank you. I stated the reasons for my dissension. I I do not envy our staff coming into work tomorrow morning. I do not envy the culture that is now going to be part of our city hall walls. With that said, now that we've had the vote, does anybody, let's get a consensus to hear the public comment. Commissioner Hanks. Yes. Vice Mayor. Yes. Myself. Yes. Commissioner Carrison. Yes. Commissioner Amage. Yes. All right. So now we will hear the public comment um, regarding uh, city manager. We'll start with Sh Kate Check Check off. And Stephen Burke. It's so stupid. And then last but not least will be uh, Jeffrey Scott. Ms. Kate, state your name for the record, please. Keisha Carroll of North Board Taxpayer. Okay, the guys, hold on. We have public comment. Could we please be respectful? Go ahead, please. The question is, did city manager, Mr. Lear, or did he not, had a sexual relationship on the city property while on the city paid hours? Is this the first time and only time he had sexual relationship with a city employee or is this the only time they came to the light? What if it was another employee? Would that employee be fired, let go, or forgiven? I don't see, I don't hear anyone else having sex on the city property during a city hours. 
right? You don't bring your husbands or boyfriends or whoever you have. You don't, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a hotel, okay? It's going on while he was getting paid, so is Nicole. Did any of you ask how Mr. Whitley feels? Never once any of you mentioned his name at all. He's a city employee too. Do I think Mr. Lair should be terminated with cause? Absolutely. However, commissioners directed an outside investigation company to conduct independent investigation and to provide a report and findings. Commissioners need to allow investigators to complete a full investigation and, as in my opinion, further investigation will open a can of worms. Not allowing investigation to continue may be viewed as commissioners explicitly and purposely interfering with the investigation, don't care, or and unwilling to learn what else investigation can reveal. Every commissioner's name in their report, every single one of you, your name is on their report. In fact, many Northport PD staff and city staff members who witnessed some of the issues involving Pete Lair were not interviewed by the investigator due to commissioner's direct interference with investigation by setting a deadline. You all are potential witnesses to Mr. Lair misconducts and you should remove yourself immediately from any further dis discussions and decision making until further investigation fully completed. I'm asking, no, I'm demanding our elected officials to allow investigation to continue so they can question each commissioner and city staff of their possible involvement and knowledge on alleged misconducts. You all talking facts? You want facts? Then let them do their job, okay? You're condoning sex on the city property, on taxpayers' money, or relationship with the special benefits, you are the part of the problem. Mr. Burke. Steve Burke, I'm a resident of Northport. Um, I think it's a sad day in Northport's history today. I think you've let down, three of you have let down <clears throat> 700 city employees because you can no longer hold any of them accountable for sexual harassment or the other violations that were identified in this report. And to repeat something that was already said once, but I don't know if it fell on deaf ears, I think it's ironic that three of you who rushed this report are now upset with the results. It kind of sounds planned. It really does. To trivialize it into a soap opera is ridiculous and embarrassing by a city leader. You people chose that company to do the report. You didn't vote on it? It's his time, please. Regardless, you're ultimately responsible. You run this city. Not very well by some of you. I'm glad that some of you are lame ducks. And I had wished this had been held off for the new commission. Because I think the outcome would have been right and opposite of what happened here today. You really should be ashamed of yourselves. Now, uh, the city manager has already asked the police department to look into the source of that email. Totally unethical. If he knew he was the target of doing something inappropriately and sent it, and it was sent to the city, he should have removed himself from the process at that point. But he didn't. Do you think there's going to be some retribution? I certainly do. I really hope you think long and hard and look at yourselves in the mirror tonight, because it's shameful what you did here tonight. Thank you. And the last public comment is Mr. Scott. What is, what is corrupt conduct within the city of Northport? 
Is it deliberate or intentional wrongdoing? Or is it negligent or a mistake? It must involve a public official. This is a public sector organization, administration, is it not? Taxpayer funded. The Northport community expects public officials elected, appointed, public safety, the list goes on, to perform their duties with honesty and in the best interest of the public, the taxpaying public. Corrupt conduct by a public official involves a breach of the public trust. And that's what we have here. That can lead to inequity, wasted resources, public money, and reputational damage that this city will never find a way out of it. I want to continue. I have come to the conclusion Commissioner Vanessa Carrison will continue her erratic behavior on the dais for the remainder of her term. She will display her self-righteous attitude for everyone to witness without any shame. Her divide and conquer strategy during debate will continue until her fellow commissioners object to her constant micromanaging of the people's business. Why she has a tendency to stall discussion on any given agenda item that is being considered as anybody's guess. So that's on many occasions, her communication on the dais is often exaggerated. She claims to know everything about everybody else's business. She is a self-proclaimed know-it-all expert. I refuse to she tries to personalize the discussion while on the dais. Turn, Plus, her comments on the dais uh, are often Scott. riddled with inquiry. Oh, Mr. Scott, let them run on. she tries to personalize the discussion. Oh yeah, well, he's Mr. Scott, in yes. please yeah. stop you for know. a moment. He's in charge. Well, I have 48 seconds. I understand. I stopped your clock. Commissioner Carasone, you may feel that he is giving personal <clears throat> attacks. We are elected officials, and he is a right. Okay. And city attorney, Just remember that. Is he have a right to speak about a commissioner in a disparaging way? He's not cussing. He's not cursing. He's not calling her names. I'm asking for your legal opinion on this before the, I censure him. Section two five eight B of the city code addresses persons addressing the commission and states that all comments shall be polite, proper titles shall be used at all times to contribute to a respectful and businesslike atmosphere. The broadest possible accommodation shall be provided for statements of personal opinion, but no one shall engage in personal, impertinent, slanderous, or profane remarks. Yelling, threatening, or abusive language is unacceptable. That's your city code. Yes. And I did not hear any cussing well, that's not you all may she not. said. That's not I'm just going to shut up. Go ahead. Keep, keep battering me. It doesn't matter. I don't give a shit. I don't care. Well, that's unacceptable. Yeah, that's unacceptable. That's clear. I don't care. Go ahead. Keep it up. <laughs> Mr. Scott, care. could you please I'm used continue? To it. I would like 50 could, seconds. Hold on one second. Could you please continue and... Refrain from calling my fellow commissioners names. And I can't control any disrespect from anybody. So if you could please refrain from calling names, I would be very grateful. Please continue. You have 48 seconds. Okay. She frequently exhibits irritating and annoying behavior while talking over her fellow commissioners or conversing with others in the gallery. This leads one to believe whether her objective is to undermine public policy issues that she does not support. In summary, Commissioner Carasone's conduct on the dais is inappropriate to say the least. She has no shame as an elected public servant. Her public demeanor on the dais isn't healthy, plus she leaves you with the impression that she is morally bankrupt. <laughs> her self-imposed victimhood is apparent for everyone to see, especially when she allows her unpredictability to interrupt the proceedings of Mr. every Scott, commission meeting. Mr. Scott, your time meeting. is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, there was an instance when Mayor Hanks was the chair of the meeting 
and there was a citizen that lambasted him left and right, up and down, skinned him alive, and he never stopped the citizen from speaking. I use that control that he exhibited that day at that meeting as my barometer for when I'm conducting a meeting when the public is speaking. So I just wanted that said. Now, is anybody else? Go ahead, Commissioner Karras. I just want to clarify some accusations here. One, that there was absolutely no um, validity to the fact that there was a possible sexual harassment that was never even brought up as a violation, a complaint, or anything else. So that's false. Um, clarify that nowhere uh, in the report or in the investigation or anywhere else that there is validation or proof that anything took place on the grounds of City Hall. Actually, if you actually read the in, uh, report, you'd see quite the contrary. Um, and that um, the email source and investigation has been done in the past, so uh, that was made clear. Just want to make Thank sure you. of that. So at this point, I just need to double check with Vice Mayor and City Clerk. Is there any final commission, I'm um, sorry, uh, public comment for general public comment? I don't have any, no. Vice Mayor. Thank you. We've already done commission communications and administrative reports. So it is now, oh, dear Lordy Lord. It is now 721. It feels a lot <laughs> later. Yeah, Holy I know, cow. right? That's we've it's been 721, here all day. and we are adjourned. Oh.